Good, thank you very much and good morning everyone, members and those joining us on the live stream. This is the meeting of South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. My name is Councillor Henry Batchelor. Usually I'm the Vice Chair of this committee, but given the Chairman has sent apologies today, uh, I'll be chairing the meeting this morning. Um, I, we do also need to appoint a replacement Vice Chair for the meeting, so I would like uh, to ask Councillor Peter Fain if you'd mind stepping in. Members, is that agreeable to everybody? Agreed. Thank you very much. Councillor Fain, if you'd like to bring yourself to the front, please. Councillor Bradman, do you have, are you going to put a challenge in on that? <laughs> Thank you very much. While Councillor Fain is making his way to the front and setting up, I'm just going to run through a quick bit of housekeeping, members. Um, Please, can those present in the chamber please note that everything on your desk, including laptop screens, is likely to be broadcast at some point, so do keep that in mind. The camera follows the microphone after it's been switched on, so councillors and officers are requested to wait a couple of seconds before speaking to allow the camera to catch up with the microphone. If the fire alarm sounds, then please do leave the chamber and exit the building through the nearest emergency exit. The assembly point is at the junction of Great St Mary's and King's Parade. Further information is in the pack that has been emailed to you. It is a long way to go. <laughs> uh, this may be an old bit of text that I'm reading. I think the front of the building is sufficient. <laughs> yeah, that is odd. <laughs> um, okay. Can those participating in the live stream uh, please indicate that you wish to speak via the chat column? Please do not use the chat column for any other purpose other than indicating a wish to speak. Please make sure your device is fully charged and that you switch your microphone off unless you're invited to do so otherwise. Uh, please ensure that you've switched off or silenced any other devices you have so that they do not interrupt proceedings. And when you're invited to address the meeting, please make sure your microphone is switched on. When you've finished addressing the meeting, please turn off your microphone immediately. Uh, members, please note that if we need to vote on any item, we should do so via the microphones. Only those present in the chamber can vote or propose or second recommendations. Uh, committee members present in the chamber, we're now going to go through a roll call. Uh, if, after I call your name, if you could please switch on your microphone and introduce yourselves. And we will start with myself. As mentioned, I'm Councillor Henry Batchelor. I'm one of the members for the Linton Ward and I'm chairing the planning committee this morning. Uh, the vice chair for today is Councillor Peter Fain. You need to tap tap your card first. Good morning, Peter Fain, Shelford Ward. Thank you. And next we have Councillor Anna Bradnam. Good morning, um, Councillor Anna Bradnam from Milton and Waterbeach, Southern for Councillor Julie Strickland. Thank you. And I believe joining us online we have Councillor Martin Khan. Martin, are you with us? Yes, uh, Councillor Martin Khan for uh, Councillor Histon and Limpington and Orchard Park. Thank you very much. And Councillor Claire Daunton, please. Yes, good morning, Chair. I'm Claire Daunton, one of the members for the Fen Distant and Fullbourne Ward, um, and I'm serving for Pippa Halings, Councillor Pippa Halings. Thank you very much. Councillor Dr. Toomey Hawkins. Good morning, Chair. Toomey Hawkins, member for Caldicott Ward. Thank you. Councillor Deborah Roberts. Good morning, Chairman. Good morning, everybody. Deborah Roberts, District Councillor for the Foxton Ward. Thank you very much. Uh, Councillor Heather Williams. Good morning, Chair. Heather Williams and I represent the Mordens Ward. Councillor Dr Richard Williams. Thank you, Chair. Richard Williams, I represent the Whittlesford Ward. And finally, Councillor Eileen Wilson. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Eileen Wilson, um, Councillor for Cottenham Ward. Thank you very much. So, uh, members, we are now quorum, so we can proceed with the meeting. And we also, uh, assisting us today, we have two officers present in the chamber. We have to my left, Mr Nigel Blaisby. Good morning, members. Uh, Nigel is the delivery manager for the in the planning department, and Stephen Reed is our senior planning lawyer. Um, morning, members. Morning, chair. Thank you very much. And we also have our democratic services officer, who will be clerking the meeting today. Is joining us virtually, uh, Lawrence Damari Homan. Lawrence. Morning, everyone. Yep, Lawrence. Hope you all the best for today's meeting. Thank, Thank you. you very much, Lawrence. Appreciate that. 
Uh, okay, members, if any time a member leaves the meeting, would they make that fact known so it can be recorded in the minutes? Uh, we'll be taking regular breaks, depending on where we are in the, um, in the agenda, but if any member feels they desperately do need a break, please do indicate. Councillor Williams? Chair, sorry, just to let you know, on item number six, um, I've just had a message from Councillor Coe that would be speaking to a local member. He's um, been delayed with a patient. So if he doesn't make the time of your discretion, if he's able to join it, you know, in a different sequence, if he's able to speak, if he's, but he doesn't know how long he'll be with his patient. Okay, um, well, if you could keep us updated on his whereabouts, that'd be useful. Thank you. <clears throat> okay, members, just another item. Uh, members should have the main agenda pack dated 11th of January and an agenda supplement, which wasn't posted but emailed around dated the 12th of January, containing the plans for the various applications we're looking at today. Um, you should have also received a consultation response from the Cambridge and District, or CAMRA, C-A-M-R-A, uh, which relates to item eight, the Jolly Millers pub. Uh, is, any, is everyone in receipt of all of those documents? Okay. Councillor Bradnam? Okay, thanks. Yeah, they are available online as well, if you, if you could uh, pull them up. Thank you. Um, and one last um, item from myself before we move into the main agenda. Um, it's with sad or well, a heavy heart that I have to tell everyone that um, on the 1st of January this year, a parish councillor from my own ward, actually Lin, uh, Linton, Councillor Enid Ball, sadly passed away. Um, she was, you know, very heavily involved in, in village life and the parish council, and she did, has attended this planning committee very regularly to represent Linton. And obviously many members of many elected members and members of the planning service um, were very well, she was very well known too, and it is a great loss to, to Linton and to planning in general. So, you know, from myself and I, I'm in the committee as well, it's, you know, we do send our condolences and our thoughts with husband John and their family at this time. Thank you. Okay, members, um, with that, we'll move on to the agenda, starting with item number two, apologies. Lawrence, do we have apologies, please? Yes, Chair. Apologies from the Chair, Pippa Hailing, Councillor Pippa Hailings. Um, also apologies from Councillor Judith Rippeth and Councillor Jeff Harvey. Thank you. Thank you, Lawrence. Agenda item three, declarations of interest. Members, do you, does anyone have any uh, declarations of interest to make, please? Councillor Daunton and Wilson. Yes, thank you, uh, Chair. I have a declaration in relation to item six, the Ida Darwin Hospital. I'm quoted in the papers and will be stepping out, uh, will not take part in the discussion of that item. But you will still be speaking as a local member. I would like I to speak as a local member. Okay. I will speak as a local member. Thank you. Thank you very much. And Councillor Wilson, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I um, declare an opportunity in trust in relation to item eight. I have I, I'm the local member for Cottenham Ward and I, I have been receiving emails copied to other people with representations about the application, but I haven't discussed it with anyone and I come to the matter afresh. I would also like to point out that on item 12, the enforcement report, um, there is a, a reference to the Smithy Pen um, Gypsy Romo Traveller site and um, I... I, um, I have been involved in discussions about that, but um, I just want to state that um, I, I'm, I'm, a, well, I, I'm the local member. For no, that's fine. Thank you. Understood. Thank you very much, <laughs> Councillor. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Oops. Microphone, please. <laughs> uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, two items, item five and item... Uh, seven, I'm the local member. Um, I'm also a parish councillor at Caldicott, but I am coming to this matter fresh. And with um, item seven, I was not at the meeting where it was discussed, but I've subsequently discussed with the parish chair and clerk, but I'm coming to the matter fresh. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. And one from myself as well, item nine, Linton, um, as this application has already come to us and I made the same declaration last time, uh, I have discussed this application with neighbours and the parish council, but only around matters of process, so that doesn't preclude me from taking part in the debate and vote today. Thank you very much. So that's declarations of interest, members. We... 
was going to say we moved to minutes of the previous meeting, but we don't have any. So we'll be looking at the meet. Um, we'll be looking at the minutes of the meeting back in December at our next meeting. Um, so we move to the substantive business on our agendas, members, starting with item five, which is an application land east of Highfields Road, Highfields Caldercott. Um, I think it's pretty better at this stage. I pass over to Mr. Blaisby, has a slight update on the application for us, please, Mr. Blaisby. Oh, thank you, Chair. So, in recent days, the Shared Planning Service has been made aware of a concern in respect of this item on the agenda. The concern arises from the omission of three approved drawings from the online record of the 2015 outline planning permission that was granted on appeal that imposed the conditions which the application before the council seeks to vary. The three drawings relate to the access locations with their visibility displays, access details, and a tree retention plan. These drawings have now been uploaded to the 2015 application file and are available to view online. However, on the basis of the concern that has been expressed to the Council and to avoid any uncertainty surrounding the consideration of the proposals contained within the current application, I am recommending to the Committee that Item 5 be deferred. Subject to your agreement to this recommendation, we expect that the application will be reported to the Planning Committee in February. Thank you. Thank you, Nigel. Seems a sensible way forward to me. So I would actually like to propose the deferral on that particular item, please. Um, and Councillor Roberts, yeah, is seconding that. Members, do we need any debate on this or is everyone in agreement this should be deferred? Agreed. Okay, thank you very much. So item five on our agenda has been deferred. So with that, we move to item six, which is on page 23 of our agendas, members. And this is an application at the Ida Darwin site in Fullborn. Um, the application is reserved matters application um, for 203 dwellings, including affordable housing and land for community provision. The applicant is Morris Holmes. We have uh, a list of key considerations in our agendas, members. And the reason it's brought to the committee is because the overall scale of, and complexity of the application warrants it to be judged by planning committee. And just for, for clarity, Councillor Daunton uh, is taking no part in this, but she will be speaking as a local member. Uh, the presenting officer is Mr. Dean Scrivener, who I can see online. Dean, good morning. Um, if you could give us any updates to the report we have in front of us and then introduce the item, please. Thank you, Chair. Just to check you can hear and see me all OK. Chair, can you just confirm that you can hear and see me? Uh, quite faint. If you could try and hold the mic a bit closer, that would be useful. Is that better? Yeah, I think that's okay, yeah. if you want to carry yep. on. Yep, thank you. Uh, just before I start the presentation, a um, quick update for members. Um, an email was sent around last week confirming the discharge of some of the conditions on the outline permission. This included condition 14, which referred to cycling bins, store details. Condition 28 was a waste minimisation strategy. Um, condition 17, which was a surface water draining strategy. And condition 32, which was uh, the design statement. Um, condition 17 and 32 were required to be discharged um, prior to the submission of reserve matters application. And therefore have been discharged in consultation with technical consultees. Um, so I just wanted to make, let members, uh, make members aware of that um, before starting. And I'll start my presentation. Hold on a sec, Dean. We've got a, an issue. Councillor Bradman. I'm sorry to interrupt your sorry to interrupt your presentation, but I can't find any condition seventeen on this application. <coughs> am, I, you... am I missing something? I'm on pages ninety of our agenda, and it stops at sixteen. There is no condition I'm... seventeen. Sorry, I was referring to condition 17, the outline permission. Ah, sorry, which, forgive me. Thank you. Sorry, if they make it clear, sorry. Okay. okay, shall I proceed? Yeah, carry on, please, Dean. Yep. Just to confirm, Chair, that you can see that, okay? We can. Yep. Okay, so this is a reserved matters application for the layout, scale, appearance and landscaping following the granting of outline permission for 203 dwellings, including affordable housing and land for community provision with access and associated works, open space and landscaping. And the site is Ida Darwin, Fullborn. The 
main consideration in this presentation today, I will talk about layout, scale, appearance, landscaping, biodiversity, and drainage. So just a bit of background to the site location. Um, as you can see, the site is located just outside the um, village boundary, village framework boundary of Fullbourne, which is indicated by the dashed line. And um, the application site uh, was once occupied by the NHS um, hospital um, buildings, which most have been demolished by now, but some still remain, as you can see. Um, the site is located within the green belt, and the site is um, an allocated site um, under policy H3 of the local plan, which obviously secured um, outline permission, which was approved back in November 2019. So as part of that outline permission, um, a land use parameter plan was approved, um, which just outlines um, the different sections of development within the site and the different phasing. So all of this area to the left of the orange dashed line is phase one, and the um, area development to the right of the orange dashed line is phase two. As you can see, there are green areas within development which should be preserved for open space. And obviously you've got the green wedge to the west, the main access points are a cycle access to the west, main vehicle access, and a temporary access approved here. As part of the outline permission, there were restrictions on density and heights, and this is indicated on this plan here. So the dark area to the northeast of the site um, has a maximum density of 45 dwellings per hectare and a maximum height of 9.5 metres. The lighter shaded areas have a maximum density of uh, 40 dwellings per hectare and a height of 9.5 metres. And the blue areas have a maximum density of 30 dwellings per hectare and a maximum height of nine metres. The idea was, was to create a decreasing density from east to west as you um, move from urban development across into the further countryside. This is again um, depicted in the Illustrative Master Plan, which is a document under the outline permission. Um, and again, you can just see how the general layout of each development parcel on the site was allocated with a green central woodland area with water features through the middle, community provision to the west, a leap to the west and area of play here. And again, the green open parkland to the west. So this is the proposed layout plan, um, which has been submitted and amended uh, many times um, with work, with discussions with the urban design officer and Morris Holmes. So as you can see, the general layout is informal. It's um, in accordance with the parameter plans approved outline permission, with development surrounding a central woodland area running through the central site. The main access is here in the same position as approved. Temporary access is here and a cycle access is still maintained here. This is a cycle footway route which um, meanders through the site as, as a whole, um, increasing permeability through the sites for people to use, and it meanders through the central uh, village hearts all the way to the eastern boundary. It also travels from the, along the front of the site um, to, to, again, um, enhance permeability through the site and connectivity. Um, lots of soft landscaping um, along the western boundary, just to mark the transition from urban um, development into countryside and to soften that edge. Um, community provision is in the allocated um, position as, out, as approved and out outline permission. Um, and the road layout follows and meanders through the site. Um, one of the main changes which was discussed through the progression of the scheme was to change the layout of the main road, which originally was proposed to go through the middle of the um, central village heart, was um, actually agreed to actually follow around the central village heart to allow um, the central village heart to be a main focus of the development. As you can see, the um, the general layout plan um, respects um, the rural countryside setting in terms of um, uh, retaining green space and lots of, long, lots of soft landscaping. Um, along the eastern boundary, you can see a dense layer of soft landscaping um, along the east to screen the development against neighbouring dwellings and to um, screen it from uh, local countryside. 
So the full warm fringe design guide, um, which was adopted in January 2020, um, just outlines the key characteristics of the Isle of Darwin site. So these are the natural woodland to the west of the site, which is rich in biodiversity. Um, the development line, which prevents development encroaching into that western area. Key views into the countryside to the north and to the south, across the windmill to the south as well. Local areas of play, a central um, green woodland heart as well. Um, and the main vehicle point, cycle access and temporary access as well. So in terms of the progression of the scheme, um, this just shows an earlier concept which was um, identified at pre-application stage. And what I just want to draw members' attention is that each of these parcels of development will comprise a variety of architectural styles and design and appearance. Um, so it's it's a very varied layout. So not every block will be appear the same. And this is indicated by the different colours on the edges of each block. And this is um, identified within the character zones area map shown here. So the green edges is the woodland edge character area. The blue is the intimate streets um, character area and the red is the um, development edge character area. Um, again, the uh, scheme has evolved um, from pre-application discussions with the urban design officer and the parish council who are supportive of the scheme. So these are just snapshots of the layout um, that I just um, showed you and I just wanted to home in on some of the key details within the layout. Um, so as you can see, the development follows um, a central green village heart, which is the key characteristic um, of the of the site and is in accordance with the village design guide. To the west of the site is obviously the green wedge, which has remained open, but it's been enhanced with soft landscaping and a community orchard, the leap and a viewing platform. Um, which is being proposed by a developer to um, allow views across to the windmill and the countryside further to the south. These conditions are secured by um, a recommended a condition. And this area here is the eastern section of development, just showing a footway link which increases permeability through the site, um, which is um, set within grass verges and green hedges and a lot of landscaping which then meanders around the back of the site to a picnic area um, just to the south of the um, eastern pond. And this just shows the main access and how um, the layout is very informal um, with a cycle route with set within the grass verge, trees being lined along, the, along either side and car parking tucked to the side of dwellings. So these are just extracts from the village design guide, um, which um, points, points developers in direction of design and how places should create a sense of place in respect of Fullbourne village. Um, so this extract just shows that um, natural verges should be preferred to um, hard landscaping, trees should be planted on either side, um, narrower acts, narrower roads um, to indicate private driveways and um, to reduce any visual dominance of cars, cars parked aside of dwellings and either side of um, accesses should be richly planted. So as you can see, um, this measures uh, 3.8 metres in width to indicate a private driveway, which will comprise um, a gravel bound material. Cars are parked aside of dwellings with tree, land, tree planting along the, um, along the side with the grass verge on the other side. And then this just shows um, what I showed in the previous slide in more detail. So this is the main access way. As you enter the site, as you can see a cycle route um, set within grass verge to the right, footway on the left, green soft, soft landscape into the front of gardens, cars parked to the side um, out of view, and obviously trees um, as well to help soften that approach. And then this is depicted in the visual design guide. So it just shows um, how the scheme has developed and how it is um, incorporated some of the design features recommended in the visual design guide. Um, as well as the visual design guides, uh, which was again discussed at pre-application stage, um, 
the developer was encouraged to incorporate some of the um, layout of housing um, in and around the Fallbourne area. And there are two Muse courts um, arrangements set within the scheme. Um, again, as you can see, cars are parked and tucked out of view. They're set back. Um, soft landscaping has been incorporated. So as you approach the Muse court arrangement, it softens that um, the use of hard landscaping. Um, and again, this was just to reflect an, an approach which was um, or an, an, an existing form of development found within the Fullbourne area. So in terms of the um, character analysis undertaken by the developer, um, they undertook an analysis of the existing characteristics and architectural styles in Fullbourne. Um, again, this was in consultation with the Parish Council. Um, and as you can see, there are a range of architectural styles and roof forms and design um, which are found within Fullbourne. For example, um, eyebrow window detailing, hip roof, um, consistent use of one material such as render or red brick. Um, and what they've done is, is try to incorporate these architectural um, details within the design. So this is what this slide shows. So as you can see, um, the dwelling types will um, contain a, a range of architectural styles and details um, to create a variety um, in appearance as, um, as referred to in the village design guide. So for example, gable frontages, eyebrow window detailing, um, cat slide roof windows, um, consistent use of one uh, material such as render or red brick. Um, sash windows, which are all found within within Fullbourne. And then these images just show examples of what, what the house types would look like. So this slide just shows examples of or snapshots of some of the street scenes within the development and within each um, character area. So as you can see, there is a range of architectural styles um, proposed, which is um, which was discussed with the Parish Council on what was agreed with a pre-application stage. Um, so as you can see, cat slide roofs, gable frontages, flint walls, which are found within uh, the Fullbourne village, um, soft hedging with state railings, which um, again soften that, that edge, um, hipped roofs, um, and then here again in intimate streets, character area have consistent use of red brick, um, which are probably more simple in 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 um, in appearance, but again found in Fullbourne. And then down here you have the woodland edge character area, which comprises these um, oval windows with red brick and uh, buff brick, which are found at the nearby pumping stations in Joe Hinton. So also within the development. Uh, you will find these focal buildings, which um, again was discussed and agreed at pre-application stage. Um, so what the developer has done has undertaken a character analysis of architectural styles within the area and incorporated them into some of these so-called focal buildings, which will help create a, um, a sense of place and also help navigation for users within the site. So these buildings will be found mainly on street corners, but on the woodland edge. Um, opening fronting onto the um, central wooden heart. So focal building type one just incorporates these in oval elongated windows um, with red brick detailing, which is found um, at the pumping uh, lodges in, near Cherry Henson. So that's one type of building which will be found within development. And then the other two types of buildings, you have these um, high gable frontages with traditional flint, flint walls to the front, um, which again found in Fullbourne. And the other type of building is the building with these eyebrow window detail detailings, um, which again are found um, in Fullbourne. And then these uh, are just examples of what these house types will, will look like within the development for members' reference. So on to uh, landscaping. So this is the western um, edge of the development. Um, as you can see, a proposed parkland um, is proposed, uh, which will incorporate a variety of tree species um, to buffer that or soften um, this edge of the development in accordance with the outline permission. And a community orchard 
Um, it's also, it's also proposed, which will contain a variety of local species, um, which was raised as a comment by one of the representations on the application. The viewing platform of where people can view and celebrate the historical significance of the windmill to the south. Um, these conditions are secured by um, these details are secured by condition recommended um, on the reserve matters. And again, these is, this would be heavily screened by tree planting. Uh, the leap details are also secured by um, a condition recommended. Um, the number of mature trees are proposed along the western edge of the development to soften that transition from development into the countryside. Um, soft, uh, soft boundary treatments are also um, proposed around plots um, along the western boundaries just to soften the edge and along the front as well and um, just to soften the um, transition of urban development into the countryside and also respecting the rural uh, location. So this is the um, eastern side of the development. Again, as you can see, the central village heart, which um, all the existing trees are being retained and um, also uh, new planting of trees are proposed um, to replace the trees which are dying on site or in, or in, or in, in a poor condition. Um, again, the eastern boundary, densely screened by soft landscaping to respect the privacy of neighbouring dwellings to the east and to um, mark the boundary of um, um, development. Along the northern boundary, um, there's a 10 metre ecology buffer, which was um, approved at outline, which the developer has to uh, retain. And they're also enhancing this with um, more hedgerow planting as well. Again, the uh, to the front of the site, the cycle footway link um, is set within grass verges. And again, the front hedgerow is just to be enhanced significantly to create a soft edge. So in terms of biodiversity, um, the developers submitted a habitat creation plan, um, which just um, highlights all the ecological um, habitat enhancements on the site. Um, this includes native woodland, wildflowers and grasses, uh, meaty grassland, native wildflower meadows, which indicate like yellow, um, attenuation pond planting, uh, which will have native wet, wetland meadows within them to enhance biodiversity and native hedgerows around some of the plots, edges, boundaries and boundaries of the site. As well as that, um, the developer is um, proposing a number of ecological enhancements. This includes insect towers, hedgehog highways, um, swift nest box, swift nest, nest bricks, um, swifts are obviously prevalent in full so that's very important. Uh, traditional bat boxes and bird boxes, um, and that's indicated on this on this diagram here. Um, a condition is uh, recommended on reserve matters to secure details of these features. So on to drainage, um, as I mentioned earlier, condition 17, the outline permission was required to be discharged prior to submission of the reserve matters application. Um, we allowed the developer to um, submit a discharge condition application to run alongside the reserve matters application to discharge these details. Um, this has been discharged um, in consultation with the Environment Agency, the local leaf flood authority and the drainage officer. So this plan just shows that the um, proposed drainage scheme will incorporate an infiltration um, method, which whereby these attenuation ponds proposed within the site are to act as water stores for um, in extreme in events of extreme rainfall or storm events. So at the members briefing that we had back in um, early December, um, myself and Harry Pickford from the local leaf flood authority um, went through some of the technical drawings on the drainage scheme with members. Um, and it was decided that, or, or mem members requested that um, a more simplified drawing should be provided um, just to explain how the drainage scheme will work. Um, so in discussions with the developer, um, and their drainage uh, technical consultant. Um, this drawing has been provided just to show areas of, or just to show how the surface water drainage scheme will work. So this just shows, um, so the yellow areas are the permeable areas of permeable roads and driveways, which will help um, rainwater 
percolate into the ground. Um, and the blue areas, light blue areas, are obviously the attenuation ponds, which will act as water storage in the events of extreme rainfall. Um, the dashed purple um, lines indicate redundant tunnels, um, which is the existing um, drainage infrastructure on the site, which are to be removed or replaced. Um, some of these will exist and still um, remain, which are the thick purple lines. Um, so some of these will still be used in terms of um, managing surface water on the site. The blue dashed lines are just showing how the water will drain into these um, attenuation ponds um, on, within the site and how that will work. Um, a new foul pumping water station is proposed to the northeast of the site. And there is an existing sump pump which is um, located just outside the red line of the site. Um, which is intended to be retained um, and is obviously connected by an existing um, tunnel, which um, will be used as part of the water drainage scheme. Um, just to let you know, um, I have got Harry Pickford from the Local Leaf Flood Authority and the developers um, technical um, uh, drainage te technical consultant, just in case members have any questions regarding drainage later on. So this is just a simple uh, proposed cross section through the site, just showing the location of the attenuation ponds um, and how they will act as water stores. So this is the existing um, situation with the existing soakaways located underground um, above the groundwater table. And these are to be replaced by these attenuation ponds, which will act as storage waters. As you can see, these attenuation ponds will be um, located clearly above the existing groundwater level. Um, so that's, this is the proposed section, which just simplifies that um, the cross section submitted as part of the drainage strategy, which members um, requested at members briefing. Um, also at members briefing, there was a question regarding um, how the areas of the development will be managed or how which roads, cycleways will be adopted. Um, so this is just a plan just showing uh, which areas will be adopted by whom. Um, the white white roads and cycleways are to be built to an adoptable standard, which the um, local highway authority um, would adopt. Um, the green and yellow areas will be managed by um, private management companies. And the attenuation ponds and the water pump will be um, adopted by Anglian Water. Um, we understand that the developer has been in, in conversations with Anglian Water and they have technical details approved um, for their adoption. Uh, lastly, uh, this is just a plan just showing the affordable housing distribution across the site. Um, so as part of the outline permission, 40% affordable housing was secured. Um, 81 affordable units will be provided with 57 um, being uh, rented out affordable rent with um, 24 being shared ownership. Um, this has been consulted with the affordable housing team and they are happy with this distribution and layouts and the tenure and mix is provided as well. So in conclusion, the proposed development accords with the outline permission and its associated conditions. The proposed development incorporates a design approach which responds well to the character and appearance of Fullbourne Village and the Fullbourne Village design guides and is acceptable in terms of layout, scale, appearance and landscaping. Development proposes a range of ecological enhancements to provide vast enhancement on the site. The surface water drainage scheme has been approved and condition 17 has been discharged in, in consultation with the EA, LFA and drainage officer and therefore officers recommend approval subject to conditions. I'm just going to finish with some illustrative drawings which the developers provided just to show members of what the development um, would look like on the ground. Um, but obviously, these are just illustrative purposes. Thank you, Chair. Dean. Dean, thank you very much for that. Uh, hugely detailed introduction. I really appreciate that. I mean, this is a, a huge uh, reserve matters application we're looking at. So, you know, we really appreciate the level of uh, detail you've gone into there. Um, I'm sure we will probably have some questions for you, so if you could leave your presentation open on your computer, but switch your video off for the moment, please. I'm sure we'll be coming back to you for any questions of clarity in the debate. Um, members, we have a raft of public speakers now. 
Um, and we're going to start with uh, a member of the Fullborn Forum, Mr. David Cotty. David, are you with us? I can see Councillor Cohn, but I can't see Mr. Cotty. Um, you should be able to hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, you should be able to see me. Yes, we can see and hear you, Mr. Cotty. Welcome. Good. <clears throat> so, a um, few ground rules. We have th uh, three minutes each for each of our speakers. Um, and at the end of your presentation, if you could just stay on the line for a second in case any of the members of the committee have any questions of clarity for you, if that's okay. Okay, thank you very much. Okay, so whenever you're ready, please. Um, could I, my, my, but before I start, can I just make uh, one small point of clarification? Um, the planning officer has referred to the, um, the water basins as attenuation ponds. Um, in fact, my understanding is that they're infiltration basins, which are quite different. So I just make that clarification because I'll be referring to infiltration basins in my piece. Okay, that's understood. Thank okay. you. Chair, okay, thank you. Could I just <coughs> ask that our um, audio is turned up a little bit in the chamber, please? Okay, Mr. Cotty, whenever you're ready, please. Right, thank you. <clears throat> On 19th of November 2021, I wrote in response to a further submission of new and amended drawings. I drew attention to what shows that the bank edge level of the six surface water infiltration basins was higher and in some cases significantly higher than the surrounding ground level. The bank levels and the basin bed levels were shown on Wormold Burroughs drawings 503 and 504, but adjacent ground levels were not shown. These levels could only be found at the end of the engineer's drainage strategy document, part three, revision two, Appendix H. By extrapolation of the tabulated data, I found that the height of the bank above ground level adjacent to the basin was 270 millimeters and 50 millimeters respectively for basins one and two, 720 millimeters for basins three, four, and five, and 910 millimeters for basin 3A. It should be noted that in Appendix H, Basin 3A is referred to as Basin 7. I'll give just one example, that of Basin 4. On the drawing, the bank level is given as 11.80, while in Appendix H, the ground level is given as 11.08, resulting in a raised embankment of 720 millimetres. The bed level of the basin is given as 10.54, which means that the bottom of the basin is only 540 millimetres below ground level. So the underground drainage pipe discharging into the basin is likely to be below the bottom of the basin. That is, it doesn't work. I found it difficult to believe what I'd found. So in November, in my November letter, I asked the planning officer to confirm whether my analysis was correct or whether I had misinterpreted the data. I received no reply. Only with the publication of the officer's report did I receive confirmation that my analysis was correct. Paragraph 211 states that, I quote, the intention is to raise the ground levels around much of the site by approximately one metre or so on average, end quote. Please note the words the intention is and around much of the site. This represents a major change to the proposals and is not, as far as I can tell, shown on any drawings or in Appendix H. The report confirms that the raised ground is required in order to provide the necessary separation to groundwater. And it is also clear that the raised levels will be required well away from the basins to allow the underground drainage network to perform under gravity. These very late significant changes to the proposals appear only to be identified in the officer's report. How will the raised ground be achieved? Will buildings also be on raised ground, a metre or so above the existing ground levels on this green belt site? What might be the impact on the surrounding lower ground? Together with the contentious claimed peak water table levels and the Environment Agency's agreement to reduce the minimum distance between the basin bed level and the peak water table from 1.2 metres to one metre, there is no confidence that the issue of surface water drainage 
has been adequately resolved on this low site at the foot of the Gog and Gog Hills. There are still perhaps more questions than answers. Sorry, sir, if you could bring your comments to a conclusion, please. The three minutes has elapsed. I'll finish. Perfect timing. Thank you very much. Um, members, do we have any questions of clarity for, for Mr. Cotty on any of the comments he's made? No? Okay. Oh, sorry, we have one from Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Mr. Cotty. That was really interesting to hear from you. Um, could you just tell us, does the, um, uh, the vegetation on the site indicate that the site is wet at the eastern end currently, or, or does it uh, not indicate that? Sorry, can you just repeat that? Sorry. Sorry. I'm, to, I'm to thinking about the vegetation and whether it's an indicator currently of, of what the level of waterlogging of the ground is. So at the eastern end, near Fullbourne, is, is the ground damp, basically, or is it not at present? Um, I'm, there's nothing to see at the moment, but there, I'm aware and I have seen that area wet um, with, with minor flooding in the past, way back in the past. Um, it, 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 um, I think an indication of the damp in that area is possibly shown by the, um, the water pump that was referred to in the officer's report over in the far eastern corner, which discharges water into the ditch in um, Hinton Road. Um, it, in, it, part of my submission back in February um, last year, I um, submitted photographs of this pump working and discharging water into the ditch outside the actual site. The pipe appears to go under the um, playground area of the Steiner School, um, but find, finding, finding its way to the, to the actual ditch. Um, that, that pump was always part of the NHS site. Um, it's strange that it's somehow now not in the development site, because as far as I'm aware, that pump is now neither in the county council site, which is the, who are the ownership of the Steiner School, and neither is it in the ownership of Morris Holmes. Maybe somebody can clarify that. But I think there is indication that there is um, a, a wetter area down there. Thank you, Chair. Um, and I'm just looking at page 88 of our, of our pack. So I'm just wondering, given a lot of what you've spoken about is about the attenuation ponds, um, there is a condition, uh, condition five on here, um, that does sort of say that more details will be coming forward at a later date. So I'm just wondering, is it your view that what's currently proposed isn't sufficient enough, but that a, you know, there is a way of addressing it there, or do you feel that it can't be addressed ever and therefore the, you know, the development shouldn't happen? So do you think a suitable resolution could be found? Well, I'm obviously not a drainage engineer, so it's it's difficult to tell. But it's obvious from the fact that the um, there's been this proposed raising of the ground by up to a meter over much of the site. N nowhere does it indicate exactly what area of the site needs to be raised. Um, but it, it's quite clear that the previous scheme. Um, was unable to satisfy the requirement of having either one or 1.2 meters clearance below the bottom of the infiltration basin and the peak um, water table level. Um, and I mean, I, I made this in, in, in several responses during last year that there was concern that this could not be achieved. Um, and infil infiltration basins will not work unless there is this um, clear um, area uh, uh, below the, uh, um, the, the bed of the basin and the peak water table. Um, 
it, it would seem to me that the only way that this could be resolved um, without having to raise the ground levels would be to provide larger water storage areas. But this, of course, could only be achieved by losing a few of the homes. Um, otherwise, I can see no other, uh, no other resolution. And it, it, it doesn't seem appropriate to raise the site by a metre. It, it raises all kinds of other questions as to the effect on the um, surrounding lower areas, um, potential runoff onto those, uh, into those other areas and so on. Um, and this site is, as you know, is at the lowest point of Fullbourne. And it, it isn't far away from the, the um, committee will be aware of the Teversham Road site, um, recently refused permission. This is not very far away from there. And this area potentially suffers from some of the same problems. Thank you, Mr. Cotty. I believe there's a follow up from Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Yes, Nice bit of feedback there. Just, just to clarify, so um, your your answer there. So my, I think actually what I heard was that there could be a solution. There is a way to deal with this issue, but you don't feel that what's currently proposed addresses. And, and just to explain, Chair, why I'm asking is obviously as members, as you said, you're not a, a drainage expert, nor are we. Um, but we have to, uh, if we want to approve um, or refuse, it's because we think a solution is possible or not. So am I right in, in considering from your comments there that you think there could be a solution to address it? Um, I mean, they're, they're obviously, um, I, I assume that there is a solution given um, a, a different scheme. But I think the solution put forward of raising the ground by up to a metre um, 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 brings with it all other, all sorts of other questions, given that this is a green belt site with restrictions on the heights of the buildings. Um, so it, it really doesn't seem to be appropriate. And I think the, the implications, th this, this sudden decision to raise the ground level seems to be a last minute decision. Um, and my feeling is that the implications of that have not been thought through. Um, we've not got the full information to understand the impact of that raised ground. Thank you, Mr. Um, I, I, think, I, think, I think we get the gist. Thank okay. you very much. Thank you. Um, we have no further questions of clarity for you. So we, you know, thank you very much for taking the time to speak to us today. Um, and we will move on to our next public speaker, which is a Mr. Mark Gatehouse, who's speaking on behalf of the applicant. And I believe Mr. Gatehouse is sharing his time with uh, a drainage consultant, Mr. Gary Goodwin. Do we have Gary and Mark here? Yes, we do. I, I can see you, Gary. I can't see Mr. Gatehouse. Is he with us? Yeah. Hi there, Chair. Can you, can you hear me and see me? Yes, we can see and hear both of you. Thank you very much. So, yeah, we have uh, roughly three minutes to address the committee, please. Um, at the end of which, if you could just both you hold on the line in case there's any questions of clarity from committee members. So I'm not sure who's going to lead, but um, whoever is, whenever you're ready, please. Okay. Can I can I just clarify? Uh, it will be myself that's speaking, Gary Goodwin, and uh, Mark Gatehouse is our technical director uh, for our eastern region, who is responsible for the design of the development uh, and the drainage scheme. Uh, so. Just a point of correction there, sorry. Okay, thank you. Uh, Chairman, members, thank you for the opportunity to speak. My name is Gary Goodwin and I'm the Group Planning and Design Director for Morris Homes Limited. Uh, I would also like to introduce our Technical Director for the Eastern Region, Mark Gatehouse, who has been responsible, along with our professional consultants, for the design and ultimately the approval now in place for the drainage schemes on this development. And he's available for questions um, should you uh, have any through your deliberations. The application before you today represents the culmination of over six years of work uh, by your council, Homes England and Morris Homes. Indeed, just this reserve matters application has taken two years to get to this point. But that's representative of some of the complex issues on site, the level of local involvement and the need to meet all the high design aspirations of all those involved. And I believe your planning officer is to be commended for such a detailed report and presentation, which is very informative in every aspect of this site. 
Um, and it's very difficult for me to sum that, summarise that in three minutes. At the beginning of our involvement with this site, we embraced every element of the design brief and the conditions approved in the outline consent. We then began a very thorough consultation process with your urban design officers, the parish council and other area forums to ascertain their own design aspirations for the shape, the form and the appearance of development and any local concerns. And after a year long pre-application process and the receipt of everyone's backing, we were actually invited to submit the reserve matters application before you today. Throughout the last year, we've spent an enormous amount of time responding to the very detailed and complex consultation responses associated with the finer detail that we've now applied for, even down to the types of hinges and bolts on the bin store gates. Of particular importance has been the proposed drainage scheme, but we've now proven that that does have the capacity to accommodate our developments and in fact offers significant improvements over the previous uncontrolled former hospital drainage scheme by providing on-site storage for, for water in the event of extreme weather events and global warning, warming without imposing on any off-site systems or causing flooding elsewhere. And we're pleased that the LLFA and the Environment Agency have now approved our proposals and the relevant, relevant drainage condition on the outline consent has now been discharged after a, their own detailed assessment. The proposals before you today comply with all your adopted policies in terms of design, landscape, ecology, sustainability and affordable housing, etc. And in many aspects, they go beyond those policies, for instance, in providing a biodiversity net gain. The pro proposals present a well-designed, bespoke development, the form of which accords with the outline consent, the approved design master plan and the specific requirements of both the parish council and your urban designers. Ultimately, our proposals meet and exceed the aspirations of all those involved with this site over the past six years, and they are worthy of your officer's recommendation for approval. And I would kindly ask that you vote in favour of, of his recommendation. As with Mark, I am more than pleased to answer any questions you may have during your deliberations. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that. That's almost three minutes to the second, so I really appreciate the timing on that one. Um, Members, do we have any questions of clarity for either of the gentlemen? Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, interestingly, I, I picked up on the issue of the drainage um, and the proposal to raise the ground level um, when I was going through this um, application. So what I want to ask you is this. The condition that has now been discharged on drainage. Um, is that based on you raising the ground level uh, on most of the site um, up to one meter to be able to give the clearance that's needed for the infiltration basins to work? Uh, good afternoon, so good morning, Chair. So is it okay if I just answer Councillor Hawkins? Yes, that's fine. Um, so, is it possible, I wonder, is it possible, Chair, for the drainage, sort of the, the, the sort of simplest, simplified drainage strategy do you want to be pulled up? And I can just identify some points of reference. Sure, was that the, was that the document in the yeah. officer's introduction? <clears throat> yeah. Is so that the, the document you can see on your screen now? That, that's the one, thank you. So, Great. I think in simple terms, and I just need to sort of, uh, to try and explain this graphically. So the drainage strategy to um, our proposal consists of, um, sort of three important elements. Ground raising um, is part of that, but that's not only just to solve the, the drainage uh, strategy, it's also to deal with, obviously this was a former uh, hospital site, so a brownfield site, uh, and we've got capping layers to put in there to uh, create um, a sort of clean garden area. So there's, there's actually a residential end use requirement for us to raise gardens, notwithstanding what we need to do about the drainage. Um, the drainage really is taking from what was there previously, which, as Gary has alluded to, was large impervious, impervious areas of roof, hard standing areas, which were then being piped into um, soakaways and uncontrolled soakaways, so flooding straight into the groundwater. So the system of now you see in front of you, where what we've got here are extensive areas of permeable uh, pavement, uh, which are then controlling water getting into the ground also pipe systems which act as storage and control and infiltration basins which also then percolate the water into the ground below and provide storage 
Our, our system, as Gary suggested in his commentary, includes for not only the sort of peak one in a hundred year rainfall intensity, which is what we're required to do as um, a new development, but also includes a 40% um, increase in climate change. Uh, the system that was there previously, when this was all covered by hospital buildings and um, large areas of car parking, drives and all the rest of it, didn't have any of those requirements in there. So we've actually got within our design large areas of controlled storage and uh, measured infiltration into the um, subsource below. So to answer your question, it's not just being driven by raising ground levels. There's a whole site-wide strategy here that's been called into play. The, the other point that I wanted to, to maybe um, just to clarify is that uh, Mr. Cote um, seems to make reference to these sump pumps being an absolute critical um, part of the previous drainage strategy. Our, our discussions with the NHS and their facility managers have clarified that the, the service tunnels which are indicated in magenta on this plan, um, those sump pumps, all they're doing is emptying water from those service tunnels. Um, those service tunnels are approximately two metres deep. You could walk from one end to the other down the primary arterial route. Um, they are they are sort of they've not been maintained. They're they're leaking. They're redundant. Those will, in the best part, when we build our development, be redundant, albeit that the sump pump, which is to the northern boundary of the Stein School, will still be in existence and still be utilised. But they, what they're not doing, they're not lowering the groundwater locally. It's not part of a global strategy. That's incidental as part of the facilities management of the, um, the hospital. Um, and, and I think there's this urban myth that these sump pumps are uh, protecting the, the environment and keeping the groundwater artificially low and, and preventing, you know, flooding. Um, but they're, they're basically a subservient sort of system to the, the service tunnels that exhibited across the site. Uh, and our system will replace that, but also retain that in part. So it's a significant improvement on what was there previously. Um, so I don't know whether that's uh, in a convoluted way has answered your your question, Councillor Hawkins. So answer the can, question. Can I just... Did you want to come back, Councillor? Please. Uh, thank you for your answer. Um, it, I'm still not clear. Um, you still have to raise some parts of this site. Is that correct? Absolutely. Yes. Okay. And how much can, of the site are we talking about? Can you tell us which Sorry. areas of the site, please? Um, where, where we've got the balancing ponds, we are raising levels across there, but there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a wider requirement to raise levels for us to um, put a capping layer in above the existing made ground on parts of the site, because this was obviously a former to brownfield site. So we've, we've got to bring in material or sort of generate material to raise a, a install a capping layer across the site. Thank you, Chair. I'll come back to this later. Thank you. And okay. Councillor Bradley, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, my question is similar and I'm, it's very useful. We've got this diagram still up um, because I wanted to ask in which specific areas will the ground be raised? And um, I've got a couple of other questions, but I'll, I'll, if, if you'll give me, I'll, I'll ask those after that question has been raised. And in other words, for example, I hear what you say, you need to put a capping layer over the existing ground because it was brownfield site and you might need to raise that. So Correct. what depth would that be? And are you having to raise the ground where the, th where the five attenuation ponds and the sixth large pond are in order to make them viably deep for the purpose they're intended and could you indicate where that is uh, so just in answer to your question in parts yes we are raising ground levels to bring the bottom basin of the attenuation uh, the infiltration basins um, to give us a, a sort of a clear, at least a metre clearance below, uh, sort of above the groundwater table. Um, in terms of a capping layer, where we're required to raise levels 
uh, to cap over made ground, we're required to install the 600 mil capping layer. That, that's a sort of a building recall, building control requirement. Um, where you've got the attenuation ponds, um, which is just south of the pumping station to the, uh, in the, the east, we're not raising ground levels there. So in the immediate vicinity of the three attenuation ponds in the um, central green area, Yes. How, how high are you having to raise the ground in that location? Approximately half a metre. OK, thank you. Uh, the next one is the sump pump, which is to the southeast corner of the diagram. You said it will still be used, but as others have pointed out, it's outside uh, the red line plan. And I wanted to know what is your understanding about whose ownership that's in and who will maintain it? Yeah, my, my understanding with that existing sump pump, so we had a meeting with the NHS facilities team. Uh, our understanding is, is it's currently in the ownership of the NHS and they're maintaining it, they're operatives. It sits out of the land that Morris Homes will be acquiring. Um, and I would presume that whilst the NHS have still got uh, buildings being retained there on our phase two parcel, it will remain in existence. At the point in which that phase two land um, um, becomes vacant and the NHS uh, you know, vacate the site and the buildings become demolished, then there won't be a requirement for it because all of the service tunnels that um, that, that sump pump drains will become redundant and will eventually be abandoned and demolished. But, but in the interim, while we're building our phase one parcel, it will remain in, in existence um, for the duration that the NHS facilities are still there. Thank you. Okay. Well, those are your questions, Councillor. Yeah, thank you very much. Um, I don't think we have any further questions of clarity for either of our speakers. So, again, we say thank you very much to both of you for addressing the committee and for answering the technical questions. Um, and we will move on to our next three local speakers who are the three local members for Fullbourne. Um, we have Okay, we will start with Councillor Graham Cohn, who we did briefly see earlier, um, as I appreciate he has work commitments. So, Councillor Cohn, if you're with us. Uh, thanks very much, Chair. Thanks for allowing me to, to speak, and, uh, and I'll be brief. Um, essentially, um, I hope the committee support this application. I think there's been lots of uh, work done with the developers, the parish council, local residents, um, the, the local members um, in trying to make this an application that is suitable for Fallbourne and something that is, is is credible for our village. I think it does take into account the, the village design uh, guide and um, it's a bespoke development that sort of, um, you know, is really taken into account sort of de design within Fallbourne as a village. Um, you know, there's lots of other things that um, ha have come up during the sort of consultation in terms of swift boxes, booing platforms, play areas, the the, the orchard, and um, you know those that, that the community building. Those things I think have been taken into account in in this development. So um, I think you know, given that it's got 40% affordable housing, I, I think it you know this development really could be a good thing for for Fullborn. Um, so I hope the committee does does support it. It's got support of the parish council. Um, you know, it's got support of myself as local member. Um, I think there has been lots of concerns about the drainage and the fact that we know this is an area that you know could flood given the the surrounding area. But um, as has been pointed out, I think there has been a lot of work from the developers to. You know, rectify that situation and it is supported by the environment agency and there is i think well that there needs to be suitable conditions in place to make sure that that is fulfilled obviously i'm not a drainage officer but you know that i think you know that condition should um you know make sure that that is that site isn't going to have an implication on the on the surrounding areas so in short, I support the application and I hope the committee does as well. Thanks for letting me speak, Chair. 
No problem, Councillor. Um, if you've got a few more minutes, I'm just going to ask you to hold on in case there are any questions of clarity for yourself. Yeah. Um, I don't see anyone, so I think your comments are duly noted, and we thank you very much for taking time out of your busy schedule to speak to us today. Lovely. Thank you. Cheers. Thank you. Um, we get, now go to our next local member, who's Councillor John Williams, who I believe is online. John? Thank, thank you, Chair. Um, good, good morning, Committee. Um, as you can see from the case officer's report, uh, my concern has been the surface drainage uh, for, for this development. The report acknowledges that drainage is an issue, given that we have a record of flooding in the roads to the east of the Ida Darwin site, namely um, uh, Thomas Road and uh, Roberts Way. We must ensure that this development doesn't aggravate this problem, contrary to our planning policies. You have before you a proposed drainage system, which, as we've heard, the developers assured us and me is better than that that was in place for the hospital. And that this, um, and that this reserve matters has now been discharged. As, as other speakers have said, you know, I'm not a hydrologist and therefore must rely on the experts to guide me and yourselves. Nevertheless, the development is taking place in two phases. And I should ask that you consider instructing the applicant to review the working of the drainage system following completion of phase one and before the start of phase two. And obviously the start of phase two involves the removal of the tunnels and the pumps. I, sh I should also ask that you ensure that the ownership of the pumps, which are mentioned in the report, are secured um, so they can continue to be maintained and that uh, for as long as they are needed, particularly the pump by the Steiner School as as we can see is is very important until the estate is completed and the new drainage system comes into use otherwise i support the officer's recommendation of approval given that um, this development will bring much needed affordable housing to fallbourne but i would ask you to ask that you you are you instruct the as i say instruct the applicant to review the drainage to make sure that we are absolutely certain that the drainage system that is being put in place does the job and doesn't flood other homes around the site. Thank you. Thank you, Councillor Williams. Um, if you wouldn't mind holding on in case there are any questions of clarification for the local member. I'm looking around. No, I think that was all clear, Councillor. So thanks very much for your Thank time you. as well this morning. And with that, we'll move on to the third local member who's with us in the room, Councillor Daunton. If you'd like to come forward to the mic, please. So, might need to tap in. There you go. So, as usual, three minutes, and then if you wouldn't mind holding on for any questions of clarification. Or well, we may be having a microphone issue here. Yeah. Any more success? Yeah, we're in. Okay. So Thank I think you. you know the rules. Three minutes and then hold on for any questions of clarity. Whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. I want to support this application. The development provides 40% affordable housing, which Fullborn needs. I do, however, have concerns on three points, uh, some of which I have already raised at an earlier stage. Three points. Cycle in bin storage, outdoor space for affordable housing, and overall design. First point. The development meets current local plan obligations for cycle storage. However, this does appear to be under provision for the affordable homes, which do not have external storage to provide additional capacity. This won't further our aims on active travel. Fallbourne is at easy cycling distance from major employment centres, Capital Park, Peterhouse Technology Park, the proposed Cambridge International Technology Park, Adam Brooks, 
the biomedical campus and the city centre. Even with just one bike space per bedroom, the bike stores for plots 50 to 55, those are the, on your plans, Windermere, Grassmere, Ambleside house styles, make it impossible for the easy removal of the two end bikes if the central racks are occupied. Lack of space is still evident. It should also be noted that both have been in cycle stores for the community building and the apartments building, plots 40 to 45, have no roof protection. Previously, the bin storage for the affordable homes had individual wheelie bins for each home, but because the stores were too small, the bins were so tightly packed that some would have been very difficult to access. The developers tried to deal with this without increasing the size of the storage building by providing larger shared bins. Because of the size of the bins, it's now not possible for residents to move them into place for collection. I understand that some kind of management agent will be responsible for taking out the bins each week. But the loss of just a few dwellings would enable properly sized stores and allow for increase in cycle parking. Second point, most affordable homes are provided as flats or masonettes, most without gardens, even for ground floor flats, and no balconies for first floor properties. The affordable homes will mostly be reliant on tumble dryers for drying washing, but a recent report found that one of the main sources of microfibers into the air was from tumble dryers. And these will be the people most unable to afford to buy and run such high energy appliances. This is a tightly drawn development where dwellings are clustered together on a larger site. Third point, the Philborn Village Design Guide, pages 14 and 15, advocates good contemporary design of elegant simplicity, which should reflect the diversity of the village. What is presented here is very loosely based on an interpretation of two styles, Georgian and Victorian. There are also still houses with meter boxes on the front elevations, contrary to village design guide recommendations. I draw these points to the attention of the committee since the village design guide project has been sponsored and promoted by South Cams. Thank you. Thank you very much. Members, any questions? Oh, hold on, Claire. Hold on. <laughs> any questions of clarity? Um, Councillor Hawkins, please. And then Councillor Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I just want to pick up on the point you made about the um, bin storage. Um, can I refer us to paragraph 251 on page 83 of our papers? I remember marking that, thinking to myself, how will the management company get people to come and pull the bins out for collection? Is that? Um, <laughs> have you seen this work elsewhere? I mean, what exactly is your concern about it? I am concerned, but I just want to understand what your concern is. My concern is that the space is still too tight. And do you think this thing will work, that the management company will send someone out every, whatever it is, to pull the bins out? Well, that was my concern, that it would be dependent on a management agent, and I wondered how that would actually work in practice. Thank you. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, perhaps if the bin storage is of a particular concern, or obviously we'll debate it, um, would you be agreeable if there were some sort of conditions on bin storage, perhaps? That's my first question. Secondly, this one's probably more for officers. I don't think we can take use of tumble dryers as a material planning consideration. I'm having shakes of head, so I'm afraid I'll, I'll have to glaze over that. Um, the, other, the other issue you raised was around design um, and the village design statement. Obviously, that's a, a balance and material, but obviously the parish council feel the opposite to your, yourself, that it does fit in with the character. Um, is it just the fact that it's only two styles? How, whereabouts in the actual, if, if you're asking us to object to this, what would be the material parts of the design guide that you feel it's in conflict with? Thank you, Chair. Chair, might I um, gather my copy of the village design guide, which I have here? I have it here. Thank 
Um, so, in one point, and the village decided. Use your mic, please. Sorry. Um, I'm trying to find the exact. Um, uh, the, the village design guide re refers to um, simplicity. Um, sorry, Chair, I can't find it now. Uh, yes, here we are. 10.12. Building should not be repetitive and provide provide variety of building types and design with coherent scale, massing and elegant simplicity in detail. Um, and that's on page 15. And on page 14 um, is mentioned a contemporary design, that, that contem uh, for new developments, contemporary uh, design is what is um, uh, promoted or um, advised. Um, and my point here um, is that the, the styles are um, copying Victorian and um, Georgian styles and, and not uh, contemporary styles. Do you want to come back? Yeah. Please. So, so to be clear, the, the a reason for refusal for yourself would be that there's it's two historical styles. There's two, and you, but it also said about simplicity, and you said about there needs to be more variations, and yes. not the same. Yeah. Um, from what we've seen, there are three different areas in the site for 200 houses, and also there's lots of sub variations within that. How much more do you think there needs to be? How many more variations? Because we, we've seen about, I think probably about 10. I'd have to add them up. So where do you think the benchmark should be then if 10, 10 or plus isn't sufficient? Um, I think my main point is that I would say that there was a copying earlier styles rather than the elegant simplicity of a, of a contemporary design. So to clarify, it's not that there isn't enough variation, it's, it's the type of style? Yeah. Okay, so that's different from the original. Thank you. Thank you. And a question from Councillor Bradman. Thank you. I'm going to come back to the refuse storage, uh, and I just want to understand, uh, because I'm sure you understand it more clearly than I do. As I understand it, the designs, the, the amount of space allocated for bin storage, in, in your view, has caused them to be required to change what would normally be the arrangement. In other words, in normal developments, you'd have each house responsible for its green, black, and blue bin. And because the space that's been allocated is not sufficient, they are presumably indicating a, a, a communal, bigger size of bin, which a management company is going to pull out. Can, do, you, do you have the feeling that if, um, if the bin storage area was made larger, it would be more possible for people to manage their own bins. Because like other members here, I, I think it's deeply dubious as to whether a management company will come out. It says, should the managing agent put the bins out the night before the collection? You think about this in your own arrangement. A paved area will need to be provided for the bins. However, if the bins are put out at 6 a.m. in the morning of the collection day, this is not required. So somehow they're gonna sit out in the middle of the road until the bin man comes around. I mean, is it your impression that there might be enough room within the site if they just um, configured it differently? Yes. <laughs> Thank you for your but, elegant simplicity of your answer. Might I come back on that? Briefly, yes. Um, I think my, my main point is, as I said, that it's too, it is a little too tightly packed. And um, if it were less tightly packed, we would, there would be the requirement for managing agents. Thank you very much. I think those are all the questions for you, Councillor, so thank you for your time. Okay, members, that's the end of our public speakers. Um, so we have two options now. We can either move straight to the debate or we can have a brief 10-minute recess, if anyone fancies. We've been going for an hour and a half. Just want to take a quick straw poll. If anybody Does anybody want to break now? Or are they happy to continue? Okay, we'll carry on then, members, moving into the debate now. Obviously, we do also have an opportunity to ask any questions of clarity of either the case officer or we do have a drainage officer with us as well if there's any specific questions 
uh, that a drainage officer can help with. So I'm going to start with Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Can I just get clarification first from, from officers um, about we've got this issue with the bins and obviously it's been recommended approval so this will be something that the officers have looked at. Um, so can we have a bit more view from officers as to, to where that is in the planning balance for them because it does seem you know, a minor bit in the balancing of all, all of this but if perhaps some sort of conditioning could work to alleviate concerns. Sure, I think um, if Dean could answer that one, I mean, I will point out, I see there's a condition 11, which does uh, relate to waste collection. Yeah, but that's why I'm asking, do we think that's sufficient to cover? If I just could ask the second one as well, which is about how the comments around the design guide, because obviously it's been felt that in balance it, it's supportive. We've heard one, one section of it. Um, by Councillor Daunton that it might be in conflict due to contemporary styles. So just if um, officers who, who are probably know it off by heart by now um, could say about the uh, design guide as a whole and um, any issues that... that sure. Are. Who wants to take that? Dean or I see Travine's appeared. Um, yep, yeah, I'll probably let Travine jump in on the design grounds. I was just going to answer the question regarding waste um, or refuse. Um, plans first, um, which was raised, obviously, as the um, chair, you have indicated that condition 11 is recommended um, to secure details and management of the refuse um, across the site. I'd just like to remind members that uh, condition 14 um, has been discharged, um, which secured uh, bin and uh, cycle store details. Um, this, is, was it, this was carried out in consultation with the waste department, um, and they were happy with the bin storage, and they are, they are uh, satisfied that there is sufficient capacity of bins um, provided, and the arrangements, including pool distances and bin collection points, are all secured, and they are happy with these arrangements. So I just wanted to answer that first. I'll let Javine, um jump in to answer the um, comment regarding design. Thanks. <coughs> Thanks, Dean. Uh, good morning, uh, members. Um, yeah, my kind of comment with regard to contemporary design and what's stated in the village design statement is simply, you know, the um, definition of contemporary and contemporary, you know, means of, of its time. Um, and the scheme that's before members today is a scheme that is drawing from uh, kind of the um, features uh, as shown by Dean in his presentation, you know, the features that are found in Fullborn Village and trying to adapt the house types of um, Morris homes to respond to the characteristics that are found in Fullborn. It is in no way a, a, a Victorian house or in no way a, a Georgian house, but it's interpreting some of those uh, historic features that are found in Fullborn in in this in this development. So, in in the true sense, you know, contemporary means of its time, and you know, this this could be seen that way. The other point I think to say is also the consultation exercise that we conducted at pre-app stage, um, and the opportunity to um, you know discuss the future of what, what the future style of this place would be like. And we carried quite an open consultation process through which we have got feedback from the parish council that they wanted to go with this, this uh, form of approach. And that's the way, you know, that's the direction that we uh, went taking on board some of the um, views coming in from, from the village. Thank you. Thank you for that. Um, I believe, Councillor Williams, you wish to come back on those points? Chair, I was just going to um, give my view for the debate, if that's OK. Thank officers for the clarification. Um, so given the condition that's in here in, in regards to waste and given that the other conditions have already been discharged and that our operatives are happy with um, what's being provided, I don't feel it would be reasonable to look at that as a, as a ground for refusal, given you know, technical um, officers that probably know much more about emptying bins and, and what have you than us. Um, and uh, if they have to go out the night before, that's no different to what any of us do, I think, um, to be quite honest. In, in relation to uh, it as a principle and the design, 
um, I have some ingredients with the parish council because when I was looking through it personally, I thought how nice that we've actually got three different sort of styles. With it's two hundred houses, it's small development really in the grand scheme of what we've seen. For me, I I really liked the fact that it's got character. Um, I've seen so many things here where I've thought it's just standardised blocks or. You know, and it gets said, oh, it's urban or it's contemporary, and these words are sort of used to, to give alternative, whereas actually, for me, maybe it's, you know, my degrees in law and history, perhaps I'm nostalgic, but I really liked particularly the, the sort of arches and the windows. You know, it's got something about it, and also it, I think it does reflect many areas of Fulbright. Well, you've, you've got more modern areas, but... Um, one thing that's always struck me by the village of Forborn is its green spaces in its settlements. It is an area that has seen development but managed to maintain those little patches of green in places and that communal green area. And I think to have that at the centre, um, the way it's been done, and I agree with the way the road has, has moved so it's not cutting through, I have to say is, for myself, very much in line with the, the feeling of Forborn. So I'll be, um, I'll be, prob I will be supporting it in, in line with supporting the parish council. Superb. Thank you very much for those comments. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please, you're next. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, two things, if I may, but first of all, just to say uh, well done uh, to Dean. Um, found the report quite exhaustive and... Um, easy to read and good work. Um, can we bring up, if you don't mind, please, Dean, the picture showing the distribution of the affordable housing, please? If you could, Dean. Yeah. Bear with me just a second. Um, whilst he's doing that, it's just, I, it, so the top left, seems to have a lot, as you can see, the, there's a lot of yellow at the top towards the um, western side, and there's hardly any. Um, sorry? Dean, could you remind yeah. us of the, of the colour, um, yeah, please? What's the key? What does yellow mean? What does yeah. red mean? Yeah, so the um, yellow represents um, uh, the affordable units, which we um, affordable rent, and the red shows um, shared ownership. Um, so that is the distribution which has been um, consulted with the affordable housing team and they are happy with, with that split um, and, the, and the distribution. Sorry, I'll, I'll let you finish. <laughs> I know they say they're happy with it. It just seemed to me when I initially looked, I thought uh, there is a bit missing at the bottom western end. Um, but yeah, that I just wanted to point that out, that I didn't think that that was the best distribution. However, it's still a good distribution. Um, the other issue that actually concerns me um, is paragraph 116 on page 58, uh, where it talks about some degree of conflict with the, uh, with the village design guide in that some of the buildings will not sit below the crown of the trees. Um, and it also, further on when I read about having to raise the land at some points, raised an alarm in that if we're raising the ground already and this isn't sitting below the, um, the crown of the trees, then what sort of height difference are we looking at? How much does it stand out? Um, it might be in material planning terms that it's a minor <coughs> conflict, but that point isn't clear to me yet. And I'll just add some clarification on that. Um, otherwise, yes, it is a good plan. Um, I'd love to see it when it's done. Thank you. Is there any clarification on Councillor Hawkins' point from either Dean or the flooding officer? Uh, yeah, I'll I'll go first. Um, in terms of the um, the heights of the buildings, um, some of the apartments were actually um, three three story three stories high, 
um, as originally proposed, and um, we had a discussion with the with the developer, and it was agreed to lower those those um, those heights, um, which would actually um, also reduce the the um, the visual impact of those buildings to two and a half stories. Um, our report's probably not quite as clear in that respect. In that the apartment blocks I was referring to. Um, they actually uh, have a two and a half story element, but they actually step down into one and a half story elements. So they're not completely two and a half stories in total. Um, and um, it has been confirmed that the those heights um, will be in 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 line with with the with the crown of the trees, and they wouldn't actually appear above them. Um, in terms of the um, the raising of ground levels, I might ask Mark just to clarify on the raising the ground levels. Of, it is my understanding that the raising the ground levels would just be around the, uh, the, the proposed ponds area, but I'll just see if Mark can clarify that, if he's still here. Is that Mark Gatehouse who no. spoke previously? Yes. Yeah. Yeah, if he's able to clarify for yeah. the committee. Yeah. Hi, Dean. Yeah, yeah, so you, you're correct. Um, we, don't, we don't want to get carried away that we're raising ground levels across the entire site. That isn't the case. Um, we're raising, obviously, to achieve the surface water um, headroom above the uh, groundwater table. But when I'm talking about raising ground levels, I'm talking about putting in a capping layer in gardens. So you've got clean material in rear gardens. Um, I don't want the kind of committee to have these visions that we're coming along with huge amounts of earth and raising the whole thing meters out the ground. That, that really isn't the case. Um, so when I'm talking about raising ground levels, <clears throat> not raising the units, we're raising uh, the earth around the gardens to create a capital layer. So you've got clean gardens um, for the residential end use, which is a, a building regulation requirement. Does that clarify, Councillor Hawkins? Uh, no, it doesn't. Sorry, maybe I'm being thick today. Um, so. The when when the building is built, are you telling me that the ridge height will be at or around the level of the crown of the trees, including whatever raising of ground that you need to do? Correct. I believe in certain places um, the ridge heights of some of the, the apartment units, which are two and a half story, will be at the crown of the trees, but the predominant predominantly most of the units will be significantly lower than the crown of the tree. And that will also be after any ground raising is required for drainage and remediation. Yeah. Thank you, Chair. Clear now. Thank you very much. Uh, next, we have Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to come back to drainage uh, uh, because we've got an engineer here, so why not use them? Um, I would like clarification of <clears throat> the issue that was raised early on in the report at um, paragraph 32. The Environment Agency raised the matter of the necessity for a minimum of 1.2 millimetre clearance between the base of any infiltration um, sustainable drainage system and peak seasonal groundwater. And then later on, on the 25th of August, they said, ultimately, the 1.2 clearance is not a statutory requirement. So that seemed to be saying one thing on one hand and then changing their mind on the other. And I found that very worrying. But in addition, um, at paragraph 213 on page 76, there was all the business about the pumps. And um, I know we've been told that the concerns that were originally raised have now been um, resolved to the satisfaction of the lead local flood authority. But I would like to know, so I want some address of that EA comment. I want some address on the, 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 um, the tunnels that are already there. And I also want to, to concentrate, as would happen in times of heavy rainfall, on that very eastern attenuation pond next to Roberts Way and Thomas Road, who know they have already they already have a history of flooding, and I want to be absolutely sure that that attenuation pond at the very eastern end of the, the site. What is the arrangement if that becomes very full? 
Where does the water go from there? Does it go out through the pump near the Steiner School? Does it go to a ditch? Where does it go in, in conditions where the groundwater is already high? And I take us back as a planning authority to the um, Christmas Eve 2020, when the water table was already very high all over the county, and we had very heavy rain on the 24th <coughs> and 25th of January, uh, December, and places flooded. And I want to know what would happen under those circumstances um, to the properties in Thomas um, Road and, um, sorry, in that area. So that's fine. I think there's three, three points to address there, please, Dean, or equally the drainage um, engineer. So we have um, yeah, some clarity around the Environment Agency's comments and then retraction of comments, some clarity on the tunnels, and then some clarity on the eastern attenuation basin, please. Thanks, Chair. Um, I'll take the question regarding the EA's comments. So the EA um, had originally requested a 1.2 metre clearance um, between basin level and the groundwater. However, they, their main concern was the uh, potential of uh, groundwater becoming contaminated um, and had actually overlooked that conditions 21 and 25 of the outline permission um, require these details to be submitted prior to commencement, um, which the developer will have to demonstrate um, at a later stage under a separate discharge condition application. Um, so after discussions with the EA, um, they withdrew um, that comment regarding the 1.2 metre clearance um, level and um, it's my understanding that that will be dealt with under a separate application. Um, I will uh, let Mark explain um, the or answer the other two questions regarding the um, drainage of the eastern pond, if that's okay, Mark. Yeah, okay, thank you, Dean. Um, Chair, is it possible to pull up the uh, the kind of cross section that um, Dean had in his planning pack? We showed the ponds. Yeah, but I'll get I'll get that up. Okay. Um, so just to just to answer the councillor's concerns, um, and just to sort of if I can just reset the scene. So obviously, when when this site was and if you see it, when this site uh, was the hospital facility you had large buildings large areas of heart standing all of the drainage was directed by pipes into the soakaways which sat um, in the groundwater and and so therefore you had uncontrolled rainwater flows going straight into the soakaways and straight into the local groundwater um, and, and I understand that there have been sort of local and historical flooding events as a result of that, because you've got uncontrolled large areas of catchment being directed straight into uh, the existing groundwater. What our system does, and I think the proposed section at the top there, again, helps to demonstrate, I guess, against the sort of scale, really, of how our oh, unit wow. sort of sits with the sort of tree landscape as, as well. Could you, you can just see explain what, we, what, what that section shows? Sorry to interrupt you, but could you just yeah. describe where that section is? Thank you. Uh, yeah, I don't know whether you've got whether you've got the plan which shows where that section was taken through, Dean. It's essentially this cuts through the central uh, green heart um, of the uh, the site and shows the two areas of the road and housing through the middle of the site. Um, right, but is it north south or east west? Yes, yeah, going north, north south. Okay, yeah, north thank south. you. That's fine. That, so, so this is where the attenuation ponds are. Correct. Yeah, it's that okay. central area, and this is the bit where, look, like when we say we're raising ground level, as you can see on that top section, um, the red line which shows the existing ground level, and on that left hand side where the housing and carriageway are, we're raising ground levels to make sense of the infiltration pond to make that shape. Well, actually, on the right hand side, we're not raising ground level significantly um, to make the attenuation pond work, but we are raising ground levels to make the capping layer work, if that kind of makes sense. Um, so what, what you had previously was all this rainwater firing onto roofs into um, the groundwater in an uncontrolled manner. Um, and therefore, I would suspect that at some point in intense rainfall, the wider groundwater did become saturated. I understand there's been historic flooding um, in the adjacent development. 
what we now have with our scheme is uh, all of that rainwater both infiltrating uh, through permeable layers and going straight into the ground in much wider areas. But importantly, everything that's onto a roof and onto carriageway is captured into a piped system, which obviously has got its own storage by virtue of your pipe and you've got manholes, um, directed into the uh, infiltration basins where um, in low levels of rainfall, the rain just simply enters those basins and infiltrates through into the existing groundwater, um, albeit at a sort of meter above the existing groundwater table. And in intense rainfall, those basins actually act as uh, storage. So if you take the consideration of, you know, if, you're, if you've got a bath and you've got a shower, which is pipe, which is, you know, pouring into the bath at low falls, at low kind of rates, all of that bath will continue to empty, it goes down the plug hole. If you turn the power up and you've got, um, you know, lots of water coming out the shower head and it can't get down the plug hole, it fills up the bath. And then once you turn off the shower, it eventually percolates away. And that's what you've got here is a very much a controlled uh, surface water system. To answer your concerns about future flooding, the, the, the system that we've designed that we'll be delivering uh, not only has adequate uh, volumetric storage for the one in a hundred year storm event, which is a you know quite an intense rainfall, but also an additional forty percent storage requirement to cover future climate change. Now, none of those requirements uh, features as part of the previous development, and obviously aren't in place currently. What you have at the moment is part of the site or three quarters of the site which has been demolished. And the only thing that is actually on site, which is still um, you know, removing small degrees of water, is the service trenches, uh, which are then served by that sump pump. Now, we're keeping all of that sump pump and those trenches on that final third of the development in place, whilst the NHS facility is still there, because it's important that that is still there, because it drains their service trenches. That sump pump isn't part of um, a site-wide surface water drainage strategy for us, and it wasn't part of um, a surface water control system for the NHS. All it is there doing is draining two metre deep trenches, which are full of gas, gas pipes, pipe, electric cables, uh, uh, water pipes and the like, and are two metres deep so that um, the operatives could walk through those tunnels and carry out maintenance repairs on that infrastructure without Thank having you, Mr. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Gate. I think we've, that's probably enough for the moment for the time being. Um, I've actually just been reminded, of course, Mr. Gatehouse is the drainage applicant, uh, drainage engineer for the applicant, not our drainage engineer. So right. I think it would be more appropriate if we could hear from the, the council's drainage engineer, please, or please, Mr. Harry Pickford. Okay. Mr. Thanks, Mr. Thanks, Pickford, thanks. are you online? I am, yes. Can you see and hear me okay? Yes, I can see and hear you, please. So sorry for rehashing everything, but um, if you could sort of give us the council's view on the, the question around the attenuation basin, please. I think that'd be more appropriate than hearing from the applicant. Thank you. Yeah, and no worries. Chairman, could I clarify that the attenuation, I think it was useful to go back through that again, but the attenuation basin I'm concerned about is the one right on the east of the property next to um, uh, Roberts Way and Thomas Road. I, I take the point about these, um, but it's the one right at the east of the... Yes, exactly, that one I'm concerned about. And that there are... Um, sorry, to clarify. I know the site. I used to work at Capitol Park, and I have walked across this site when it was occupied by the NHS frequently. I know the number of buildings that were there, and the likely change that is going to cause in recharging to the groundwater when all of these houses are built out. So I can understand the relative development of the site as it were uh, currently and then. So I, I just want an explanation of how this system is going to cope with the intensi intensification of development on the site compared to what it is now because a lot of the site Currently, although, yes, it did have buildings on it and it did have parking on it, there was actually also large expanses of green space. So I, I want to understand the difference. Thank you. Yeah, Harry, so uh, I, I think it's important to point out that the uh, applicant has provided quite a lot of hydraulic modelling 
um, but it's kind of used to size up these systems and it's kind of been demonstrated that <coughs> they've they've designed these systems to accommodate the 100 year plus 40 percent climate change storms so they are providing uh, sort of ample capacity within these basins to hold what is what is quite an intense storm and obviously being 100 year it's the lifetime of the development it, we can't ask that there is additional capacity provided within the system um in terms of sort of water intensity i guess one way to look at it is is that the water that's falling on the site is infiltrating as it is um yes they are sort of providing basins to sort of accommodate and hold hold the water whilst it infiltrates um but there will be no increased volume of uh, infiltration across the site as as it is continuing to infiltrate. So there'll be no increased sort of levels of rainfall expected, um, if, if that if that makes sense. Sorry, um, members, I'm sure will remember that in the last five years, we have had quite close to one in 100 year events several times. Uh, and I'm just really concerned that, yes, I'm not suggesting that, um, well, actually, yes, I am suggesting that there might be an increase in rainfall, not in totality, but in intensity. And the, we know, don't we, that this happens often during the summer when the ground is hard and is not receptive to water. Um, and when we have heavy, sudden, intense rainstorms in the summer, that's when we're at risk. Uh, we did have the event in December 20, uh, 2020, which was when the ground was already sodden. And I just would really appreciate your view on whether you think this is modelled to cope with these intense summer rainstorms. And I, I do want somebody to think about the people at Roberts Way and Thomas Road, because what happens to the water in that very eastern infiltration pond if it overtops? Does it go into, Tom, it, does it go into those two roads or does it get pumped somewhere else? Or what happens to it? You know, if there's not enough, if there's not enough capacity to cope with the water that will naturally drain into that lowest pond, where does it go? Harry? Yeah, so to address the summer winter uh, kind of differences, the, the modeling does kind of, they, they look at the summer and winter storm scenarios and that kind of plays into uh, so what, what the, the ground conditions are and runoff coefficients for, for the ground. So it does accommodate that sort of difference in, in the rainfall events. Um, in terms of addressing the increased rainfall that is expected, you know, we, we have, it, it's kind of a set parameter within the modelling net uh, sort of systems and the 40% the climate change is, is designed as that contingency to accommodate that increased rainfall over the, over the kind of course of, of the next uh, 100 years. So that's kind of how the, the, the modelling is kind of carried out and, you know, they, they've designed these, these attenuation basins to accommodate that maximum uh, volume expected from the impermeable area of the site. So I guess in, in that sense that the, the, the modelling that we can ask for, they are expecting that basin not to overtop with the, the rates that would be measured for the infiltration. Okay, thank you for that clarification. Um, four more speakers, members, councillors Wilson, Roberts, Khan and Richard Williams. So Councillor Wilson, please. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, what, one of my questions has been thoroughly answered by Councillor Bradman's questions. I was wondering about the 100-year events. <laughs> I haven't been living in a village where the 100-year event happened a couple of times over the last year. Um, my, my other question is, uh, relates to a point raised by Councillor Daunton uh, about people living in flats with no balconies and how they dry their washing. Having been involved in a, a number of um, case work, um, cases where um, people have black mould in the, their homes, and I'm wondering what, what the provision will be in those uh, apartments if people don't have tumble dryers for, for drying washing, that this is a perennial problem. And, um, and I know that quite often it's trying to dry washing in a, in a closed space with no um, outside um, facility. Um, 
what, what provision there will be. Also, I would like some sort of um, explanation about what the amenity space is for those apartments that don't have um, outside balconies or gardens. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I think I've just been reminded that specifically conditions around tumble drying, etc., aren't material, so we can't base our decision on that. But you know, if we can have a comment from the, the case officer, hopefully, on drying arrangements for the apartments that are not on ground floor. Dean? Yep. Oh, can you hear me? Yep. Um, so each of the apartment blocks, um, no balconies were um, have been provided. This was a a design approach which um, urban design officer discussed with the developer during pre-application stage. Um, uh, uh, Travine might be able to to explain that in more detail, but I think it was it was because um, balconies weren't considered to be a, a, a feature found a prevalent feature within Fallbourne. Um, despite that, um, each of the um, apartment blocks um, have outside amenity areas provided. Um, which are in accordance with the um, standards set out in the SPD. Um, so in terms of outdoor space um, for each of the apartment blocks, there is a, a sufficient provision of outdoor amenity space provided. Um, Javine, did you want to add anything regarding balconies at all? You're on mute, Javine. Thank you. Um, I just wanted to make the point uh, that where flats uh, have been located in the development is around uh, areas where there is lots of uh, wider amenity provision, be it uh, amenity directly related to the apartment, uh, as well as you know large amounts of open space um, uh, as as walkways or through routes. Uh, and so there was ample of space and relief for people within the blocks to kind of move out. And so that was the rationale for not, not providing balconies. Did you want to come back, Councillor? Is that clear? I, I'm just wondering whether that public amenity space is a suitable place for people to hang out washing. Yeah, I suppose not. Good, good question. Are you popping back? Yeah, yeah. O o obviously not, uh, is the answer. And so, you know, the drying, you know, will have to be accommodated within the apartment block in itself. Um, and, you know, that's down to the space uh, standards of blocks, uh, you know, that has been set out nationally. I accept that as the answer, but I'm... I'm not particularly happy that that's a solution for the people living in those uh, in that accommodation. I know that especially if there are families with small children in those flats, then that that's uh, going to be a difficult problem for them. But um, I accept that that's the answer. Thank you. I believe we have uh, an interjection from Mr. Reed. Um, Mr. Gatehouse, can I request that you do not put any comments on chat? That is not the purpose of chat, and it is completely out of order. Thanks. And on a practical scale, the majority of us aren't going to read it. <laughs> so, <laughs> um, moving on, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much, Chairman. Uh, the, um, the talk of the uh, washing um, brings me back because I'm so damned old now that I remember my grandmother's um, and their back-to-back -back houses with their back lane at the back of them with everybody with the washing out down the back lane and the kids still racing around and playing all sorts of games and my mother's uh, two up two down council house uh, had a, uh, a line in the a kitchen a, a wooden uh, line which had the thing that you pulled so um, you know I think washing's always been a bit of a problem but we women usually get over it some way or other um, However, in the main, I think that uh, the time that this has taken has been well spent. And I think we are so often in this committee, how applications come to us this sort of size, and we say, well, it's okay, but it's got a long way to go. And I think in this case, we haven't got that um, argument to use. 
uh, I think it's commendable that everybody seems to have um, put their heads into this and tried to work hard, obviously including our own officers, but you know, the developers, the parish council, all these different groups. And that, that is a refreshing change, isn't it? That people have worked so well together. Um, I'm, I'm quite happy with the design. Um, I think our officers' explanation of, of you know, modernity and character is right. And I think in general, um, I think it will look nice. I think there's some nice designs there. It certainly isn't a development where they've just literally taken that thing off the, the top row um, and work to that. So they really have put some effort in. So um, I think it's a good one. Um, ifs and bits and bats, you know, the, um, but it appears that the refuse has been sorted out to our department's uh, uh, hope and, and that they're quite happy with it. So I think it's, it's a good scheme. Um, and uh, let's watch, as Councillor Tim Hawkins said, I think, you know, we'll all look forward to seeing it in the future. Great, thank you. Councillor Graham, you ought to come back. Is this on a specific point? We do have other speakers. Yes, sorry. Yeah, um, I just wanted to pick up the point that local member Councillor Williams made, um, Councillor John Williams, which was he recommended a, a condition or that we made sure that, the, given the, our concerns about the drainage, that, that some but that the applicant was asked to review after the completion of phase one and before the start of phase two, whether the drainage was actually working as was intended. And also that the ownership of pumps be secured so that they continue to be maintained, especially the one by the Steiner School. So can I ask that we, we if you, I'm not sure where the decision will go, but can I ask that we put that in to our, any approval, if, if we do approve this, that we put in that condition? Yeah, I, I did actually ask that as we we're going through the uh, debate, and I believe we can't condition a review of the drainage after phase one, but we can include it as an informative. Yeah, sure. um, on the second point, I'm, I haven't had any advice on that yet, so I don't know if officers can assist on that front. And again, we can uh, include an informative but regarding the ownership. Sorry, and the other one was um, we need to secure the maintenance, sorry, the... Um, ongoing management plan and that that management association recognizes in words of one syllable its responsibility towards the drainage infrastructure for the site and that that should then be maintained in perpetuity either by the management company itself or um, by delegation to um, you know numbers of house users or whatever how they're going to do it but we do need to maintain the ongoing responsibility for maintenance of drainage infrastructure. Okay. Um, I don't know if, Dean, if you can comment on that. I don't know if this is already included in either a condition in the reserve matters or in the outline. Yeah, thanks, Chair. Um, condition 19 um, secures the management and maintenance of the drainage strategy approved. So that will be covered under condition 19 of the outline permission. Um, and those details will be submitted prior to um, occupation, I believe. Okay. So... The reason I'm battling on about this is because sometimes when the, the developer has a, an, an, um, an understanding of their responsibility, but sometimes that responsibility is not explicitly explained to the management company. And I would just like to make sure that we're absolutely sure that the management company knows that they're responsible for that. Thank you. Yeah, Dean, can you just clarify? Yeah, yeah, those, yeah, yeah, there'll be sufficient um, details submitted, and um, all parties involved will be um, agreed on on the on the um, management and maintenance of the of the strategy. Thank you. And uh, going back to the issue of the informatives, obviously, when we finish the debate, I'll obviously ask the committee if they wish to include that before we make go to the recommendation. Moving on, then we have Councillor Khan, who's joining us online. Councillor Khan. Yeah, so simply, I, mean, it's the, I come back to the drainage, that's the one issue that affects everybody and concerns me. Um, the two points which I still am not totally clear of, and I would like to have some clarity on, is, is the comment that the uh, level of the pipes leading into the uh, attenuation ponds uh, was actually below the level of the ponds, uh, which would mean it would be very difficult to see how they would uh, effectively evacuate. Now, maybe that's 
a, a, a misunderstanding. Maybe that's not uh, not accurate, or there's a mis uh, um, a, a typo somewhere. But uh, I wonder if you could explain, confirm to me that they would actually uh, evacuate in. And the second issue that I'm concerned about is the raising of the land around the actual, uh, well, uh, generally in the lower areas. Um, you're talking about, uh, I wanted to have a bit more information about what the actual ground conditions are. Is it, uh, um, are these gravels which then uh, discharge underneath to, to, pour, um, to permeable uh, chalk, or is it clay lying there, um, impermeable? Uh, and will the raised land be, uh, be, be uh, impermeable or permeable? Uh, if you're leaving it as, in, uh, as, as uh, uh, porous land, uh, you may find that you're just passing the, uh, raising the, put it, sending the stuff straight to the ground uh, water and maybe uh, causing problems in the lowest parts of the site. Um, I, I would like a bit of clarity on that. I mean, if it's impermeable, will, will then the uh, water, uh, the surface water on the surface from the land uh, go straight into the uh, in, um, attenuation ponds? Um, I, I, I have to obviously accept the uh, uh, comments of the, um, uh, the drainage officer that they think it will work, but I'd like some explanation exactly how that would work. Okay. I'm not sure who wants to tackle that, Dean or perhaps Harry. I'll let Harry answer that one, if that's all right. Uh, yeah, so in terms of the levels of the pipes, you know, it's, they, they will drain positively into the, the basins. They, the sort of system is designed to do so. Um, you know, it, I guess wouldn't make sense to have <laughs> to have a basin which is shallower than the, the pipes that are taking it um taking the water into it so so that that is it, it it will drain by gravity into the the basins and i think the 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 thing that shows that is obviously you've got quite a few basins across the site and the reason for that is because there's there's kind of limited falls so you know, it's, it's been split up into quite a few sub catchments um to assist with with allowing that to drain by gravity um in terms of ground conditions I, i'm not sure whether whether mark Gatehouse has kind of the direct information. I'm not sure what the ground conditions are off the top of my head um, existing. I mean, it's obviously going to be permeable because they've done infiltration testing, um, which confirms the, the permeability of the ground. Um, I'm not sure, but, but I'm, as I say, I'm not sure what the, the ground conditions existing are off the top of my head, and I'm not sure what, what will be going in. Um, Okay, well, if, um, if, if either, if you can't, I don't know if Dean, you can confirm that. I'd rather an officer responded rather than the applicant. Yeah, well, I can confirm that the, the underground um, rock, which um, Council Council is referring to, is chalk. So it is a permeable rock which allow water to, to infiltrate and percolate away from the site um, underneath. Um, so, so that that's a you know it's a, it's a permeable rock which would which allow um, water to run run through. So, um, I believe that was the main point of the question. Um, so that that would work in in that instance. Thank you. No, I was also wanting to know whether the the uh, raised ground would be uh, impermeable or permeable, and how that would affect it. I, I'm not sure, Dean. You might be able to correct me. I'm not sure whether you've actually been provided with that. What what the sort of made up ground would be at this point. I mean, obviously, with it being an infiltration design, it would be expected that will be a permeable, permeable layer. I'm not sure whether whether this might be a better one for Mark. If if it's okay, if he is able to answer. Is that okay, Chair, to ask Mark to? I, I, uh, I if you can answer very, very succinctly, yes. Mark, if you could jump in, please. Hi there, Chair. Firstly, apologies for my, my comments in the chat. I thought that was that's helpful, so um, I apologize for that. I'll uh, I'll move on. Um, yes, yeah, so very quickly, part of our intention is to, to recycle material on site. We don't want to be taking material away from the site. Um, the existing ground level, the existing ground conditions are permeable, so you've got obviously chalk material there. Um, in in the sort of larger open space areas we'll be utilizing that material um and you know that's that be utilized so natural materials being used to raise ground levels where we need to raise ground levels where the ponds are uh, in rear gardens obviously we'll be um, raising ground levels we need to put a an impermeable capping layer in there above the, the made ground where there's made ground areas 
where there's natural ground, the Oxford natural ground that's been ported. So there is a bit of a mixed bag. Um, what you won't have is creating a scenario where you've got large impervious areas of clay material creating surface water runoff. Um, I think that was one of the councillor's concerns. I don't know if that answers your questions. Okay. I, well, for me, it does. Councillor Carney, is that satisfactory? Yes, yes fine. That's, that was what I wanted to find out. Thank you very much, all three of you. Okay, final speaker, we have Councillor Richard Williams, please. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Chair. I'll keep it very brief. Um, and just to say, I think this has been a really good debate. I think the officer's uh, paper was put together really well. The, the presentation's been mm -hmm. um, excellent. Um, I, I did have a number of questions that um, other members have raised. I, I, they've all been um, answered uh, to my satisfaction. And again, I would, I would commend the officers who I think have dealt, dealt with all the questions extremely, um, extremely well, and certainly to my satisfaction. So um, I've not heard any reasons um, to uh, not accept the officer's recommendations. Um, and uh, I will plan to do so when we come to the vote. Thank you very much. Or well, members, those are all the... Another interjection from Mr. Reid, please. Um, sorry, Chair. Um, I, I've just looked at the 106 agreement under the outline scheme. And at this stage, I cannot see the fallback provision that in the event that the management company failed to deal with ongoing maintenance and management of uh, the, um, what I'll call the pond areas, that in fact the, um, th there is a fallback whereby the liability would pass to the individual residents as we've seen on a number of key developments. So if members are, um, minded to approve uh, this application, I would recommend, Chair, that it's subject to delegated authority for me to verify whether, in fact, the 106 agreement should be amended to cover the fallback position. We've seen the importance of this, for example, in relation to the, uh, develop the other development uh, in Fullbourne where the uh, um, developer refused to provide certainty as to long-term maintenance of those key areas. And although the uh, appellant won every ground of the appeal, the um, inspector dismissed the appeal because of the uncertainty as to long-term management. So I would ask for delegated authority to verify that my reading of the 106 um, needs to be improved to deal with that. Chair, that, that's... One second, please. Yeah. I okay. thought the responsibility... Uh, Councillor Bradnam, please. Sorry, yeah, comment that's really that. helpful from uh, Mr Reid, but I, it's just coming back into my brain. Didn't it say, didn't um, the applicant say that the responsibility for the attenuation ponds would fall to Anglian Water at some point in, you know, I'm sure somewhere I wrote down the responsibility will fall to Anglian Water. And I thought, oh, good, because actually what they've done is recognise that it's complicated and it needs to be managed. I'm, I'm not, maybe these two things can go alongside each other. I'm not um, disagreeing with Mr. Reid, um, but I did think that at some point the applicant said that it should fall to Anglian Water, and I now can't find it in my notes, so I apologise. Okay, Mr Reid, do you want to clarify? Uh, um, Chair, I would um, still ask for delegated authority, because even if those ponds were to go to Anglian Water, there is sufficient open space where we need the certainty of ensuring that if the management... if if the parish council didn't take a transfer of those open space areas and it went across to management company, that um, if the management company was not to look after those areas or was to be folded because the residents didn't want to pay their management charge, that in fact the liability would pass to the, to the, to the residents because that would uh, be the, in effect the guarantee to ensure that those areas of open space, irrespective of the ponds, were properly looked after. The areas are 
of such significance on this development that that, to me, is a key consideration. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Williams, you had a comment also. Um, I was just going to say in, in a bit to try and move us along that um, perhaps we just change the recommendation to say subject to investigations into the 106, but make it clear that if officers find that they've covered it or they're able to, you know, we give them authority to negotiate it and sort, sort that bit out, that it doesn't have to come back to us, Chair. Obviously, if everyone goes to war with each other and they don't sort it out, then it'll have to come back. Yep, yeah, absolutely. Okay, members, so we've had that, um, that recommendation from the legal officer to include that condition. Uh, members, are we content to include that? Yes, yes? good. Um, and we also had a request earlier in the meeting to include an informative on um, the applicant to review the drainage scheme after phase one is complete before they begin phase two. Again, is everyone content that we include that informative? Great. Um, okay, well, we come to the recommendation then, which is on page 86. Mm -hmm. Which is uh, to recommend approval subject to the condition we've just, uh, we've just agreed upon where we delegate the legal officer to investigate the Section 106 responsibilities. Um, Members, I haven't heard anyone say they were planning on voting against, so can I take this recommendation as amended by affirmation? Agreed. Agreed. Does anyone wish to vote against? Abstain? No. So that application is approved. Thank you very much. Um, members, we're getting dangerously close to lunch. How does everyone feel about taking a lunch break now and coming back after lunch? Okay, so if I give us 40 minutes, we can come back. Uh, everyone in their chairs ready to start again at 1 p.m. Okay.
Thank you very much and welcome back everyone in the room and online to this meeting of South Cam's District Council's Planning Committee. We on the agenda are now up to item 7 which is an application land northwest of 7 Primrose Walk, Little Branson. It's an outline application for the erection of a single self-build dwelling. Um, the, app, the reason it's before us today is because the District Council are the applicant, so it's re for reasons of transparency. Um, and also because we have an objection to it from the local parish council. Uh, the presenting officer is Mary Collins, who I'm hoping is online and is able to join us. Do we have you, Mary? Is she online, Erin? Uh, she's listed in the, um, in the participants, but... Uh... Mary, are you with us? Bear with me, Chair, and I'll try and get hold of her for you. Thanks. She's not signed in, so I don't know. Uh, actually, she just dropped out, Chair, so you Yes. Okay, we'll give Mary a minute to try and rejoin. If not, we may have to come back to this item, I'm afraid, members, if we don't have the presenting officer. If everyone online could bear with, we're just trying to get hold of the case officer for this application. Uh, apologies, everyone. Mary is having some difficulties with connection, but she should be with us imminently. Thank you, Lawrence. Yes, I'm I'm here now. Sorry about that. Um, Mary, so welcome back. <laughs> no, it went wrong. No okay. problem. That's fine. It happens to all of us. Um, <laughs> Mary, we've just introduced the item, and we're hoping you'd be able to let us know of any updates, and then introduce the item, please, if you could. Um, the only updates was, uh, I believe, the councillors have been sent the um, what Little Grandston Parish Council are going to present to you later on, sort of in a written form. Uh, I don't think we've been uh, So this is on my end. Um, the document we've received is back up in case Little Grandston Parish Council can't send a representative. I'm hoping they will be with us, but if not, I shall provide that document to you. I okay, should so be Lawrence. Brilliant. Thank you very much for okay. letting us know. Great. Thank, thank you, Mary. Right. OK, I'll just um, share my screen and then we can start. Um, can everyone see that? We can, yes. Yeah. yeah. OK. Right. OK. Um, I'll start in that case. Um, uh, the proposed development site lies within the development framework on the southern western side of Primrose Walk um, to the northwest and immediately adjacent to an existing joint number seven Primrose Walk. Um, The, um, as I say, it, it lies within the development framework. So here you can see where the framework ends and where the actual site is just in, in here. Um, so Primrose Walk is off of Primrose um, Hill and is characterised by bungalows and two-storey houses. Um, there is built development opposite the application site which currently extends marginally further along this side of the road. Um, the site would also extend up to the village limits on the southern western side and would result in built development on either side of the road up to the edge of the village. So I may need to just go back. So yeah, so it would be in filling this gap right to the, the edge of the village there. Um, the piece of land um, is currently grassland and um, 
with sh shrub and trees to the perimeter. Vehicular access um, would be from from the existing hardcore track, which leads um, to um, you know serves the existing dwellings, and this. Um, this um, road is within the ownership of South Cambridgeshire District Council. Um, there is a public footpath, um, number two, which also forms part of the, goes alongside this um, access road um, along the stretch, and then it goes out towards um, Great Gransden. I think it's Great Gransden. The application um, seeks outline permission for the erection of a all right, sorry, this is just another picture just showing the access track and the, the application site. So the, um, the applica applicant seeks outline permission for the erection of a single storey self-build, single self-build dwelling with all matters reserved. Um, South Cambridgeshire District Council is a right to build vanguard authority James to support people to design and build their own homes at potentially a lower cost than buying an existing property. Um, so that's um, part of the, the application. Um, so this is where it would be located. This is just indicative only because, as I say, it's an outline application. We haven't got any other details at the moment. It's just the principle we will be looking at. Um, this indicates a potential scale for the, the property. Um, so, um, as I mentioned, layout is a reserved matter. However, the siting of the proposed dwelling is indicatively shown and indicates that there is sufficient room on the application site for the siting of a dwelling and garage. The height of the proposed dwelling is not known at this outline stage. Therefore, a similar height dwelling is considered appropriate. This will be subject to the reserve matters application. Um, in this particular stretch of street, um, there is um, a mixture of um, styles um, in the surrounding neighbouring properties. There's no single architectural style. And um, as I say, we haven't got a specific um, design for the app for the dwelling at the moment. Um, given the, the location of the dwelling, we, we don't consider it would have a significant adverse impact on the character of the landscape. Um, but this would, would again be um, an assessment for the reserve matters stage. Um, the proposed dwelling. So I just go back to some of these other drawings. Um, One sec, Mary. I think we've got a request from Councillor Roberts to go back to a previous slide. Oh, okay. Oh. Wait, Councillor Roberts, you must switch your mic on. Then. Sorry, Chairman. Yeah, sorry, Mary. There's a photograph that we keep seeing very briefly, uh, but it's of the road. Um, I think it's before this one, the one before this one. That one, please, yes. Because there's obviously, can we go back again? It keeps running. Um, there's comments about, um, from the parish council, about the, um, the accessibility. Can we go back again? Just, just one previous, please, Mary. View of Primrose Walk. No, no, no. yeah. And then... Keep, keep, keep going. And then the one after. All right. No, no, the one after. No, not that one. Oh, that stop, one. Stop. That one. Stop. <laughs> <laughs> Photograph one back, please. That stop. That one. There we go. Yeah, that's. Yes. Cool. Yeah. So this photograph is showing um, the existing access, which serves the dwellings already there, and this here is the the, apl the application site. Okay. Uh, so in, yeah, in terms of its siting, it would be alongside number seven Primrose Walk, which is here, which is a bungalow. Um, the indicative position shows it inset from the boundary with this property. 
and it would be approximately the same depth as this adjacent bungalow and aligned in a similar fashion. So given this orientation, um, we're satisfied that the direction of this dwelling would, wouldn't be detrimental to the amenities of this adjacent occupier by way of overbearing, overshadowing or loss of light. Um, the main issues raised by the Parish Council is flood risk and drainage. Um, there is concern that the development could exacerbate existing drainage issues in the village, particularly as Primrose Hill and Primrose Walk are on higher ground to where the regular flooding occurs. The Parish Council are concerned that runoff water from these more recent development areas um, would end up flowing down to the village's old areas at lower levels. Um, uh, Little Grandstone, though, is the site is situated on the green sand formation, and our drainage officers are satisfied uh, that they can make an assumption that the infiltration coefficient would be good enough to permit infiltration subject to BRE 365 testing. And detailed design of the drainage can be um, obtained by way of condition, and uh, we have um, recommended a condition is attached. Um, so, yes, the principle of sustain sustainable drainage is considered acceptable in this location. Um, subject to compliance with the proposed drainage conditions, it would be in accordance with policy. Um, the proposed condition is a pre-commencement condition, which would need to be satisfied prior to any work on the development commencing. So this would ensure that the site is drained without causing flooding or other drainage issues inside or outside of the application site. Um, and so because of this condition, um, any issues of water management flood risk would be addressed to the satisfaction of the drainage team before this condition could be um, discharged. Um, then, if acceptable, the drainage scheme must be implemented in accordance with the approved details. So, subject to that condition, officers um, consider that um, the application um, meets our local planning policy and um, we're recommending that planning permission is granted subject to conditions. So that's my presentation. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, Mary. Appreciate um, appreciate the detail and you indulging us flicking through the presentation. Um, if you could uh, yes, yeah, stay on the line, because I'm sure there will be some questions of clarity for yourself uh, during the debate. But we're going to move to the public speakers now. And I believe we have two, um, two speakers representing the applicants, Clara Cabello and Darren Heffer. Are either of you there? Mary, could you stop sharing, please? Thank you. Uh, yes, um, <clears throat> Darren Heffer speaking. I hope that you can see me. Yeah, we can. We can also see the clerk of the PC, if you could switch off. Thank you very much. Uh, so we have Clara and Darren. Welcome both. Um, yeah, I so said you're speaking on behalf of the applicant today. So I understand you're going to be sharing the three minute time slot. Uh, I'm not That's sure correct. who will be kicking off, but um, I'm sure you know the procedure by now. Three minutes to address the committee. Then if you could hold on at the end for any questions of clarity around your comments, please. So That's whenever absolutely. you're ready. That's fine. Thank you very much, uh, Chair. I'll be speaking first. Uh, Darren Heffer. I'm a director of Saunders Boston Architects based in Cambridge. Um, and uh, we are the agent acting on behalf of South Cam's District Council, who are obviously the applicant for this site. Um, this is one of a series of sites um, that's been identified uh, that are owned by uh, South Cam's um, to be potentially developed as part of their self and custom build scheme. Um, and I don't need to remind you um, of the local authority's statutory obligation to maintain a self and custom build uh, register. This particular project um, has been through a formal pre-app process and uh, has been significantly redesigned. Um, we are establishing at this stage, um, as has been presented, as purely uh, this is an outline application with all matters reserved for a single dwelling, um, which we're showing at the moment at one and a half um, storeys. 
Um, there is an identified need um, within Little Gransden um, for such a self-build property. Um, the development is outside of the conservation area. It's within the development framework. Um, there was a question which was raised there by the presenting officer um, reference um, to the, the, the road. Just to clarify um, the point there, this is uh, access to this particular plot um, is from an uh, unadopted road, uh, which serves a total of 12 properties and it is owned, managed and maintained by South Cam's uh, District Council. Um, it's worth noting as well that uh, the Highways Authority at CCC um, has stated uh, that they have um, no, this would have no adverse effect um, on the current traffic flow. Um, that's all I wanted to say really, other than I'm here if there are any questions for clarification and I would just urge the committee, um, if they're so minded, please to support this application to assist South County District Council um, in fulfilling uh, or helping to fulfill their obligation to maintain a custom and self-build register. I'll just hand you over now very briefly to my colleague who will purely just introduce herself um, in case again any questions are asked. Thank you for your time. Hi, I'm Clara Cabello. I also work at Sanders Western Architects and um, Architectural Technologies in case you have any questions. Thank you. Okay, thank you, thank you both of you for for the um, for the update and the introductions. I'm now going to ask if any committee members have any questions of clarification for either of the agents, starting with Councillor Heather Williams, then Richard. Thank you. Um, I'd just like and thank you for um, your comments, but I'd just like to check. My understanding is that we have a statutory responsibility to hold a register. We don't actually have a statutory responsibility to make plots available. Could you confirm if that's my understanding of that is correct, please? Is that a question for the agents? That might be a question for the case officer, possibly. Um, yeah, yes, Chair. Um, I, I mean, I, I believe we haven't got any specific policies that relate to self-build or custom build, um, but we are a vanguard um, authority and um, as, as such, we should be, a, we should be providing this register, um, but we should also be um, identifying in places where self-build could, um, could happen. I don't think we have a specific policy. I think that's correct. Sure, could you clarify, please? Thank you, Chair. So the agent, oh, to clarify, I'm asking the agent this question because they have referred to the statutory responsibilities in their comments. Um, and whether we should or shouldn't be doing something or whether there's policy or not is not my question here. He, he referred to statutory responsibilities I'm asking if he's referring to a statutory responsibility to hold and maintain a register or a responsibility to make available plots. I'm trying to clarify what was said because he said this would honour our obligation for statutory responsibilities, but I'm pretty sure he said list of which there is therefore is not a statutory responsibility. Okay. Thank um, you, Chair. Yeah, Darren or Clara, I'm not sure if you can clarify that for us. I'm afraid, um, no, I can't clarify that. Um, I know that there is an obligation to maintain um, a list, whether there is an obligation for the authority to actually uh, provide sites um, is, is something that I, I'm afraid I, I, I can't respond to. I know that uh, we've been involved in other applications, similar applications to this, which have gone through the committee, um, but I, I, I can't categorically state whether you, you have a, um, a responsibility to actually bring forward and provide the actual sites. Thank okay. you, Chair. I now understand what the okay. agent has said, which is all I was seeking to achieve. Yes, OK. And Councillor Richard Williams, please, question of clarification. Uh, yeah, <clears throat> sorry, Chair. I think my question might be actually better for the, um, for the planning officer. It was about the ownership of the, of the track. But I think that might actually be better directed at the planning officer. Yeah, I think so. Shall we um, shelve it on for the debate? Yeah, sure. Uh, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, the access road 
also acts as a public right of way, but you omitted to mention that. How does that work, both public rights of way and access road? So either one of the uh, agents want to answer? Yeah, yes, I can answer. Yes, absolutely. Um, as uh, was suggested in the presentation by uh, the officer, um, public right of way of Little Grandson footpath two does follow the same route as this unadopted road. Um, there is no segregation um, of a footway as from the road, as you will have seen from the uh, from the photographs. Um, so there's no delineation of a separate footpath um, and the the road. Um, I would just refer again um, to uh, the fact that the local highways authority um, has stated that granting of consent would have no adverse impact um, upon this. We're proposing a single a single dwelling here. Um, the unadopted road already serves 12 properties. We're proposing just one further property at the end. Uh, so there would be very, very limited uh, traffic traffic movements. OK, thank you very much for that response. Um, members, I think those are all the questions of clarification for the agents. So we say thank you to both Darren and Clara for, um, for their time this morning. And we'll be moving on to the next public speaker, which is the clerk for Little Gransden Parish Council. Do we have uh, Ms Sylvia Sullivan on the line? Yes, Chair, I am here. Thank you. Good, thank you. We can see and hear you perfectly so uh, if you've heard me before the uh, rules are three minutes to address the committee and then if you wouldn't mind holding on at the end in case there's any questions or clarity around the comments you've made thank you very much chair um i am sylvia sullivan and i am clerk to little Gransden parish council i have been asked by little Gransden parish council to represent the parish council's views on this application the Parish Council first considered this application on 4 February in 2021 and took note of residents' concerns. The Parish Council's main concern was that Primrose Walk has the status of a public footpath. It is a well-used path that provides an essential link to Great Gransden for residents walking the, to the shop taking their children to the pr a local primary school and going to church services, as well as linking to the network of paths used for recreational exercise. Historically, Primrose Walk was the site of Ministry of Defence accommodation huts for military personnel serving at Gransden Lodge Airfield during World War II. After the war, the Ministry of Defence relinquished any upkeep of the huts, which were taken over by the District Council for rented accommodation. The huts were eventually demolished and replaced by semi-detached houses. There are now 14 dwellings. These were built by or are now the responsibility of the District Council as tenanted dwellings. Some are now in private ownership. The Parish Council is concerned that the access to the proposed development site is via the public footpath, a track that has not been maintained and is not of a sufficient standard to withstand modern uh, day traffic requirements through regular comings and goings, not only of residence vehicles, but also delivery vehicles and utility vehicles such as waste disposal lorries. Although the District Council did provide additional car parking space several years ago near the junction with Primrose Hill um, for these provide for single story dwellings, they, they do not have that do not have their own driveways. Primrose Walk, however, is not maintained to a standard sufficient for existing dwellings. It was for this reason that the Parish Council response was that if the planning office were minded to approve the application, Little Gransden Parish Council strongly urged that a condition of any approval should be that either the vendor or the purchaser of the land should make up Primrose Walk to public highway standards and that the County Council should adopt Primrose Walk to the extent of the dwellings. 
At their meeting on 2 September 2021, Little Granston Parish Council noted Mr Stephen Kelly's letter of 19 August 2021 and had no wish to make any further comment, but could not support this application. Thank you so much for listening and paying attention to us. Uh, we much appreciate it. Thank you, Mr Chair. Thank you very much uh, for addressing the committee. If you wouldn't mind holding on the line for a few minutes in case there are any questions of clarification for yourself. Um, we do have a few, starting with Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. I'm, I'm just looking at, um, on Google Maps, the, the entrance. From, from what I'm looking here, it looks as if the area where you've got the two, you've got properties either side of the road looks a bit wider, but that could just be the imagery. To your knowledge, is it the same width for Primrose Walk for the entire section, or does it narrow towards the end, please? I can always ask the local member if she's speaking, if that's easier. I think that's a question. That's a question for yourself, Miss Sullivan, I believe, if you can the, answer it. The um, current access track along the track put in by the Ministry of, Deven of Defence is approximately the same width throughout. At the end of the dwellings, the semi-detached houses at the end, the, uh, it re reverts to what would normally be uh, regarded as a footpath width of approximately two to three metres. OK, thank you for that clarification. Um, we have a question from Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Um, Sylvia, can you tell the committee or explain what the issues are with the condition of the um, access road and um, any attempts the PC has made in the past to get it sorted? Um, thank you. Um, the Parish Council has made uh, applications in the past for the road to be adopted or by the County Council um, and was told that it was not within their um, intention or remit to do so. Um, the Parish Council also asked at one point whether a turning circle could be put at the end, at least to facilitate um, vehicles going in and out and was told that there wasn't sufficient um, uh, requisite area to make that turning circle. And so far as the uh, current condition of the access track, there are several potholes in it. Um, and as a frequent walker, I have to be quite careful to avoid these pot potholes, to avoid turning my ankle in it. Um, I was quite interested to hear that it is the responsibility of the District Council to maintain that path. Thank you for that clarity. Is there anything further, Councillor? No. Thank you very much. And we have a question of clarity from Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, good afternoon. Um, one of the comments that I've been picking up is from um, uh, people who actually live down there who are saying in the paperwork um, that this is the only area of grass in Little Gransden and it's used for community gatherings, children's games, etc. There is nowhere else for children to play uh, that is close to home. Can you just confirm that that is correct? It is the sort of um, play area, community area for the village? Um, Little Granston Parish Council ha is, has no responsibility for any public land. Can, no, I, can, I, can you confirm to me, though, that the area that we're talking about, the, the site area, is the only open space in the village um, that is used by the community for sort of play-type activities? Uh, there is no playground. Yes, that, that answers my thing. There is no proper playground. So this is the one of the, well, the only area that children can actually play on. Um, what, what children do 
um, I'm not I'm not party to. I, I don't know where they where they go, but there's there's no officially uh, there's no official playground as such. That's well, I think that's answered the question, I think. Thank you very much. Um, yeah. I think we have completed our uh, public speakers, so I'd like to thank all the public speakers for their their time and their input today. And following that, members, we are going to now move into the into the debate. Of course, we do again have the opportunity to ask the case officer. Oh, sincere apologies, councillor. <laughs> I've forgotten the local member. Sorry, you weren't on my list. My my apologies. We do have councillor Toomey Hawkins speaking as local member as well. Thank you very much, Chair. Um, the this side, yes, kids do play on it. I was still there on Saturday, uh, Sunday, and on one of the trees on the boundaries, there was a rope. You know how they play with swings on ropes, so there was one still there. Um, and I only just found out um, that South Cam's owns the access road. It is an access road as well as a public rights of way. If the, that picture that you saw that had the narrow, that is the width of that road. Some of the houses, uh, the semi-detached houses, don't actually have anywhere to park which is why South Cam's put up a six car park space right at the top of the road, access road. And yes, it's got potholes in it. It's not been maintained properly. Um, and as you heard, they have had difficulty actually getting anyone to own up to <laughs> um, owning, the, uh, owning the road and maintaining it. So I, have, um, I will request as part of this, if you are minded to approve it, um, to ask that the owner of the road brings it up to standard before giving a right of access over it to that site. Um, I do support the uh, parish council in their objection because um, when I first saw the piece of land, I thought to myself, why aren't we developing this ourselves seeing the size of it? Um, we could put affordable housing on it. It doesn't have to be huge. We've got a pair of semi-detached bungalows uh, right next to it. Something like that could go on there for local people um, is my view, which I have expressed um, to housing. Um, and I think for me, um, this, this, this thing of doing, um, um, getting planning permission and then selling off to self-build, yes and no. In this case, I think no. Um, if you look at paragraph, if I can find it, uh, paragraph 13 on page 100, it does say that our policy for infill villages, which this one is, is to build um, sort of in gaps in the built up frontages of, um, of roads. This one isn't. Um, and as it says, it does not accord with policy S11. However, um, exception is being made because the site is within the framework of the village, which is fine. Um, but in my view, um, I would prefer to see this develop for us rather than to be sold off. And so uh, my view is if you are minded to approve this, I would ask that the site not be put on the market before it goes before cabinet, for cabinet to actually decide whether or not it should be sold or developed for us or a and other um, use. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, members, do you have any questions of clarity for the local members? Several. <laughs> Starting with Councillor Wilson, please, and then Heather Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, I was just wondering whether there's any reason why when this, um, this, um, this like close was developed, why this piece of land wasn't built on. Um, is there a particular reason? Also, I was wondering about play space for, for children. Is there a need for play space for children? And could this be reserved as, as such? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Councillor Hawkey, can you answer that one? I, I can answer that. Um, 
I understand that uh, some years ago, um, before the current clerk was in place, that the parish council at the time actually did try and get this piece of land to be, uh, to rent it or to have it allocated to them for place space for kids, and that seemed to fall, fall away. <laughs> um, so, yeah, the, you know, that's all there, there is for them. Thank you. Uh, yeah, but was the first question reminds us, please, Councillor Wilson? Is why, why this particular plot wasn't developed when the other houses were built on... No. Okay, again, okay, I'm not sure if you can answer that, Councillor. I can't answer that, I'm afraid. No, I think that, okay. that, was just, that was just what was Sorry. built at the time. Okay. Um, the next question of clarification is from Councillor Williams, please. Yes, thank you. And uh, I think we'll, we'll let uh, Councillor Hawkins, Dr. Fulby Hawkins, off the fact that she doesn't know what happened in the 60s. I would definitely be a hypocrite for asking that, given um, I think my parents were just about born. Um, but, uh, but there we are. It was just something you touched on, Councillor Hawkins, in your comments about things coming to Cabinet. Um, and this may be more of a council procedure than a planning, but surely these projects... Uh, are, people are aware they're not just from so this must have gone through some sort of process to or, or is it normal practice for these sort of parcels of land to go through without um sort of member acknowledgement i, I thought it's only because i thought we have to you know it would have to get signed off in a portfolio or something to dispose of an asset in in that way or or look at it because obviously so it just seemed a bit odd. So sorry, I'm trying to clarify that because I was thinking, you're a member of Cabinet. How come it's not come to Cabinet? Or surely someone knows what's going on. Um, I think the process is that the, uh, the lead Cabinet member for housing signs off disposal of assets. Um, and my request is that, that should, on this particular occasion, it should not just be the lead Cabinet member for uh, housing, but that the whole Cabinet actually has a say in this because of this objection. No, no, no. Can we hear from Mr. Blaisby, please? He just wishes to comment on this. Uh, thank you, Chair. Just to um, direct members to the, the planning merits, because I think a, a lot of the a lot of the debate and the discussions, rather, so far, have not been planning issues. So I just uh, focus members' minds on that. Thank you. Thank you, um, members. Do you have any further questions of clarification for Councillor Hawkins as local member? Councillor Daunton, is it for Councillor Hawkins? It's for Councillor yes, Hawkins. Yes, please. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, Councillor Hawkins, in your view, uh, one of the comments here in the papers is that um, this could be the site of two bungalows. In your view, um, would that be appropriate or could that happen, you're knowing the site as well as you do? Yes, I think that would be more appropriate. Thank you, albeit we are deciding on this application in front of us today, not what could be there, it's what is in front of us today, just to clarify that for everyone. Okay, I don't think there's any more questions of clarity for the local members, so thank you, Councillor Hawkins, for your, your comments there. Um, we're going to move into the debate now. We already have quite a lengthy list, starting with Councillor Roberts, please. Well, I remember the 1960s, best times of my life. Sex, drugs and rock and roll. No, I never had the drugs. <laughs> And I saw the Beatles. Um, however, the, what thing, the thing that bothers me about this one is the um, change of character. And I, though our policy may be admirable, I think we've got to balance it against um, people's quality of life who are already living there. Quite clearly, it's a very attractive area, nice open space there for them. And in a village, such as the Grandstons, um, very small with no play area. This is obviously a very valuable asset to the village and to the residents. Um, it's probably somewhere that they can easily see children playing and children don't need, always need formal equipment and things. They can have a jolly good time in an open space just fighting amongst themselves. Um, so I'm concerned, I think it's, it's uh, possibly to me one to refuse, but based on uh, not what we may do by building something different on there, but actually um, protecting that area because it's the one and only seemingly asset in the village that the residents can use. I'm sure that 
you know, and when they have village, little village do's and that, that's probably where they go for their picnics and parties and what have you. Um, so I'm, I'm quite against it on that respect. I, I, I think that there are times that you have to actually, you know, stick to your, you know, stick to your principles about protecting the countryside and um, looking after people, etc. And so I, I shall be voting against it. Thank you very much. Councillor Heather Williams, please, in the debate. Thank you, Thank you Chair. So, um, taking the words from Mr Blaisby, I'll try and my best to stick to planning only issues. Uh, we've all been ticked off there. Um, so, on, on the matters of debate, one thing that I'm looking at at the moment is um, the My Cambridgeshire maps, which shows all of the, you know, all the land that's in ownership of um, the local authority. And this is, with the exception of council housing, this is the only piece of land that we, that we currently have in, in the Everstons. Um, and, I, and I reference that because there is no county council land that I can, I can see on here either, and we've heard that the parish council haven't. Therefore, for myself, it means that actually for informal leisure space, and we do have formalised playgrounds, I know, but there is room for informal green spaces, and that is an amenity that I think should be given significant weight to, given it is the only, only available space um, without being reliant on you know, private in individuals. So I think um, there is a, a detrimental impact on that. Planning is always a balance. So it may be that another benefit, such as affordable housing, may have seen a you know, tilting of the balance where you thought you were gaining something more. But what's currently proposed... I think, and we, this is, I would say about the access, but I noticed that access is one of the matters that would be reserved. Um, from my understanding of this, we're not looking at access on here. Um, I, I think for myself, the balance is the loss of this use for the community and the amenities um, is, uh, is outweighed by any potential benefits. Um, but also, you know, we see lots of these self-built plots I would clarify, we're responsible for having a list. We're not responsible for making it, you know, an opportunity. Just to touch on what the agent was saying about our statutory responsibilities, it's really clear. We need to be really clear. We do not have to make these self-built plots available with our own land, um, because I feel that we sometimes get pinned into a corner and sort of almost told that we need to release this land. We we don't, so we shouldn't, especially in this case. And hopefully we won't be appealed by our own council. <laughs> you never know. No. <laughs> Who um, knows? I think Mr Blaise would like to come in on, on that point as well. Yes, thank you, Chair. So sort of uh, labouring what I said earlier in a way. Um, I think it's important that we focus on the planning merits of this application. So this application is presented to us as a dwelling on a plot of land. Um, and it, it, is, it is not relevant who the applicant is. So you need to consider this as if it were any application um, rather than consider what the council might have preferences for. Um, so, it, so I just, I just um, I advise members to steer clear of looking at this from a sort of council ownership perspective. It's, it's the planning merits of a, of a dwelling. Thank you. Yes, please. So on the basis of what you've just said and, and what I was saying, so I was using planning merits. I take it that we can give weight to the amenity of the green, open green space where it is on a planning consideration, Mr Blasey. Thank you, Chair. Um, on that point, um, this site is not designated as open space, so you have to have regard to that. This is a site of land that's within the village framework where policies for residential development um, uh, are, uh, it, it would comply with policies for, for development for, for residential purposes. Um, I think it's, it's, it would be very difficult to say that this land should be retained for a purpose that it doesn't have, because there's no, ne there's, no there's no necessary prospect of that use coming forward. Um, and, and, and again, it partly comes back to this point about uh, because South Camps own the land, there may be some possibilities for alternative types of development, but that's not an issue for us as a planning committee, that we, we are looking at the merits of this proposal and, and whether it complies with planning policy. I hope that answers the question. Thank you. 
it's not an amenity area at the moment. So it, it, it isn't going to be lost as an open... I mean, if, if you felt that, in terms of the character of the area, that, the, that this site could not be developed, um, that's another matter, because you're looking at this, the importance of this as a, as a green space in terms of its visual amenity. Um, but I would, I would advise against that, because I think that would be a very difficult argument to make, even if that were the argument that you were making. But it is not an amenity area. It may be informally used by children, but it is not. And you heard from the parish council that they'd actually tried to uh, uh, acquire it for that purpose and were, and were unsuccessful. So that isn't what it is at the moment. At the moment, it is just a piece of green space within the village framework where policies for residential development, um, uh, it, where it complies. I think one of the um, material considerations we have is visual amenity and local character. So how much weight we as a committee choose to give to that is obviously up to us. We've had the advice from officers on that, so it's up to us as a committee to decide how much weight we put into that particular material consideration. Um, next speaker having the debate is Councillor Richard Williams, please. Yeah. Okay. Um, ooh, thank you very much, Chair. I'm going to squeak. Um, okay, um, uh, this is not infill, um, so um, I, I, I'm, I'm not satisfied that this accords with our policy um, on infill, um, and uh, I do um, feel that there is a material consideration about access, and I'm not satisfied about the access um, to this road. I note highways didn't object on the basis that it's not a highway outside of the house. So I think we can, we can rule that out um, as, as not really being relevant. Um, they're not saying there's not a problem, they're just saying it's not our responsibility. Um, so um, I would um, object to it on that ground as well. I'm not satisfied there's sufficient access. Um, so yeah, I, I would vote to refuse this for those reasons. Thank you for those comments. Um, uh, Councillor Bradman, next please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I have the pleasure of having walked down this lane a number of times, um, and I'm familiar with the locality and the connection it provides between Great Gransden Church and the parish of Little Gransden, and the points that the clerk of the parish council made. Um, I am minded, I, I, what I'm concerned, well, firstly, can we have some clarification later on if uh, the district council will be minded to make up the road? And I, I say this because I have in my own parishes a road that is unadopted. And in the past, around the 60s, uh, the district council purchased land or had land beside this uh, the lane in my parish built uh, six dwellings on it and have never adopted and the road has never been uh, owned or or indeed either by the parish or or the um, district council or the county council it's a totally unadopted road and it causes enormous problems for just the six dwellings there um, because it, every winter it goes into really severe potholes because there is no drainage in it. So I actually would like, uh, whatever happens about this uh, planning application, I would like the planners to go away and try and establish if this is a district council asset, that it should be built up to the appropriate standard and the district council should take responsibility. And in fact, I notice on the planning um, that actually district council is indeed responsible for the road as well as for the dwellings, the few dwellings on either side and this piece of land. So absolutely the district council ought to be making, the, uh, making sure this road is in good condition. So that's one thing. I also have some views about uh, the wisdom of um, 
using this plot in this way. I'm mindful of what Mr. Blaisby says, but I would very much, um, I would actually agree, I would support what Councillor Toomey Hawkins has said, because I would, I think in this location, I don't like the fact that it's a market house when all the others are, I mean, there are some market houses there, but they were originally district council bungalows. So I would actually, um, sorry, district council bungalows and semi-detached. And so I would actually quite like cabinet to consider what, what purpose they would like this land to be used for. Um, because, because I think probably Little Gransden almost certainly has a need for retirement bungalows and this is a good location for them. So um, I, I would support the lead cabinet member for planning to, to ask for that, to go to cabinet to, to, to decide what the, what the grounds, ground should be used for. Um, Sorry, can I interrupt, Chair? I, I, think, I think what Stephen Reid's about to say is that isn't a material consideration. We can't, we've, we've asked the judge what's in front of us today. No, but can we put it as an informative? I don't think so, no. Could we, for example, if we were... No, I, I, right. I think the no, comments okay, been the comments been made, point. and I think it's publicly on record now okay. that that's what you'd like. So, so, so the other point is that um, Councillor Wilson asked, was there any reason why this piece of land wasn't used in the first place to build? And it would be interesting to know if there is some geological reason why this piece wasn't used. We don't know. Maybe it was just that the MOD didn't need that piece. I'm not sure, um, but. I just don't think this. I don't think this is a very good use of this plot, um, and I would do it on the grounds of whether it preserves and enhances the character of the local area. Um, so policy HQ one. Uh, I know the officer has said that that can be overcome, um, but. The other dwellings in this lane are modest, semi-detached and bungalows. And I think, I think it would be appropriate to provide another modest, semi-detached or bungalow in the same, in the same lane. So I will, I will object to this application. Thank okay, you. thank you. I'm sure Mr. Reid's going to rehash what's been said earlier, but I will allow him to. Yes, um, this is an outline application. Can we concentrate on the application before you? Sorry, but if I may say, I absolutely agree, which is why I said I'd object to it, but the point being, instead of being a small number of similarly sized dwellings as are currently in this lane, this is proposing one market dwelling, and, and that's my objection. Sorry, it's not proposing one, one market dwelling. It's, yes, an it out, it's an outline application. Forgive me, forgive me, Mr. Reid. The application is... Outline planning application for the erection of a single self-built dwelling with all matters reserved. I take that to mean they are applying for a single self-built dwelling. It doesn't say two or three, or, but it says one. And I just don't think one is appropriate in this location. Thank you. Okay, thank you. I, th I think the point's been made. Okay, um, I'm going to move on then. Next speaker in the debate is Councillor Fane, please. Thank you, Chair. Uh, yes, I will, of course, take full account of the advice from officers on what we are actually considering here. Um, I was very sympathetic to the concerns raised about the use of this track for a footpath, but I am satisfied that, in practice, one more dwelling, in addition to either 12 or 14 or some dispute on that, will make no real difference. Um, I share some of the concerns that were expressed about the state of the road, but we have to look at paragraph 32. The Highway Authority have raised no issues in relation to it um, and have not recommended conditions. Um, looking at the green space requirement of the village, again, I, I accept that this village does need green space. This may in practice, in practice, not in law, be the main area available, whether that's to children or others. But it is not 
currently devoted to green space, and it is within the development framework, and I think we have to work on that basis. Of course, the question of what recommendation is subsequently made to Cabinet or others as to the actual use of this land is separate from what its planning status might then be. Uh, we have heard that there is an established need for affordable housing in the village. I wasn't sure whether there's actually a housing needs survey being done to indicate that, but I accept that there is that need. Indeed, I would say the, the need is in general greater in the smaller villages where our hierarchy tends to uh, discriminate against small villages, as some would put it. And we have, of course, the question of self-build. And I think it's important to just look at what, what we are told on this. Um, paragraph 41, we are in duty not only to maintain a register, but also place a duty on public authorities to have, a, have regard to those registers in carrying out planning and other functions places a legal duty on authorities to grant sufficient development permission to meet the demand. And um, further down, 42, the council doesn't at present have a specific policy, but as was pointed out, we are a vanguard authority, so we have taken on certain commitments in that regard. And I therefore think that in the circumstances, despite my concerns about local green space, what the absence of it, and the possible alternative uses of this land, I think the case is made and we should accept the officer's of recommendation and approve subject to the conditions that are set out. Thank you, sir. Uh, Mr. Reid would like to come in, please. Uh, sorry, Chair. Um, looking at the application, uh, the application uh, is for one one and a half storey, four bed, six person, detached dwelling dash, self build stroke custom build. So it's the um, papers before you refer to self build only. There is scope for it to be custom build, which means that it doesn't have to be a market dwelling in my view. Okay, thank you. Uh, next up, we've Councillor Hawkins speaking in the debate, and then Councillor Williams. Um, thank you very much, Chair. Um, sticking to the planning material reasons. Uh, paragraph 13 does not accord with policy S11, um, but we're trying to make an exception in this instance, for the erection of one dwelling. Uh, it's a balance. And in my view, the balance has not been proven. I would rather it was affordable housing. Uh, policy HQ1, uh, we talk about um, the mix and styles of neighboring properties. And I know this, the, the uh, paragraph 18 says there's no single architectural style. But when you look at what's on the road, You've got a row of semi-detached properties, two stories, and two, three pairs of semi-detached bungalows. And this will be next to a semi-detached bungalow. So there is some sort of style there, and this will stand out. It does not fit in. Um, it does, in my view, um, adversely impact on the character of that road. Um, Paragraph 33, policy TI3. It says that two car parking spaces should be provided per dwelling. And I have paragraph 34 telling me that it is likely that this could be achieved, but there is no certainty. And it is a track, a public rights of way that you cannot have cars on or it should not be blocked. So if you cannot guarantee that there will be two parking spaces, then you should not be granting planning permission. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Councillor. And finally, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. And desperately trying to not make Mr. Blaisby and Mr. Reid explode <laughs> by whatever I say next. Um, <laughs> 
<laughs> I'll, I'll just put that caveat in first. Um, so I think actually what's just, because I, I imagine we're going to get shouted at again for parking, um, maybe, as we were outlined, but I think actually paragraph 15, it's what's just been read out about, um, it is considered that an exception to policy S11 can be made. I, I think some members may be minded that an exception can't be given to that um, on balance on the principle of development um, and that um, there's concern for the character of the walk, etc. Um, and then the infill that Councillor Williams... Would that be a happy medium, Mr. Blaseby, of our reasons for refusal? <laughs> Hopefully, I, I, keeping to planning. I hope so. I think I think we have reached the end of the debate now, members, and I have been making some notes uh, as to the concerns that have been raised. Um, so, should I think the committee be minded to refuse this application, I think it's probably better to rehearse those to make sure everyone, including officers, are content with them. Um, so, what I had was the impacts for slash loss of local amenity access to property and contraventions of policies S11 and HQ1. So, or impact on or loss of local amenity. Visual amenity. Visual, visual amenity. Visual amenity. Visual amenity. Right. An impact on local character as well. And then, and then the other two policy numbers were Contraventions of policy HQ1 and policy S11. That's what I had, members, unless there's any I've missed there that anyone else wish to raise as well. So I suppose over to you for some comment, Mr. Blaisby, on those. Um, thank you, Chair. Um, I think if, if the committee feels that those um, reasons are um, just by refusal, then I, I think they, they are um, acceptable because <laughs> they don't go beyond the planning considerations that, um, that, we've, um, that we've raised in the, in the report. Um, if, you, if, you, if you are minded to refuse, would you be happy for those to be delegated, um, written up as delegated reasons and um, in consultation with the Chair and Vice Chair? Yes, I'm content with it. Um, okay, members, I think we, do, we are going to have to go to a vote on this because I have at least one uh, member to speak in favour of. So if one of the Democratic Services officers could set up the vote for us, please. So the recommendation is approval. So if you're in agreement with that, vote green, vote yes. If you're against that, vote red or no. Or obviously, if you wish to abstain, vote yellow. So just running through it again, if you wish to approve the application, vote green. If you wish to vote against the application, vote red. Or if you wish to abstain, vote yellow. Press the blue button. Press the blue button. There you go. Yes. Sorry, just one, just one member hasn't So voted. we're missing one vote. So this is where I come around and check on people. Oh, yeah. So there you go, now you can vote. Perfect. I pressed it. Okay, I think the results are in, members, and we can see it is two votes in favour, seven votes against, so the application is refused. Okay, members, thank you for the good debate on that. We're now going to move to the next item, which is agenda item eight. <clears throat> this is... Uh, an application at the Jolly Millers Pub, 73 High Street, Cottenham. The proposal in front of us today is a change of use for a public house um, with a flat to a dwelling. Uh, demolition of existing outbuildings and a erection of a new dwelling. Um, and parking with manoeuvring for two vehicles. The applicant is Mr Gary Jackson. And the reason it is before us today is because uh, it is in contradiction to the Parish Council's recommendation. Um, we have, hopefully, Alice Young with us online, who is the planning officer presenting this to us today. Hi, yes, I'm here. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, Alice. Is your... Can you switch your camera on, please? I can still yes, see the clerk from Little Gransden. Bear with me okay. a second. Well, yeah, we can see and hear you, Alice. So, yeah, if you... 
could give us any updates to the uh, paper in front of us and then if you could introduce the item for us, please. Of course, thank you, Chair. Um, just uh, an update, hopefully members have received the camera um, consultation um, which was sent yesterday around to members. Can I just confirm that everyone had access to that before we get started? Yeah, we have received it via email, albeit I see Councillor Bradham shaking her head at me. It's, um, it is on email. I don't know if Aaron or Lawrence could quickly email that to Councillor Bradman, please. But other than that, if you can carry on, Alice, please. Yeah, I'll get on the case, Chair. Thank you. Brilliant, thank you. Um, I'll start the presentation now. Um, just let me share my screen. Bear with me a second. Okay, so can I just confirm that you can see my screen? We can. Brilliant, that's great, thank you very much. So um, this is uh, a planning application for uh, 79 High Street Cottenham, the Johnny Millers, and it's for a change of use of the public house um, and the flat um, associated with that public house, demolition of um, the existing outbuildings and annex and erection of a dwelling to the rear. Um, 79 High Street, Cottenham, and the Johnny Miller's pub is located on the south um, eastern side of Cottenham High Street. Um, the site comprises a public house and several outbuildings and pub amenity land to the southeast. The development framework boundary cuts through the site 38 metres from the front of the site beyond the existing outbuildings. The site also falls within the Cottenham Conservation Area. And the two trees on site are protected as they are in the conservation area but do not have um, TPO status. To the northeast of the site is Smith's Path, um, which uh, leads to commercial and residential units um, to the southeast of the site. Um, aside from the uh, commercial units, predominantly the site is surrounded by residential units. Um, with large plots extending beyond the development framework boundary, which typically contain um, barns, outbuildings and some small backland um, dwellings. Here are some photos of the site. Um, you'll see that the blue is the rear of the existing pub building. Um, the, green, the orange arrow um, is the uh, annex outbuilding and then there's another outbuilding um, which has the yellow uh, arrow there. Could we just ask on that photograph is Smith's path to the left or to the right or straight ahead? Um, let me just get my I'm point just trying to orientate myself. I can't quite... Of course, of course. So can you see my pointer? Yes, so this path is just um, to the oh, right yeah. hand side yeah. of this. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And um, this is the uh, site, uh, more pictures from the site. This is number 75 here, um, with several outbuildings to the rear of that dwelling as well. And uh, this, this again shows Smith Path, which is just here, um, number 71 and 71A High Street. As well, you'll be able to see that this is Smith Path in this right hand um, picture as well. I hope that's clear for members. Um, and again, this this just shows the site, which is um, this is the back boundary of the, the red line site. Um, so it shows clearly what the, the site context is. Uh, the application seeks permission to change the use of the former pub building um, and manager's flat to a single residential dwelling and the demolition of the um, existing annex and outbuildings um, and the erection of a detached dwelling to the rear um, and associated facilities including parking, bins and amenity space. The existing vehicular access to the southwest of the pub 
um, will be retained and two parking spaces will be um, provided, one per dwelling within the site and two parking spaces will be provided on the carriageway. So these are the existing floor plans of the pub. Um, you'll see the bar is um, pub is downstairs um, along with the store and annex and then the living quarters for the manager um, above. And this is the proposed floor plan showing the conversion um, into a single dwelling house and the removal of the existing store and annex um, to the rear. And uh, you'll see that there's a rear garden for this public house and associated bins and bike storage in the rear garden. So the proposed um, new dwelling to the rear, um, these are the, the floor plans and these are the elevations. And this is to give uh, context of the proposed dwelling in relation to the main house. So members should have received a consultation from camera, uh, the PAC campaign for Real Ale this week, detailing their um, comments on the loss of the pub. Whilst the loss of the pub is unfortunate, the principle of the loss is justified. The pub has been extensively market marketed before the pandemic for over 12 months at a realistic price for a variety of uses and no offers materialised for any other use other than residential development. Moreover, the viability assessment demonstrates that the pub use on site is not commercially viable due to market conditions and the works required to get the building and business operational. Cottenham has a healthy amount of facilities with three alternative pubs, albeit one is temporarily closed due to the health of the licensee, but all of which are located within the village centre in a more sustainable location. Taking these factors into account alongside the limited objections from residents on the loss of the pub, officers conclude that the criterion in policy SC3 have been met and the loss of the pub would not lead to an unacceptable reduction in the level of community or service provision in Cottenham. In terms of the principle of development for the dwelling, whilst the proposed built form of the dwelling would be contained within the development framework boundary, it is noted that the residential curtilage would extend outside of the development framework boundary. This is, a, is not supported in the neighbourhood plan or other policies within the local plan and therefore is contrary to policy S7 of the local plan as a matter of principle. However, this land is pub amenity land and is clearly defined by a formal boundary fence and is not open countryside. Therefore, the change of use of this land to residential um, to be included within the residential curtilage would not represent an encroachment into the open countryside and not and no harm arises from this aspect of the proposal, despite the minor conflict in policy. So you'll see here that this picture clearly denotes the boundary fence that has been in existence um, for almost 20 years, um, according to Council Aerial Photography. As illustrated earlier, um, the surrounding area is characterised by front facing properties with long rear gardens extending to the rear beyond the development framework boundary. In these rear plots, um, outbuildings, barns and smaller scale dwellings are common, um, such as number 71A, which is just to the north of the site, northeast of the site. Residential and commercial units are also located to the southeast of the site, which are completely outside of the development framework boundary, which are here. And there's also some here. Noting this context, which is reflected in the evidence base for the Cottenham neighbourhood plan, officers consider that the modestly scaled subservient dwelling would not be out of character with the surrounding area particularly as it is similar in appearance to number 71A, the dwelling to the north, um, but it would be smaller in scale comparatively. 
The Conservation Officer has no objection to the proposed dwelling and therefore it would preserve and enhance the character and appearance of the conservation area. They do, however, raise a partial objection to the loss of the pub due to the loss of activity at the site. Given the pub has been vacant for three to five years and that it and that a condition is suggested um, securing the former pub signage officers consider that the impact on the character of the conservation area would be limited as a result from this. The parish have uh, raised objections um, regarding the proposal restricting views from the of the countryside from the high street. Um, from the north side of the pub, uh, the proposal um, which uh, replaces this annex here, but it is sited further back, would be seen within the context of the frontage buildings, um, the formal boundary treatments, and the other built form to the rear, such as number 71A here, and the commercial buildings to the rear. Um, it would not restrict views of the countryside here, as, own, as the only indication of the countryside is the trees behind the built form, which the proposal would not restrict views of. Similarly, um, from the south of the pub, the proposal would be seen again within the context of the larger scale commercial units behind. Um, I've zoomed in slightly so you can see that these are denoted by the uh, red arrows. Um, so they would be seen within the context of um, these larger scale commercial units behind and the formalised rear pub garden. Again, these trees would still provide a backdrop to the built form. And from the east, so from the um, open countryside, again here the proposal would be seen within the context of number 71A over here. And the barns um, to the south. And uh, would be contained within the pub amenity lands garden denoted by the boundary fence. Officers therefore consider subject to appropriate landscaping that the proposal would not, due to its scale massing and ancillary appearance, compromise the views of the open countryside, as the only markers of the open countryside um, to the east is the tree backdrop behind the existing large scale commercial units. Um, this is just a a further picture of the commercial units behind. The Highway Authority originally objected to the application due to the intensification of the use of the access to and from the site, whilst suggesting that in their objection um, that it could be overcome by only providing two car parking spaces within the site with sufficient turning space for one vehicle at a time. The proposed site plan has been amended um, as recommended and officers now consider that the Highway Authority's objection has been overcome. Um, the traffic movements um, are comparable to the former pub use and the additional car parking on the road um, due to the road's width and car parking capacity would comply with TI3 and would not result in car parking pressure on the high street. Um, and therefore, officer recommendation is one of approval subject to the conditions outlined in the um, committee report, um, which include the ones on the screen now. Thank you, Chair. Thank you very much, um, Alice. We do have one very quick point of clarity for you, which I'll allow Councillor Williams. Thank you, Chair. Um, I appreciate it when you'll be asked afterwards. It was just on paragraph 23, um, it has the officer note, the plans have subsequently been amended as per highway's advice to make it impractical for more than two parks to park on site. I'm just wondering if that's, uh, if that's worded correctly, um, because then I might have a few more parking related questions for the applicant chair. Thank you, councillor. Um, could you just remind me which paragraph you're referring to so I can just check that briefly? It's paragraph 23 on page 118. It says to make it impractical for more than two cars to park on site. I thought the idea of the rescheduling was that two 
a one for each house could park on site. Therefore, practical. Um, yes, it is to make um, to make sure that only two car parking spaces are provided in the site. Um, so further car parking will not be provided. So further car parking should be impractical within the site. That is the desire of the highway authority. They would like it so that the, there is only two car parking spaces and enough um, space for vehicles to turn um, within the site and no more than those two car parking spaces on site. I hope that's clear for you. Okay, thank you. We're not in the debate at the moment. Okay. If Okay, Councillor Bradnam, just FYI, there is no representation from the applicant today either. So I'm not sure if that changes anyone's. If there is a very quick point around that, then I'll allow. So can I just clarify with you, um, Miss Young, that you did say that there would be two car parking spaces on the carriageway. And I suspect that's as a result of limiting the car parking spaces on the site any further parking would then therefore have to be on the highway. Can you just clarify that point? Yes, so um, two car parking spaces, one for each dwelling will be provided on the carriageway um, and two within the site. Again, this has come from um, the advice of the highway authority. Thank you. Um, Councillor Wilson, I see you indicating as well. Is this around the same point? I do want to move on to the public speakers, if that's okay. Oh, it's not about parking. I wanted a point of clarification, but you can come here. Okay, if, if we could save those for the debate, please. I will Thank obviously you. come back yes, to you um, after the public speakers, of which we only have one, I do notice, and that is representative representative of the parish council. Um, do we have Councillor John Lovelock with us? We do. I see you on the screen, Councillor. Welcome. Yes, and hopefully you can hear me now. Yes, we can see and hear you perfectly. Welcome Excellent. to the planning committee. Um, I'll allow you to address the committee, albeit uh, in a three minute time frame, if you can manage that, please. And then if you wouldn't mind holding on um, after your comments, in case there's any questions of clarification for you from co committee members. Very happy to, thank you. Thank you, so whenever you're ready, please. Okay, well, thanks for giving us the opportunity to speak. Um, Three minutes isn't long because there's quite a few objections to this development, but if I concentrate on two. First of all, this it's the house at the rear, which is at odds with a linear development in this part of the cotton conservation area, as has been said. Along the northern section of High Street, the majority of houses face the highway and have direct access off it with views through the open countryside, uh, both from the properties and from the main highway. And we believe this linear aspect is an important characteristic of the village and its retention is a goal of the cotton neighbourhood plan. Uh, development of more dwellings behind the current linear plan is contrary, to, therefore, to policy S7 of the South Cambridge local plan, since it's not res and since it's responsive, not responsive to village characteristics, it's also contrary to what see COH15 of the neighbourhood plan. Uh, the planning officer's report quotes a little misleadingly from the Cottenham Heritage and Character Assessment, saying it's common for long plots to be sub subdivided. And this is true, it's a statement of fact, but the neighbourhood plan itself makes it clear that we wish to retain the traditional layout in the future and to avoid piecemeal development that happened before the current local neighbourhood plans were in place, as has been pointed out at 71 High Street and along the neighbouring Smith's path. And um, not directly relevant to this, but we note with concern that this, along with applications of 35 and 129, is one of three similar applications for backland development made in this stretch of the High Street in recent months alone. And while we recognise each application should be judged on its own merits, we recognise, we request that you reject the application to avoid setting a further precedent. It is undesirable, although obviously the will of the local property owners, to create a second line of development behind the high street. And the second point has already been picked up by a couple of councillors. We are concerned by the off-road parking arrangements and safety of access to the site. Our neighbourhood plan policy COH14 requires developments to retain or increase on-site parking, to reduce roadside parking. And here we seem to be doing the reverse. Normal, normal planning policy would require at least two off-road parking places for each of the four bedroom and two bedroom houses, i.e. four in total. 
And this was accommodated in the original plans by having parking spaces beyond the development boundary, which we will object to. But the local highway authorities made the, to us, mystifying requirement that due to the inadequate access road safety, the provision of more than two spaces must be prevented, which forces increased parking on the high street itself, consequently reducing visibility for cars leaving the site. And we do not see how this is in the interest of road safety. And I think this is a paradox which can't be squared. If you circle, it can't be squared, and which demonstrates the unsuitability of this location for the proposed development. And if I've got any time left, I'll say a little bit about transport links developing in this area, which is a long way from public transport, uh, nearly half a mile from the nearest bus stop with regular services. Uh, our neighbourhood plan states that for true sustainability, houses should be located less than 400 metres from a well service bus stop to discourage car use. Uh, and uh, we believe that by developing in this kind of area, we are encouraging car use rather than uh, discouraging it. Thank you very much, Councillor. That's uh, very useful comments for us there. Members, do we have any questions of clarification for uh, the Parish Councillor? Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Chairman. Um, I don't think uh, the Parish Councillor mentioned um, the need for a Cottenham uh, public house, um, but it is mentioned in your representations in the agenda, so I, I think I'm OK to go over those. I'm, getting a nod from the chairman, so I'm not going to get shot at dawn. Um, so could you explain to me, um, seemingly you're saying that there's only two um, working, uh, ongoing public houses at the moment, and obviously Cottenham has had a major growth of development. Can you tell me, therefore, would you believe that it could still be a feasible uh, asset to the village to it be reopened? Thank you, yeah, thank you very much for the question, because in the three minutes I decided I didn't have time to cover that as well as the other points. But uh, I'd make one point. The, the applicants made a big deal of the fact that the property was marketed at a sensible value and failed to come up with any takers, but then it sold for 100k less than the asking price. And I failed to see that it can therefore be marketed at what would be a realistic price. Um, also point out quite a lot of the marketing, not all of it, was during the pandemic. And as you say, there are an additional 500 new houses coming to Cottenham, admittedly, the other end of the village. Uh, there are three pubs currently nominally in Cottenham, but one of them is on the market currently, with uh, statements in the selling details about being transferred to residential ownership. So. I'm looking forward to hearing what camera have to say. Hopefully they can make a very cogent argument for why we should retain the pub. But um, it wasn't the prime focus of our objection, which, as I say, is mainly on neighbourhood plan development issues and on parking arrangements. Not an expert in pub marketing, so I don't feel really qualified to override the, the documents in the dossier, but uh, they are open to question, I'm sure. The chairman's allowed me to come back on the secondary. Um, the, the public houses that are um, going in the village, are they busy? I mean, is there uh, a sort of quantifiable need shown in the village that people want to go to the village pubs? I mean, I know we've all been boozing like mad at home or in the garden, um, but, you know, is it seems to you that, that they are still popular and that people in the village are looking for that sort of uh, leisure recreational facility. Now, I'm one of those people who defends the need for pubs, but then realise I haven't been in a pub myself for a, quite a while. So I'm one of those armchair pub goers. Um, there are many of us. The Hotbind is a thriving pub dealing with the sporting population of the village, the youth of the village. Checkers tends to have a slightly different uh, clientele it's become it's more of a restaurant than a pub in recent years and i think that's all i can really say i used to drink in the jolly millers on occasion and found it a very very convivial pub uh but i have to say it was often quiet but um i think that's probably how it's marketed and how it's managed rather than and uh how the brewery handles it as much as anything i don't think i can say anything further really councillor roberts i'm sorry 
but uh, there is certainly evidence that the hot pine in particular is a, is, is a thriving pub in the centre of the village. Okay, that's very clear, thank you. Councillor Braddon, please. Thank you. Um, you uh, said that the parish council were concerned about parking. Can you just give us a sort of pen picture of what the parking is like on the, that part of the high street? Because just looking on Google Maps, which purports to be 2022, but still has the pub sign outside and lights on outside the pub. I don't know if that's right, but um, there appears to be only one parking space immediately outside the pub. And I just wondered what impact you thought having two cars there might make in the area. I think it would encourage parking on the high street, which I saw the statements in the report about there being plenty of width, plenty of space. I've also seen justifications for the safety of the exit from the site by showing a line of parked cars, which remove visibility. I cannot see how having parked cars along the front can in any way improve the safety of the exit from the property we're talking about. Uh, I not I don't live at that end of the village, so I can't directly comment on how frequently cars park along there. That's, that, that's fine, Councillor. This is encouraged. I think, you've, encourage, I, I think you've answered as best you can. Thank you, yeah. um, Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair, and I'll be very brief. Um, considering the fact that Cottenham is going to grow over the next few years based on all the houses being built now, um, there is a potential view that uh, if the Jolly Millers opened as a free of type pub, that it could be still thriving going forward. Do you agree with that? I do agree with that. Thank you. Good, very succinct. <laughs> okay, I think uh, one more, sorry. Councillor Heather Williams, please. A final question of clarity. As I said, with such an um, exasperation from the chair, I was just going to, uh, to ask um, whether there'd been, it's a uh, sort of, we have assets of community value and, and community get the right then to, to bid for the, the um, pub and things like that. Have there been any movement? within the village to make it a community-owned pub? I have not heard of any such plans. I think that was a no. I mean, I, I'm, not I'm not saying I would have heard of them, I'm just saying I haven't heard of any such plans. No, that's, that's fair comment, that's, that's yeah. what you can say. Thank you. Um, okay, Councillor Lovelock, thank you very much for your time and for uh, probably, I imagine, waiting quite a long time to address us today, so I appreciate your patience, and um, we will now move on, members. Um, we do have a local member with us, Councillor Wilson. I don't know, Councillor, if you wanted to speak as a local member now or save your comments to the debate. Um, I would like to ask for some clarifications first and then speak later at the end of the debate, if that's okay. acceptable. Okay, well, I think we'd better move into the debate then, then obviously I'll give you final say when we come to conclude the debate. Um, first, I have Council, oh sorry, Councillor Wilson, if you want to answer your questions of clarity before um, I skip over. Um, my, my question was for the um, officer uh, about the marketing of the um, premises, because it, um, in the papers it says it was marketed from March 2019 to July 2020, um, but March 2019, one year later, we were in lockdown and, the, and all pubs were closed. So um, that was just one year of marketing. So I wouldn't, uh, is that considered to be extensive marketing? So that was, that was one of my points. Um, I, I should add that when we first moved to Cottenham, a, a local who'd lived there all his life told me there were once 42 pubs in cotton and working and so now we're down to 42 <laughs> although yeah so so there's been great loss over the years and a growing village um so so that was my, my first question really. okay thank you for that alice i'm not sure if you can comment on the um on the suitability of the marketing period during a lockdown 
Um, what I will say is, obviously, as stated in the report, it was marketed from March 2019 to July 2020. So that was a full year before lockdown occurred. Um, and in our local plan, it does talk about um, 12 months um, marketing. And um, the extensive uh, marketing was to do with um, where it was marketed, how it was marketed, which agency it was marketed in, uh, what it was marketed for. It was marketed for pubs um, primarily, but also restaurants, cafes, other community facilities alongside other uses. Um, there was a reduction in price um, when it, from its original price when it was originally marketed in 2019 um, and it was then obviously bought at a lower price than it was uh, marketed for a reduced price if that makes sense. Um, I would also like to highlight that they have provided a viability assessment which does demonstrate that it's not commercially a not commercially viable entity um, and it also does say in that report that the re-establishment could impact upon the profitability of other facilities in, in Cottenham. I just thought I'd raise that now, but um, hopefully that addresses um, councillors' concerns. Can I come back on that point? Yes, um, the, the, I, I know from my local knowledge that this pub went through a very turbulent period where um, onerous demands were made on landlords so they could not make the pub profitable. It was um, very, very touch and go for a long time. Uh, as for the um, impact on other pubs in the village, there, there is definitely a, a, a green end and a church end. This, this pub is at the church end of the village. The other pubs are at the green end of the village. And it's a very, very long village. So there did tend to be um, polarisation of use of the pubs. And I know that a lot of people are very disappointed that that particular end of the village doesn't have a, a pub anymore. So I would just like to add that to okay. what, what's been Thank said. Thank um, Councillor Daunton, please be your next in the debate. Um, my question was about marketing, uh, the period of the marketing and what was it? Um, involved in the extensive marketing. So I think it's probably all been answered. Thank you. It was okay, thank you. Next we have Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. Um, and mine's for the debate chair. Um, so I'm just going to say on a, on a parallel. I know, you know, I've, I've got one of two pubs in one of my villages, which is a lot smaller. In fact, it's got 300 and something houses and it's got two pubs. So I think Cottenham. On the amount of pubs it's got, it could support another another pub in the in the area. Um, I'm speaking as a former landlady and knowing that industry relatively well. Um, there are lots of things that can be done. Um, and yes, I, I respect that it's said that the other pubs in the area would have an impact from it reopening, but they would from anything. They would have, if McDonald's turned up on the doorstep, you know, that's we can't control the market um, in that respect. But um, there are other things that concern me about this application, um, as well as, you know, I don't think any of us want to see the loss of a loss of a pub or facility. And we have to be very minded that in the current climate, I think most viability assessments would fail um, and the likes um, due to the pandemic. So, you know, we should have that in the back of our minds. But, um, the parking for myself is a, a real concern. There may be some clarification here actually around the cycle parking. I, I might have glazed over that perhaps, but I couldn't see where that was provided. Um, and the bin storage, given it's so tight in there. Um, and I'm, I'm just minded of HQ1, our local plan policy, which I'm just pulling up, that says ensure that car parking is integrated into the development in a convenient, accessible manner and does not dominate in development and its surroundings or cause safety issues. Now, I say that because it's all cause safety issues. So it's not, um, um, you know, you have to 
if you if you have safety issues that are addressed, then that means the others go. I personally don't think by only having one one car park space. I'm still trying to. It blows my mind. There's one car park space for per dwelling for dwellings of that size. You know, it it's ridiculous to be quite frank. Um, well, he would be concerned if they had two car parking spaces for the size of the dwellings that are proposed and the occupations that they'll have. Um, and I don't think, if you look, actually look at the street as well, while there may be not cars outside the um, pub itself, there's lots of dipped curbs and preventative measures. There's double yellow lines, literally three doors down. There's lots of um, restrictions on that road for car parking. Now, given that this is for two sizable dwellings, we're not talking about two, two up, two down. You know, there'll, there'll be big houses with bedrooms. Um, as, as families, you know, develop, you'll be taking up half, half that provision on both sides. So I don't think it's compliant with um, policy. I think we've got enough to refuse it, even if you don't look at the economic um, impacts on that. I think it's complete overdevelopment and trying to squeeze a ridiculous amount in the size that's there um, and should should be refused, personally. Um, that's me off my high horse chair. Thank you very much. Um, next in the debate, we have Councillor Richard Williams. Uh, thank you, Chair. Mine was actually a question of clarification um, for the officer. I understood that there was supposed to be some on-street parking. Um, I think that was referred to. Um, earlier, so there would be one space on the site and then another space for each dwelling on the road. Uh, can I just check where that on-street parking would be? Is it intended to be outside, designated outside the dwelling? Alex, I'm not sure if you can help us with a map. I will just try and get it up now. Bear with me. Thanks. Can you see my screen? We can. So obviously there's two car parking spaces within the site here, and I believe they would be on the carriageway just outside the public house, just around here. Okay. Yeah, so can I, can I come back to that? Yeah. I mean, this is not necessarily a point for the officer. This may be more of a debate point. But I'm slightly um, dumbfounded, really, as to why highways have said they can't have more than one space on the, 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 the development site, supposedly because of visibility displays. But if you put designated parking spaces right in front of the pub, surely you're going to move the, the visibility space further out onto the road, and they would still be obstructed by the... By, by, by the designated parking base. I, I, I'm dumbfounded about how um, highways think this is this is better. As I say, it, it, it's not really a question for the officer. No. Maybe it's more of a comment for debate. Okay. No, thank you. That has been, been noted. Thank you for the map, Alice. Um, next up, Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. I'm dumbfounded in the same way that Councillor uh, Richard Williams or whoever it was said it. Uh, I, on this, I'm looking at the plan for the annex, um, although it appears to show the pub at the front, but I can't see any parking spaces on the proposed ground floor plan, which it because it refers to a boundary wall to be retained. So the place that um, Miss Young identified for parking that may well be right but it doesn't appear to show on the plans that I'm looking at for uh, the dwelling um, so I'm dumbfounded as to why it should be okay to put or even to consider that there might be space for two parking places in front of the pub when actually when you look on Google Maps it's fairly clear that there's only really space for one vehicle uh, outside the property not least the access, the visibility space for both Smith's Path and the actual um, access to the parking behind this property are both very narrow and both constrained by dwelling walls on both sides. You know, so I can't see how that's going to work. Um, 
and also the fact that whilst we want to promote means of active transport, um, these two dwellings could, between them, as far as I can make, ha make out, have something between um, four and five bedrooms in total, or maybe, maybe more than that. I'm sorry, I, I might have missed the plans, but certainly the property at the back appears to have two bedrooms, and the property at the front appears to have more, I'm sorry, I'm, I'm, I'm four, yeah, something like that, four bedrooms. So that's a total of six bedrooms, and to only provide two on-site parking spaces just doesn't seem to be enough. Um, the other point I was also going to make, which Councillor Heather Williams has made, is that any viability on any pub during over that period would have come out with any pub showing that it wasn't viable. So um, I just, I'm not convinced by the arguments around. And also the very fact that it was being marketed at a price of £100,000 over what it was finally sold for um, to the current applicant seems unfortunate to say the least. Anyway, I shall remain, listen to what other people have to say. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you for your comments then. Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. I think I just want to kind of clarify this thing on the viability assessment. Um, can you remind me when the dates were that the assessment was carried out? I, I have, Councillor, March 2019 to July 2020, unless, that's, unless Alice is going to tell me that's incorrect. Uh, camera say November 2020. Alice, could you clarify the dates the property was marketed? Um, the dates that you've just quoted there, um, Councillor Batchelor, were the marketing period. That wasn't the date of the viability assessment. The date of the viability assessment was the 2nd of November 2020. Okay. Thank you. Councillor okay. Hawkins. That makes sense. So right in the middle of the pandemic, I'm afraid that doesn't make sense to me. Of course, it will be not viable. Okay, thank you. Councillor Roberts, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. I share everybody's concerns here. And it seems to me that I, I don't think it's been proven in my mind that this is an unviable um, business potential. Uh, I think it's been marketed at the wrong time. I think we need to uh, require a further period now that we are coming out of lockdown and that pubs are opening again. I think the price has probably been pitched far too high. Um, that's exactly what happened in Falmere with one of our two pubs. Uh, it was wildly uh, exaggerated price and uh, nobody was going to um, buy it for that sort of price because it was a tiny pub and it didn't have that sort of income. Um, but eventually, of course, uh, because nobody was going for it, it got sold and it's now, but luckily it is a business, it's a, it's a nursery for children in the village. But uh, I, I think that uh, it's down to the price here and at the right price, you'd probably get the right buyer, um, somebody who will actually put some effort and interest and work. Um, again, we're all talking about our own patches, but um, at Falmere, we had the checkers closed down for two years and it had been terribly badly managed before that, it was bankrupt. Um, now somebody has taken on and it's going great guns. Um, so, you know, I, I think um, we need to refuse this one. And I don't know, officers can maybe advise, can we request that it's marketed for a new period of time um, in a different, uh, in a different um, business situation that we have now with things taking off again? I'd like that answered, but I don't, don't think I can support it. Okay, I think officers will look into that and come back to us if that's okay. Um, next to speak, please, virtually, Martin Kahn. Councillor Kahn. Yes, I'm sorry, I missed quite a lot of the discussion here, and I can't vote in any case because I'm online, uh, but I have some comments which I think might be helpful. Um, first of all, regarding the, this position as a pub, uh, I think this building is totally unsuitable for a pub in a modern era, simply because it has no parking on site. 
you are replacing two building, uh, you're talking about replacing residential development in place of a pub, which would itself attract far more uh, traffic parking uh, on, on the road uh, than the two dwellings. The, uh, any pub nowadays will normally want to provide food to make itself viable. To provide food, you have people driving, one person not uh, drinking, and you need tra uh, car parks. So I think there is definitely a need for a pub, but I don't actually think this is the right building. I think there may be other sites in northern Cottenham which would be uh, suitable. But I, I, for this reason, I'm not worried about the fact that you lose the pub. You need to go and find another site which is more suitable for modern needs. This was a pub since 1840, at which time everybody would be coming by foot or by horse. Uh, uh, and it's a totally different context. Um, uh, I don't think the site is suitable. The second question is whether the proposed residential development is suitable, which is a separate question. Uh, uh, and there are issues here. I think looking at the uh, aerial photograph, there are cars parked along that stretch of street. There appears to be adequate for two-way traffic plus the parking. So that in itself is not a problem, but uh, there are other issues. We want to have all new developments having electric car charging points. A new is a big problem with the new development that where you don't have car parking on site, you don't have easy recharging of cars. So I would want all the cars that are going to use the dwelling to be charged, uh, have access to electric car parking, and you can't provide that uh, electric charging. So I think uh, the access to the site through the access is very narrow. The car cars are going to come back between cars. I think it is certainly, the highways are right that it is dangerous, but why two or four? It's dangerous full stop. So uh, really you want to leave the access uh, at the existing level and therefore having two dwellings on site is I think debatable on this side. Uh, 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 I would find that that is the reason to refuse rather than the question about, um, about the requirement need for a pub. There is a need for a pub, but this I don't think is the site and it's not therefore a justifiable site uh, for refusing. I think possibly the reason why it was uh, not accessible is up. in addition to the fact that it was during the pandemic was the fact that it is not suitable for a modern pub. Thank you. There we are. Thank you, Councillor. Our next speaker is Councillor Fain. Thank you, Chair. Um, a lot of what I would have said has been said already. Uh, I won't duplicate it except to say that on the parking, if it has not in practice been a problem for a pub, I can't see that it would be a problem for two residential units. Uh, I don't want to say more, just to add to the degree of dumbfoundedness in the room. Uh, on the question of viability, I think the assessment has already been questioned. I am very persuaded by what camera have said to us. I think that a village of I believe 6,600 houses, um, does need uh, provision for a reasonable number of pubs. I don't want to stray into area that the local member may be about to cover, so forgive me. I'm sure we'd all be very happy for her to repeat it in a more coherent form if necessary. But um, no, it is quite clear to me that not only are at least three pubs needed in a village of this size, but that a pub is needed on this site to serve this part of Cottenham, North Cottenham, it is, we understand, 10 minutes walk from the other pubs, the nearest pubs in Cotton. So I think there is a strong case for that. And camera rightly refer us to the NPPF on this, and to paragraph 30, 93 in particular, um, planning policies and decisions should plan positively for the provision of shared community facilities such as pubs, uh, public houses, um, and should guard against the unnecessary loss of valued facilities and services, um, especially where, particularly where this would reduce the community's ability to meet its day-to-day -day needs. And as camera point out to us, and I am again persuaded of this, that experience shows that when communities lose their pubs, they rarely, if ever, regain them. I don't know that we have any proposals or likelihood of insisting that new developments in the community should include provision of, of pubs. Um, so I think in the circumstances, I don't believe the case for uh, this being, I mean, I think it discontinued 
trading in June 2018, but if it were marketed at the right price, and no longer as a Tide pub, but as free of the Thai, it could well be that this would be a viable business, and we should do our best to safeguard it. And that means turning down its proposed conversion to other uses and the uh, additional unit at the back. So I, I'm inclined to vote against this. Great. Thank you very much. Um, we've got three more speakers, Councillor Daunton Roberts and then Councillor Wilson as local member. So Councillor Daunton, please. Thank you. Um, well, I won't repeat much of what Councillor Fain has said, and, and I'm really very much persuaded by the conservation officer's um, concerns over the change of use um, in paragraph 26 and 27, and I think that we really need to take that on board. Um, so I will be voting against it. I mean, made clear that it's an important building, an important, an important building in the village, uh, but also a um, historic pub, um, and it's set out very clearly in those two paragraphs. Thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Yeah, I'll keep it very qu uh, quick, if I may, um, and try. I agree utterly with Councillor Fain. Sometimes we don't agree, but on this one we certainly do. And, uh, and Councillor Daunton's comments and everybody else. I, I think the thing is that it, it's quite clear that at this end of the village, there's no facility, there's no public house. And I think one thing that the uh, pandemic has taught us is, firstly, how much we miss human communication, and secondly, how much we are more happy now to walk places. Um, we don't want to get in our cars, and we should be dissuading people from getting into cars and going to public houses, because, you know, if you've got one that's fairly near to you, why would you bother to get your car out if you can walk to it? So uh, I think that this is a, a good case to actually stand up for a public house, um, being retained. Thank you, Chairman. Thank you. Um, Councillor Brad, and then I'll conclude with Councillor Wilson. Thank you. Um, I uh, have already spoken, and I, I would just like to... Um, it's interesting that the Conservation Officer recommended that if it was to be approved for change of use, that the, that the pub sign be retained. Um, I'd like to suggest the opposite, and that is that the pub sign be retained for the good reason that it remains a pub. Um, but... Also, I'd like to, uh, if, if that's the way the application goes, I'd like to urge the parish council to actually register it as an, as an asset of um, community value, because that's clearly what is being argued there. Thank you. No, agreed, and obviously, if, if we were to refuse the application today, um, hopefully the parish council are listening and will take steps to do as such. And finally, to conclude as Councillor Wilson, local member. Thank you. Um, on that last point, I did ask some years ago before I became a councillor whether this could be um, registered as an asset of community value, but um, I was advised that because there were other pubs in the village, it, it wasn't so unique as to merit that nomination. Um, I, I've got a couple of points. On the car parking, um, although it looks like the road is quite wide and, the, and there's parking on the street. Um, the high street in Cottenham is a, has constant HGV movements and sometimes it's very hard to for cars going one way to get past the HGVs going the other way and that, that does create a, what could be a very risky situation both for pedestrians and cyclists. So I wouldn't want to see any more parking on the street. Um, also, if we're trying to encourage um, cycling and walking, um, we don't want more parking because it does make it unpleasant for pedestrians and cyclists. Um, on um, the, the report mentions good transport, that this end of the village has not had good transport for some years now. Um, the, the bus that used to go th through the length of the village only goes that way once a day each way, so there's no good public transport at that end of the village. Um, that's concentrated more at the, the green end of the village, which is this, the, this, the older centre central of the village. Um, the, um, the, this is a departure from the neighbourhood plan. Um, a lot of work went into the neighbourhood plan and a lot of thought. 
and I, I, I would really object to um, the, a departure from the neighbourhood plan um, for the reasons that uh, Mr. Lovelock um, explained, and um, and like Councillor Roberts um, said, post COVID, people are looking for more and more opportunities to socialise and to socialise within the village without um, driving to other places. And this is one lost opportunity for people to socialise. Thank you. Thank you very much, members. I think that draws the debate to conclusion. I think we can move to a um, uh, move to the recommendation. Um, I'm getting a sense that some people are wish wishing to vote against this, so I'm just going to go over the material considerations that I've heard during the debate. Uh, first one is principle of development. Second is access highway safety and parking provision. And the third, uh, I need some advice on this, is departure from the neighbourhood plan. Um, is there anything that I've missed there, committee? Or does that pretty much encapsulate everyone's concerns around this application? Councillor Hawkins? Question around the viability of the pub. I'm not sure. I have to ask officers on that if that is a material consideration. Thank you, Chair. Um, I mean, what I would say is that, um, in my opinion, um, the scheme has met the policy test in that the applicant has gone through an economic viability exercise. The policy talks about the future economic viability. And uh, as far as I'm aware, you know, they have considered it its future. So I don't think COVID is the only factor in that. It, they, it would have looked at um, a number of factors um, around the suitability of the building, its location, et cetera. Um, and that's been demonstrated. So I think that's a, that's a difficult area for members. And in terms of the marketing, I think clearly it has been marketed for 12 months out, completely outside of the lockdown period. Um, so I would, I would advise that both of those factors together would indicate that um, it's neither viable um, nor um, anyone you know, has come forward um, to um, take it on and therefore it's policy compliant. But, but members, it, it's, it's a matter for you. I mean, we've, we've heard debates about the price that we, it, was, it, was, um, it was marketed at. Um, it, 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 it's not a, an absolute, it's a matter for you. But my advice would be that I, I believe it's policy compliant. Thank you. It, uh, it was in the paperwork and it was mentioned that it's an historic pub and that it's a 19th century pub and I think that uh, the paperwork clearly talks about uh, the Victorian character of the building as well which is uh, very much part of the village scene and, uh, and part of the design of the village area there so I, I think we ought to also flag up um, that character you know, it's, it's specific character, characteristics as being a, a Victorian building. Yeah, um, impact on character is a material consideration. So is that fair to include that as well, Nigel? Yeah. Yeah, okay. So those are the, oh, sorry, and the question around departure from the neighbourhood plan. Presumably that's a material consideration. Uh, it, it, it certainly is, yes. The neighbourhood plan forms part of the um, adopted development plan. Okay, so the four I have members are principle of development, access highway safety and parking provision, departure from the neighbourhood plan, and impact on the character of the area. I think that pretty pretty well encapsulates the, the reasons for refusal should we go that way. Um, good, okay, we'll go to the recommendation then, which is on a page with the number 113, 133, sorry. Uh, so the recommendation, members, is that we approve the application subject to the conditions listed in the agenda. Um, I feel more comfortable if you did go to an electronic vote on this, actually, if that's okay, members. Erin, could we set that up, please? So obviously the recommendation is to approve. So if members are in agreement and want to approve, press green. If members wish to refuse on the, on the um, reasons that we just talked about, press red or if members wish to abstain, press yellow. Six, seven, eight, nine. One more to vote.
There we go, done. Done, done. Okay, so members, you can see on the screen that is uh, nine votes to refuse, none to approve, and none, no abstentions. So that application is unanimously refused. Chair, if I may just clarify um, that the reasons, the actual reasons for refusal can be delegated to officers yes. and yep. we'll, we'll draft something in consultation with Chair and Vice Chair. Yep. Agreed. Thank you very much. Um, mem members, uh, I think a 10 minute recess and then we can hopefully finish the agenda. Uh, it's now just gone uh, six minutes past three, so if we come back just after quarter past and we will resume and hopefully finish off. So, meeting postponed for 10 minutes.
Thank you very much and welcome back everyone to South Cambridgeshire District Council's Planning Committee. We're in the final stretch now, just two more uh, applications to consider. Um, we are up to agenda item nine members, which is page 141 of our agendas. This is um, an application that the land adjacent to 35 Bolsham Road, Linton. Uh, the proposal is an outline application for the erection of a single self-build. Um, it's the reason it's before us today is because the applicant is again South Cambridgeshire District Council um, and also the application is in contradiction to the parish council's recommendation. Um, the officer is Mr Nick Yeager. Uh, Nick, are you with us online? Good afternoon. Afternoon Nick, thank you for joining us. Um, Nick, I'm wondering if you could please let us know if there's any updates to the agenda and then if you could introduce the item for us, please. Uh, so, yeah, this is the land adjacent to 35 Bolsham Road, Linton. Um, there was an amendment on condition 11. Um, it will be split as follows. So, um, I'll read it. So, prior to the installation of new surface material in relation to the access and it, as indicated on the submitted plan, this will be submitted to and agreed within the local planning authority reason, interest of highway safety, and then it will be split and a separate condition, which will then state the access shall be minimum width of five metres for a minimum distance of five uh, metres from the nearest edge of the highway boundary. Um, this is the reason is in the interest of the highway safety again. OK, so just for clarity, that's page 151, condition 11. You're proposing yeah. to split the condition into two, um, so separating the final sentence beginning with the access shall. Is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay, thank you. Sorry, Nick, one sec. Councillor Bradman? Sorry, um, there's also the prior to the installation, not installation. We're not trying to influence it, we're trying to actually put it in. Okay, yeah, I think that's grammatical error. I think we can take that with red. Thank you. Nick, back to you. Um. Okay, I just want to check with the chair that my screen is shared correctly. Yes, we can see. Thank you. So, um, yeah, this application is brought because um, the applicant is South Cambridgeshire District Council held in section. The application is recommended approval by planning officers. Um, this application is a resubmission of application 20-05-250-OUT, which went for Development Control Committee on the 9th of the 6th, 2021. Um, so at that committee, um, it was the application was recommended for approval. However, following um, committee's recommendation, the application was then withdrawn. This was because um, the correct certificate B was not served onto the highway authority. So the correct certificate of notice was not served. Um, however, so this, this is the resubmission of that application. In other terms, it's, it's identical, um, but the correct notices have been, have been served in this application. Starting with the location plan. Um, so this is the application site located in red and those access here off, off Balsham Road. And this is 35 Balsham Road, the neighbouring property. And there is also another property, a uh, number one Rivey Way located to the north. So this is the GIS location plan. Um, this is the application site located here. Um, Neighbouring property, one uh, Ryby Close located to the north and the 35 Belsham Road located here. There's also an electronic substation located here in the site, to the corner of the site. So a bit of planning history, it, um, there was a garage and access um, which was permitted. Um, and then the application uh, last year that was reviewed at um, committee. Um, so the block plan, um, this is for all an outline of all matters reserved. Um, so 
and we do not have to assess the scale or the, or the size of the dwelling. But here is the block plan showing um, where the dwelling may or could sit. Um, the proposed access will come here. Um, this is a shared access, um, which will come shared access with number 35. And um, yeah, showing the relationships between the neighbouring properties, as so. Proposed site plan. Um, so again, the shared access will be located here. Um, there'll be two okay, um, parking spaces or proposed um, for number 35, and also an additional two spaces here for the proposed new dwelling. Community space perhaps um, would be located or, or could be located to the rear, and this area would then be a, a shared turning space. This is an indicator. Sorry, Nick, one second. I've just had a request. Are you able to act, um, activate your laser pointer rather than the mouse? It just makes it easier for us to see in the room. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yes, um, moving on. This is an indicative 3D sketch. Um, so, as mentioned, it's all matters reserved. However, this is a sketch of, of how um, a potential dwelling could sit in relationship with, with the neighbouring properties. However, this would be decided and determined at the reserve matters stage. This is Google Street View of the site. So this is this is taken from the road as as would be sat just around there where my red arrow is on the top um, corner map. And the electronic substation is located in, in this corner of the site. Um, the neighbouring property number 35 and number one are located on either side, so the, the area where the dwelling would, would be proposed would be set, set behind this, this van stretch here. And here's another photograph, um, slightly moving to the side of the site, um, and where a dwelling would be located there to the right. The access would come in using this as shared access, which would then be used um, with number 35. Here's another a photograph showing that it's moving slowly further into the site. And again, slightly further closer into the site. Um, both neighbouring properties have objected to the application on the grounds of overlooking, loss of amenity and loss of light. Um, there's these, these side windows located here on 35, and these roof lights located on, um, on number one. I think what this would be determined, the immunity relationships would be just determined and um, assessed in full at the reserve matters stage. Um, however, it's, it's considered that uh, it could, could be achieved um, at dwelling on the site. However, the scale and design would all be assessed and determined at, at the reserve matters stage. Just a further photograph going further into the site. And this is, this is coming out now of the site along Belsham Road there. Um, so uh, the Linton Parish Council and um, the neighbours have both objected. Um, one of the objections is relation to this electronic substation. Um, we have conditioned a noise report um, um, with, the, with the application to ensure that um, the uh, amenity would be protected. Um, there's been comments related to the highway matters in relation to speeding, um, which is outside, um, would be a police matter if there are speeding along along Belsham Road as such. Um, the Highway Authority have um, confirmed that the application is acceptable and the shared access would not lead to um, highway safety um, issues. Um, so it is noted that it is located on a bend. However, the Highway Authority have assessed it and consider that it, it would be acceptable. Um, yeah, there's also been um, uh, comments related to um, the ownership of the front garden. Um, this is included in the red line submitted um, with the application site. So I believe this is in the applicant's ownership and then they've also served the correct notices onto the highway authority with this resubmission on the, um, on the verge. Jaden's credit certificates have been have been signed. Council T comments um, contaminated land have, have 
said no objection. The highways have um, no objection subject to the conditions. Drainage officer also acceptable subject to disposal and surface from foul water condition and environmental health subject to the construction hours and construction management plan. The construction management plan would be to also ensure the neighbouring amenity would be protected during the construction related activities such as, um, as, as noise and dust or disturbance. So in conclusion, it's considered that the principal developer is acceptable as within the development framework of Linton, it would not exceed the housing density of the housing mix of the area. The design and location of the dwelling would be in, within the plot would be considered that the reserve matters application, as this application is for the outline of all matters are reserved. The local, local highway authority has commented on the application and there are no objections to proposal subject to conditions. Therefore, the application is recommended approval by the planning officers subject to the conditions. And that is the end of my presentation, so I will go back to the chair. Thank you very much. Great. Thank you very much for that presentation, Nick. Um, we do have a number of public speakers uh, on this item, and then I will go to the debate and can ask any questions of clarity of the officer. So the first public speaker we have uh, is a member of the public, Mr Tony Dixon, who I believe addressed us last time this application came. Tony, good afternoon. Good afternoon. Thank you. So I know you've been here before, but just to reiterate, you've got three minutes to address your comments to the committee. And then if you could just hold on for a few minutes at the end in case there's any questions that the committee have for you um, around the comments you've made. So whenever you're ready, please. Thank you. I'm also uh, representing uh, Claire Darling, who lives at 35 Bolsham Road. So we'll be splitting it between the three minutes, if that's OK. That's fine. Yep. Could we know where the speaker is speaking from? Uh, you know, is it? He's referred to the other person's residence. Where does he, he live? Does he, is he a neighbour? Tony, it's worth clarifying where you, where you actually live, where your property is. Sorry, yes, we live um, at number one, Rivey Close, uh, which is next to uh, the proposed um, dwelling. And uh, we run a childcare uh, business as well as living at the property. Um, and number 35, who I'm also representing, is um, directly adjacent to uh, the proposed um, building. OK, I'll start with uh, Claire Darlings. Uh, she still has concerns over the ownership of her front garden um, and is unsure whether they actually own the ground outside the front of their house and what issues may occur uh, when and if they wanted to buy their property. Um, her second concern um, is highway safety. Uh, and she feels that her young family would be at extreme risk um, as highways state that vehicles must enter and turn and leave the site in four gear. Uh, the only way vehicles, including lorries, plant hire, etc., could achieve this is for them to turn around right outside her front door. Uh, it states also that loading and unloading must be undertaken off the adopted highway and that contractor parking etc must be within the curtilage of site which would not be possible due to the restricted space available. Uh, the proposed site is also on a dangerous bend on a busy stretch of road and we still feel and she still feels that the extra traffic entering and leaving the site would cause a major hazard and potentially an accident uh, as the road is a primary route in and out of the village. Uh, for myself and my wife our objection relates to highway safety as well um, an inadequate parking and access whilst living and running a childcare setting next door to the proposed planning development. I'm concerned that the construction of a self build property would impact on the safety and well-being of my own family and that of the children we look after. We are extremely worried about the delivery of building materials and the parking of con construction and contractor vehicles uh, on a dangerous blind bend in the road directly opposite the proposed development site. During peak times when parents are dropping off and picking up children both in cars and on foot, this could potentially cause a serious accident or worst case scenario fatality on a busy section of the road. Uh, I have attached photographs um, to my objection which uh, illustrate this clearly um, and the loss of view uh, around the bends if anyone was happened or happened to be parked on the corner of the road. Um, the final objection we have is construction risks such as noise and dust pollution with the position of our childcare windows within close proximity uh, and they're both standard and Velux windows 
to the proposed development site, I have concerns regarding the children breathing in harmful contaminants, e.g. dust particles from cement, brick and insulation materials, in addition to the noise risk attributed to the construction vehicles and machinery could have a harmful and detrimental impact on the children's learning and well-being. Thank you for listening to our objection. Thank you very much and well under the three minutes, so thank you very much for that. Um, if you could just hold on a sec, Tony, just in case there's any questions of clarity from committee members for you around the comments. Okay. Members, do, we, do we have anything for Tony? No? Oh, sorry, one actually. Councillor Bradnam, please. Thank you. Um, could you just advise us how many children your childcare facility services? Yes, we uh, do before uh, school, like a, a breakfast club for uh, children who are dropped off at local schools, that's infants and primary. Um, and we work from 7.30 in the morning. Um, and we also look after nursery children during the day, which um, is up to 15 uh, children, nursery children. Uh, and we also do an after school club as well. So we collect children from the local schools and, and we look after the children after school as well. And that's up until uh, 6 p.m. And sorry, thank you. you. Your breakfast club deals with how many children and your after school club with how many? Um, it varies um, from day to day, but I'd say on average for uh, breakfast club, um, we can have sort of seven to eight children. Um, after school, we can have uh, 10 to 12. Thank you. Thank you. I don't think there's any further questions, so just say thank you very much for joining us and for waiting what I imagine is quite a long time to speak to us today, so I appreciate your patience on that. No problem, um, thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to move on now. We have um, two representatives from the applicant who have actually already spoken to us today. We have uh, Darren Heffer and Clara Cabello from, uh, who are representing the applicant. Darren and Clara, are you still with us? Yes, indeed. I hope you can hear me um, and hopefully you can see me as well. Yes, we can. So, yeah, as, as earlier, same rules, three minutes and then any questions of clarity, if you just hold on for those at the end, please. Thank you. Thank you very much, Chair. Uh, just to confirm that uh, Clara is no longer with us, uh, we'd just be myself speaking. Um, so, yes, Darren Heffer, Director of Saunders Boston Architects based in Cambridge. Um, we are supporting South Cam's District Council um, with this application, um, which is another site which has been identified by the Council uh, for proposed development as part of the South Build and Custom Build scheme. Um, I don't really have much further to add um, than the planning officer has already explained, other than to uh, just reinforce uh, the comment that this application did actually come to committee uh, last June and was recommended for approval. Um, it's purely the technicality of Certificate B, um, which needed to be um, issued to highways um, that has resulted in this application coming back to committee today. Um, there's been no further adjustments uh, to that application, which was recommended uh, for approval just over um, six months ago. Um, and again, just to reiterate um, that obviously this has been subject to comment from uh, Highways Authority and um, they don't have any objections to this uh, particular application, as indeed um, do none of the other statutory consultees. Um, so thank you. That was all I wish to add. Um, and um, I'll be here and happy um, to answer any further questions as they may arise. OK, that's good. We have one immediately from Councillor Bradman. Thank you, Chair. Um, thank you very much, um, Darren. Can you just advise us what would be the distance between the front wall of uh, the propo any proposed dwelling and the rear of the substation compound, roughly speaking? I appreciate this is illustrative and it's early days yet, but uh, it's just hard to understand what space there is available on the site. And also, could you advise us the width of the site, in other words, the north-south dimension? of the plot uh, at the position where the house is indicated in your design and access plan? Uh, certainly, yes. Uh, these are not exact dimensions to the millimetre, but uh, approximately. So the distance that it's set back from the uh, the current electrical substation, so moving uh, west, um, is potentially, uh, we're showing at the moment, about six to seven metres. You can see two car parking spaces side by side. 
um, which act as a buffer zone between that substation and any proposed dwellings. And then the overall site width, um, as you are um, heading in a north-south direction, um, is approximately 11 to 12 metres um, across the front of the site. Again, um, if it's possible to see the proposed layout, you'll see that there are, again, two car parking spaces, um, which are five metres long. They'll then need to be um, at least six metres for reverse space, so that gives you your 11 metres, uh, and I think there is a slight additional buffer to that as well. Um, just to stress as well, as you've uh, correctly pointed out, Councillor, that uh, obviously um, this is to establish the principle of a single property on this site at the moment and the, uh, the detailed design um, layout, massing and volume will obviously be determined by um, any reserve matters application at a, at a later date. Thank you. Thank you very much. That's really helpful. And also, could you just confirm... Um, the, the, the terms, as it were, under which this new property might be able to use the front garden of the property at 35, which I understand would be a rented property from South Cumbers District Council at present. In um, other words, sorry, is it just right of access or is it right to turn or uh, what would be the nature of that usage? Um, I, I'm afraid I can't clarify that. Um, the adjacent site is obviously uh, within the ownership of South Cams as well. Um, and um, again, there's been no objections um, from highways to the current proposals um, with the two car parking spaces that are currently shown um, in the front of that property. Perhaps that might be a question for the case officer as well during the debate. Okay, any further questions of clarification for um, Mr. Heffer? No? So, okay, well, thank you for staying with us, Mr. Heffer. And Welcome. we will now move on to the representative from the Parish Council, Councillor Kate Kell. Kate, are you still here? Hello, yes. um, hopefully you can hear me and see me all right. Yes, we can hear and see you. Um, before you start, just I did say a few words at the beginning, but you know, from the committee, sincere condolences for the loss of Councillor Enid Bald. Obviously, she usually does represent Linton Parish Council along with um, yourself and others. So, um, you know, it's going to be a great loss for the Parish Council and for Linton as a community. So, you know, just the committee wanted to pass their condolences on. Thank you. I'll do my best um, in her absence. Indeed. Um, OK, so I think you've been here before, Kate. Three minutes to address your comments to the committee, at which point they may have some questions of clarity for you afterwards. So Thank when, you. Whenever you're ready, please. Okay. Chair, councillors, thank you for inviting me to speak. I'm now the chair of the planning committee of Linton Parish Council and confirm I have their permission to speak. Linton Parish Council typically supports plans for small infill homes in our village. However, the more we look at the constraints on and around this site, the more we're convinced that it can't accommodate this proposed two story, three bedroom dwelling. In response to paragraph 30, the development proposed would not be, be reflective of this current street scene, which is approximately six metre gaps and associated clear sky between all the existing pairs of homes on this part of the road. The proposed dwelling would fill one of these spaces, so would not reflect the street. We believe elements of points 31 to 33 of the officer's report are inaccurate, especially in relation to 35 Bolsham Road. The statement that there would be no impact in regards to the loss of light is simply wrong. The ground floor windows in the side elevation of 35 Bolsham Road, clearly visible on the Google Street View, will be about two and a half metres from the side wall of the proposed new dwelling. This side wall of a two storey dwelling will be around about five metres high, plus a roof. This will cut almost all natural light to the rooms on this side. The spacing is contradictory to your district design guide, which looks for a 12 metre gap between windows and blank walls to maintain amenity and also a 45 degree upwards angle from the top of neighbouring ground floor windows to prevent loss of light and overshadowing. Whilst accepting that this layout is indicative only, where can a two storey house be moved to on this site? Move it closer to the road and you prevent the space needed for access and egress in forward gear and the need for off street parking for both this house and 35 Bolsham Road. This space is already very tight and the proximity to the blind bend and position next to a childcare setting make this space particularly important. 
move in the opposite direction and you cause total loss of light to the Velux and side windows in the childcare setting at One Rivey Close, create overlooking of private gardens to neighbouring homes and severely compromise the private amenity space to the rear of the new dwelling itself. Additional constraints include the electricity cable running across the site. No details are given, only a statement that this is something the developer will need to resolve. Given the proximity to the substation, it's perfectly feasible this could be a three-phase supply, not something that can be built over and expensive for a developer to move. Would it also need an easement for access? This is a request for outline consent for a two-storey, three-bedroom self-built home. In reality, it will be impossible to deliver such a property whilst also respecting the amenity of existing neighbours. We respectfully request that this application is therefore refused. Thank you. Thank you very much for that. And if you wouldn't mind holding on the line in case there are any questions of clarification, and we do have one from Councillor Bradnam. Thank you, Chair. Um, you referred to the Google imagery. I'm looking at April 2021. Um, thank you for your presentation, incidentally. It was very helpful. But can you clarify, on that imagery, there are one, two, three, four, five wheelie bins illustrated, and it looks like a compost um, container and a van parked in front with a white picket fence across the front. Can you just clarify, are those associated with the site itself or are those associated with a neighbouring property in your understanding? <laughs> uh, without being able to read the numbers on the fronts of the bins or sides of the bins, uh, I'd imagine... Um, I, I, actually, I honestly don't know the answer to your question, but I suspect they may belong to number 35, um, but I would not wish to misrepresent that. I've just zoomed in and it says number 35 on them. Thank you very much. That's helpful. That, that's all. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Members, any further questions or clarity for the parish councillor? Councillor Hawkins, please. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you for your presentation. Um, I knew there was something familiar that I'd missed. You mentioned the uh, electricity cable. Can you describe roughly where it goes across the, the site? Um, it's something, again, I'm afraid I can't answer. The only thing I do know is that when the development was done, in, and in fact, if, um, if the neighbour at One Rybe Close is still available, he may have a better understanding um, than I do. Um, but a cable was found whilst they were doing um, the work for yep. either the extension or their fence. Um, in fact, I spoke to the, the resident of 35 um, Bolsham Road today and uh, another cable has been found almost directly underneath the fence line um, that is running up the side of 35 Bolsham Road, um, which they didn't know was there. She had a, a water leak and it needed fixing. So it's entirely possible that there are multiple cables running under the site. I don't believe any um, survey or request to the um, electricity board has been made for locations, etc. Um, That's so it. Thanks, thank you. <laughs> Okay, thank you very much. Um, I think those are all the questions of clarification. Oh, sorry, I'm speaking too soon. Councillor Bradman. Sorry, it's a very good point. Given that it's a substation, there's a great likelihood of cables running through this site, isn't there? I would, I would imagine. Okay. Yep. Okay, thank you. I think that's uh, everything for yourself, uh, Kate. So thank you very much for holding on until quarter to four. Appreciate your, your patience. Um, and... I think I believe that concludes the public speakers that we have on this item. Um, I am one of the local members for Linton, but I'm going to reserve my comments for the debate, which we are now going to move into. So obviously we do have an opportunity now to ask any questions of clarity of the officer as well. And opening the debate is Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I, when I was looking at this, I did look back at what we'd said in the previous um, application that we judged in June because we're always told about the consistency and consistency is important and um, we're told it, it's like for like I, um, and I can understand why that description has been given but when you go back through it on the previous one in June it was a dwelling there wasn't any size that I, I can go through um, and I'm recalling back to what my thought was in that decision making process that this is a new application but I'm talking for consistency purposes. 
was that you could squeeze a very, very tiny, tiny dwelling in there, sort of thinking it'd be like a one bed or something like that. We do now have a bedroom specification in this application in front of us um, that says a three bed housing. And looking at um, the imagery that shows how narrow it gets to the rear of the property, um, I, I do feel that a three bedroom house in that location it is um, it isn't it is over development if it gets into that point. Um, a three bedroom house is obviously you know quite sizable. Um, so and I appreciate there probably is plenty of of power cable issues. Just as if you develop an army barracks, you're going to have a, find a lot of unexploded bombs. Um, but I don't know if that's a planning consideration that we can take into consideration. Mr. Blaisby and Mr. Reed will will guide us on that. But putting that to one side, um, I think the three bed in that in it's just it doesn't doesn't fit. Um, not in any way that would actually enable people that lived there to have a decent quality of life. Um, in that respect, you know, the rear garden, which would be their only privacy, would have to be almost entirely lost. Um, so it's also taking that into consideration, Chair, that if we did put three or someone put three bedrooms in there to make them habitable, you're going to lose everything else. That's my thoughts, Chair. Thank you very much. Um, our next speaker is actually myself. So these are my my comments on the application, um, as Councillor Williams indicated, this has come to us before, and uh, my concerns are still the same now as they were back then. And that is around the principle of developing a three-bed property on this piece of land. I don't believe um, it will. I don't believe that the principle is there, and I don't agree with it. Um, I think the impact on the residential amenity of both neighbours, 35 Bolsham Road and one Rivey Close, will be neg too negatively impacted to outweigh the the, the benefit of this application. And to a lesser extent, I think the highway safety issues, which I appreciate can or have been requested to be conditioned out, um, are also of concern to me, albeit on a lesser extent to the first two points. So for me personally, my view hasn't changed uh, from last June, so I will be voting against unless I hear some strong arguments the other way. Um, Councillor Roberts, please. Thank you, Chairman. Um, a bijou residence may well fit in there, a very small residence, one bedroom, um, as Councillor Williams has said, but this is too big. And I think the, there is a reason that this plot wasn't developed by ourselves, along with the rest of the line, in that it is too small and that there is the possibility of those electricity cables, etc. Um, I don't think it particularly uh, affects my thinking about the... Um, the arguments that put about the nursery, I think that's just a, a side issue. But I think that the main issue here is that uh, this is just too big um, and it won't fit in. And I think it will cause difficulties. I think it's going to cause difficulties with parking. Certainly, there's going to be huge difficulties if it was um, in the development of it. So I think it's a no-go. I think it's also very disappointing. And I'm not quite sure why this is happening. Um, when we own land ourselves, so we haven't got the cost of the land, it is a little bit beyond my understanding why we are selling them off to other people instead of developing themselves with a guarantee that they are actually for people, for rental accommodation, which we so desperately need in this district. So desperately need. Thank you, Councillor. Uh, Councillor Richard Williams, please. Take you don't have a lot of luck to take. No. Anyway, thank you, Chair. Um, I was waiting for it this time. Um, I, I, I actually share um, the comments that the Chair um, has, has, has put forward. Um, but but I, so I won't repeat all of those, but too big, too small plot. Um, there were two points, though, I, just, I, I did just want to raise. One is about the garden that we're going to take, or this application would take, from 35. Mm. And now that, as I think we've been told, properties in the ownership of South Cam's District Council, but presumably that is let. Mm. So I, I would like some clarification that it would even be possible to take that garden when it, it sounds like that property is, is already subject to a lease. Um, 
I will leave aside the issue of whether the district council should be doing that because that's not a planning matter. The other thing, like I have, a, I have a strange feeling of deja vu that I may have raised this in relation to the last application, is policy H16, development of residential gardens, the development of land used or last used as a residential garden for new dwellings will only be permitted where blah, 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 blah. That policy isn't referenced again in this. And I seem to remember at some point the argument was made by somebody in, in a previous committee that, oh, well, that policy only applies to reserved matters. There's nothing in that policy that says it should only apply to reserved matters. There are clearly things in that policy that are material to this application. Um, and I don't really understand why that policy is not being um, cited or, or looked at, given that this clearly the last use of this would seem to have been a, a residential garden. Thank you. So I think there are two points of um, Google Maps. It, it's two points of clarification there. I think no, no, the site. one was around the um, the use being able to currently use the garden, um, given the fact it is already a residential garden for a property. And the second question was around whether it is in contravention of policy H16 development within residential gardens. Um, Nick, I don't know if you can pick up those two questions. Can you? On the first point, I can say um, the uh, with ownership and use of, of, I presume, referring to the front garden, um, is that um, the red line is, is, is drawn and the applicant has, has stated as it's in their ownership. Um, I believe, believe the other matters of, of, of ownership and at least is, is outside the planning system. Um, and, and, yeah, and, and therefore, not more part of the assessment as, as this stage. Um, with regards to, to H16, um, uh, I, um, development of, of residential gardens. Um, I, I, I wasn't, I didn't take this to the last committee, but um, I, I, yeah, I'm not sure um, personally. I'd welcome any other thoughts from, from your, the officers on that. One second, Nick, we're just discussing yeah. internally. Uh, I'm being asked, is Julie Air, Julie Air on the line? I don't think so. Okay, we're going to have to come back on that point around policy H16. Officers are just going to look into it. But in the, in the interim, Councillor Daunton. Chair, might I just ask that they put on the screen, or the planning officer puts on the screen, the image of the site that we're talking about. It's referred to the red line. I think it would be very helpful to see that. If you have the, the, the floor plan, Nick, with the red line showing. Chair, if I could just clarify, which, which might help officers looking into this. The, the, the point I was relying on, though, was last use as a residential garden. We were shown a couple of pictures which appeared to show things on that plot of land that seemed to be related to number 35. And we were also shown an ownership um, map, and there was no line between what is now 35 and that new site. So it looked very much to me like it's last use. There may be a, a fence there now, but it's last use before that it seemed to be as an integral part of 35 as part of the garden. So that's why I wondered, that's why I was drawn attention to that policy. That's, that's a fair comment. I think officers are looking into it as we speak. Councillor Dawson. Sorry, if we could see the photograph showing the white fence that Councillor Richard Williams has just referred to, that might help. Yeah, okay. Nick. Can we see that closer up? Yeah, thanks. That, that's good. That's good. Thank you. So, one second, everyone. Um, we're just going to get some officer input on policy H16, conversion of residential gardens. Nigel. Yeah, thank you, Chair. I think it all, it all hinges on whether or not this land for the site did form part of a residential garden. If it did form part of a residential garden, then policy H16 is relevant. If it's not, um, then it is not relevant. And that's, that would be my view. Thank you. Yeah. That's the question. And I don't know whether Nick could help us with that. 
Nick, can you help us with that definition as to whether it was a garden previously? I mean, as someone who's lived in Linton, I know it, I'm certain it was, but if we could get some officer clarification on that, that'd be handy. Um, as, as such, um, and, and the boundaries are clearly shown. Um, so, I think if you could go back one, Nick, that might be the photo that might help us. That one. Hmm. So I think we're behind that VW. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Yes, Councillor Bradman, please. The reason I asked the um, chair of the parish planning committee, um, whose bins those were, is because I suspect this has never been part of the garden of 35. I, I, I hear what you say, but um, I believe it was probably always reserved land because of the substation. And I think the owner of 35 has parked vehicles and parked their vans on it. The matter of ownership does not affect us as this committee. All I'm saying is I think this plot of land would always have been reserved and not part of the garden of 35 because of the, because of the substation and there must be cables underneath. So my concern is that um, the, the, pro the problematic nature of building on the site, but the, the thing I wanted to clarify was, um, oh gosh, has escaped me. Yes, the amenity of the existing dwellings. I think, that, I think the whole problem lies with the fact that the, the proposal that we have in front of us is too big a plan for a small site. Also, it's right on the corner of the two um, roads, and I think it would be quite dangerous. Also, the other issue I have is um, the resulting loss of amenity to the front garden of 35, which currently is shown in all the Google imagery as a, as a, a, a mowed grass lawn. Um, now, that may not be what it is now. We know that Google imagery goes out of date. But the point is that that still is, we still have to preserve the amenity of the building of number 35, which is on, in our ownership. We can't just um, do that without consideration. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I did see the neighbor was trying to indicate to speak, perhaps Tony, or if you can speak on behalf of Claire, you might be able to clear up the garden issue. Uh, yes, we've lived uh, number one, Rivey Close, for over 20 years. And uh, originally, uh, that it, it was the garden of, of number 35. So um, when um, he passed away, um, a fence was erected um, uh, through the garden. Was the whole of that garden belonged to number 35. Okay. Uh, sorry, I'm losing you. Um, I've been there 20 years and that was 20 years uh, or as long as we lived here, it belonged to number 35, it was a garden. I think the question was around how long has the fence been there? Hello, did you catch that? Yeah, sorry, I, the, the question was around how long the fence has been in place. Okay. Um, the, the fence has yes. two years since the own, previous owner passed away. Okay, I understand. Yeah, just two years since the previous owner was... Uh, yeah. Chairman, so in order to provide us with a self-built plot. Yeah, so I think that it has been used as a garden until two years prior. Thank you. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. I was just going to say, in relation to the front bit, um, it's quite clear that, that the front area is still being used as a garden. And also where that driveway section is, if you look 
at the other place, um, the semi-detached on the other side, the grass goes up to the edge of the building and then there is parking alongside. So if you, if you look at it, it, that part and that track, you've got the footpath and then sort of a, a double wheeling slabs, that must relate to number 35 because if not, they've got no parking and the grass mirrors the other side. So even if you just look at it from plainly, maybe not the rear because the fence has gone up, but the front area is used and is part, in, in my mind, that's quite clear, is part of the garden of 35. Um, and what was said about the, the servicing of the power station, obviously there is a contained area for that anyway. Um, so I would suggest that it's still being used as a garden at the front, therefore it would any changes to that would be change of use, surely, from residential. I'm being sh shook a head at. So we've got something that is a residential garden, always been used as a residential garden, but we can't use planning policy on residential garden. If we weren't uh, bamboozled enough on the last application, I think we are now. Okay, well, hopefully, Mr. Blade is going to shed some light onto this for us. Um, yes, members, I just wanted to take members through the policy. Um, if we if we take the view now that policy H16 is relevant for consideration, um, so what H16 says is development of land used or last used as residential gardens for new dwellings will only be permitted. Okay. Sorry. Okay. So policy H16 says the development of land used or last used as residential gardens for new dwellings will only be permitted where. And A, the development is a one-for-one -one replacement, which it clearly isn't. Or, and then there are um, some criteria. So I'm just going to go through the criteria because I think where I'm going with this is we, we I think we have addressed all of the criteria already in the re in the report. So although the report is lacking the consideration of this policy, I think we have dealt with them. But I'll, I'll go through them. So, um, so there would be. So where there would be no significant harm to the local area, taking account of the character of the local area. I think we've addressed that in the, in the report. The second one is any direct and ongoing impacts on the residential amenity of nearby properties. Again, I believe that is addressed in the report. Third one is the proposed siting, design, scale and materials of construction of the buildings. All those are going to be reserved matters that... Um, that we, 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 we don't know any of those details at the moment. So the next one is the existence of or ability to create a safe vehicular access. We can see where the point of access is, or, although access again is a reserved matter. The provision of adequate on-site parking or the existence of safe, convenient and adequate existing on-street parking. Um, Nick, could I have your views on whether or not you, you feel we've addressed that sufficiently in the report? And if we've uh, addressed the sufficient of on street park, on street and off street park. Okay. Um, the next is the setting of listed buildings, which we are not, or, or character of conservation area, which we, is not relevant here. Um, any impacts on biodiversity and important trees? And again, Nick, I'd ask you to comment on that, please. Um, the application site um, doesn't appear to have um, any impact on in, any important trees or there would be. Which we've had to, um, yeah, there wouldn't be any harm to biodiversity. Okay, thank you. And the last criteria is ensuring that the form of development would not prevent the development of adjoining sites. Um, and Nick, would you comment on that, please? I, I don't believe it would um, harm the um, prevent the adjoining sites. So, so, members, I hope that's helpful. But that's that's my assessment of that policy and how we. We, we might have dealt with it if, if we had um, included it in the report. And I'm satisfied that, I, that actually the report, what, and including what you've heard here, has adequately addressed the criteria in that policy. Thank you. Okay. Yeah, I mean, presumably it's up to the committee whether they choose to yes. include policy H16 as a reason for refusal should they go down that route. Um, but obviously we've had the officer's advice on that. Um, I've got three more speakers on this item, uh, starting with Councillor Wilson. Please. Thank you. Um, I, I've been looking at the area plan, the plan of the, the site, 
and um, the two parking spaces um, assigned to the what would be the new dwelling and two parking spaces at the front of number 35 but it all feels very awkward and I can't see how that could function in a in an efficient way for, for both both um, if they're families but both both dwellings so I, I feel like that that isn't um, really 100% feasible. Okay, thank you, Councillor. And I've got Richard Williams. I don't know if that was for a previous point. Okay, and Councillor Hawkins. Again, I don't know if this was relating to a previous point, but I've got you down to speak. Not, 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 not essential. Uh, sorry, Chair. I wanted to check with the case officer. Um, the distances between the proposed building and the neighbouring buildings, and whether or not it conforms to our district design guide. Thank you. Nick, some clarity on distances, please. We are muted. We're muted, Nick. Um, the design and the scale will be assessed at the um, Matthew State. Um, and so um, we will have to control whether we will, um, uh, um, it will um, be accordance with, with the, the design guide as such when we, when we do assess the design and the scale at that stage. Thank you. Yeah, sorry, I, well, for one, I didn't um, fully understand the answer there. I think the question was, uh, does, in terms of conforming with the district design guide, albeit it's a guide, I think the question from Councillor Hawkins was, does this proposal conform or not? Yes, yeah, we do, we do believe it um, conforms with it. Are you researching the answer, Nick? <laughs> I'm not sure. <laughs> no. So, Chair, just, yeah, it's just if I may come back, it seems to me that the distances between the proposed location of this uh, potential bill and the neighbouring properties is too close to for me to be um, uh, within our guidelines, which is what I wanted to check those numbers. And if it doesn't meet that now, the only way it's going to meet it is if this, the building is right back in the plot. <laughs> so um, unless we are sure that we can meet those guidelines, then that's another reason, I think, um, that this is not a suitable place to be put in a building. Whether, whether it is a single or two-story. Two-story just, for me, means that they will be overlooking. No, understood. And uh, I'm hoping Nick's looking up as to whether it does conform with uh, spacing in the design guide at the moment. Um, but in the interim, we do have one more speaker, Councillor Khan, online. I just wanted to make a single comment, uh, a couple of comments. Uh, obviously, uh, um, online I can't vote, but I wanted to make a couple of comments about the proximity and the windows and overlooking. The window in number 35 is a ground floor window, part of which is in the extension. What I don't know, and which I don't know whether the, we've got information on that, is whether that ex rear extension is part of an extended kitchen uh, with a window on the other side, in which case the, um, there would not be a problem of light because it will be provided. If, if there isn't, then there might be because it's very close and it's a north facing window and, um, uh, 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 and it would have effect, effects on light. But if there is, then the, the, it's irrelevant. The, 
the, oh, looking is hardly re relevant because it's on the ground floor. You can put a fence up quite close by. Um, but uh, having a two-story dwelling at that location would have, could create a, a, a very dark if that's the only light. So that, that that's a comment I would make, and I don't have the information, but it might be something you might want to con con consider. Um, on the other side, in terms of number one, really, really close. Uh, I, I this is a roof, the roof lights. Um, it's a south-facing roof. I, I I think you in the slope of a roof. I think you're going to get adequate light. Not that's not going to be a problem of, uh, of light or, or of overlooking. So um, that's where I can see the uh, the concern that still arises. In terms of um, uh, parking, I agree that the parking in front of number 35 is uh, likely to create an impact, um, uh, and whether that's sufficient to turn down, will be sufficient to turn down the development, I don't know. Um, since I'm not going to vote on it, I'm be able to vote on it, I wouldn't like to draw a conclusion, but it, it is, I would think, unsatisfactory. But I, I would have thought that some form of management in terms of ownership and, and rights of access over it would mean that it's practical, whether it's desirable is another question. Okay, thank you. Um, I think that's the end of speakers in the debate. So I'm not sure if we did get a response on the um, on the issue around the design guide, but I think still trying to find out. Still trying to find out. But in the meanwhile, Mr. Reed wants to weigh in. Um, if we look at um, paragraph three on page one four two, although uh, it's suggested that the application is a resubmission of an earlier application and that in, on that occasion the committee recommended the application for approval. Uh, it's not correct to say the resubmission is otherwise identical. This picks up a point that Councillor Heather Williams made because the application under 2005250 was an outline application for the erection of a single self-build dwelling with all matters reserved. Here, there's a material difference insofar as we've, we're one saying it's two-story, which may give rise uh, if members are satisfied to a question of overlooking. It specifies the number of bedrooms, which um, I think the point Councillor Heather Williams was making was that you might be able to get a a one bed single dwelling on the plot w without giving rise to the issues that arise in relation to a two story three bed unit. So I think it is important to just correct that there is a, to my mind, a material difference between what members uh, uh, approved last time and what they're being asked to uh, approve now. I raise that because Mr. Blaisby um, um, pointed out that uh, if you had approved what you're now being asked to approve last time, uh, there would, to my mind, be an issue of consistency and you would have to establish very clear reasons as to why uh, you were satisfied that there was a material change which justified taking a different ap approach to the one you adopted last time. That's not the case. Here, you're looking at a very different uh, animal than the one you approved last time. I hope that's helpful. Yeah, and of course, you know, we judge each application on its own merits, whether it's a resubmission or not. Um, Mr. Blaisby. Thank you, Chair. Um, I don't wish to muddy the waters, but I just wanted to make one, one point just so that we're absolutely clear. Um, the, the description has changed from before, and it now includes the words two-story, three-bedroom, five-person within the description. But, but actually, it, the resulting planning commission did not include a condition that either required the development to comply with parameter plans on the outline, or a condition to require that the development would be a two-story, three-bedroom, five-person dwelling. Then in my view, the size of the resultant dwelling is entirely up to the consideration of the reserve matters application. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> I'm not sure where Sorry. to go with that. But of course, a flurry of questions will come from that, I'm sure. Councillor Bradnam. Thank you. So, could I just seek clarification then? <clears throat> if uh, the, and I haven't gone back to the wording, but I'm, we're, we're told that 
it was a more general description. Excuse me. <coughs> Whereas this is specific and it says, yes, it's an outline, but it's for the erection of a described property, two-storey, three-bedroom, five-person. Now, if we, would, if we were to give approval for that, that is what we would expect to be built. We wouldn't expect them to go back to something smaller or more modest. So, um, <clears throat> whereas if we had approved something that indicated a smaller property, do, do you see what I mean? We ha what we have, the chair is absolutely right. We've, we, we have this application in front of us and it defines a single self-build, two-storey, three-bedroom property. So that is, the ma that is the matter on which we're making our decision today. If we don't think the plot is big enough, then people can say no. But, but in, I appreciate this is an outline, but we know that once an outline is set and it's approved, then that is what we'll be built to. Am I right? Yeah, in, for my view, yes, it's very prescriptive as to what we're being asked to judge today, but I'm sure Mr. Blaisby will come in. Thank you, Chair. I mean, that is clearly the intention. I mean, it, there's no question about that. That is the intention of the application. I think my response was on a sort of technical point, really, because it's an outline application with all matters reserved, that, that includes the scale, the appearance, the layout, etc. that if an applicant came forward um, with a three-bedroom dwelling of two-storey and members did not did not wish to approve that, then you would be you would be entitled to come to that view. Really, that was my point. But I do also accept the point that that is the clear intention behind the application. Yeah. Okay. Sorry, I, I think <laughs> members just need to be clarified. If if an application was uh, 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 approved, are you saying that it wouldn't be open to the applicant to then come forward uh, and put a reserve matters application for a one-bedroom unit, contrary to the description in the application proposal? Yeah. There, there's, there's a difference of view, I'm afraid, between the legal officer and the chief planning officer. I'm, I'm of the view that um, uh, it would not be it, it would it would not be open to the applicant to reduce the number of bedrooms or the story height because you've approved an application which is specifically for two stories and three bedrooms. You're not approving a one story one bedroom. No, I think. Okay, I think we're going in circles a bit here. I think one final point from Councillor Williams, and I think we're probably ready to have a vote on it. Chair, mine is an attempt to move us on to a vote. Um, while respecting both of our officers and, you know, not wanting to look like parents choosing between their children as to who they favour, um, I, I have to say I'm inclined to um, give weight to the comments made by Mr Reid. I, I do see this as an application for a two-storey, three-bedroom house um, as outline. Um, I appreciate the comments, Mr. Blaisby, that you've said, but I also would say, actually, what was made clear from us as members, um, and because I've got not much else in my life, obviously, than planning, I can remember and call the application. What I said was, yes, you could get a single, very, very small dwelling on there, and did, we did debate the size of what could fit, and it was small, which I would not class a three-bedroom house as small, um, and I, I do believe I did follow it up and saying, but I hope that these plans never come to fruition and it never gets used. Um, so, uh, so yes, um, I think if that helps to, to reassure Mr. Blaisby that in the debate that we had in June, we did discuss the size and that it would have to be a small one. So that may give a little caveat to um, help support things. Sure. No, I appreciate the assistance there. So members, I think we've... Uh, had a good debate on this one, even at the top table up here. So I think we're probably, I think we're at a stage where we can make a decision on this. Um, members, the concerns that I've uh, heard and written down that are material, highway safety and parking provision, residential amenity, principle of development, and the only other question mark is whether we should include this or not is the contravention of policy H16, which revolves around uh, development of residential gardens. Um, sort of opening up to see whether people want to have that included or not. Um, does it, okay, does anyone not wish to have that included as a reason for refusal? Okay, Nigel's going to come back in. Uh, thank you, thank you, Chair. I just, I would just ask um, that I think it would be helpful if we could understand which part of H16 it, it breaches. Um, 
that would be helpful to understand. Could we refer to the document that I'm looking at, which I've had a bit of a struggle finding it. The district design guide, are we allowed to use that? Because in infill development it says at 5.60 in, I'm not quite sure which chapter I'm in, but um, it refers to infill plots are small scale plots within existing developed areas and will always have a significant impact on the character of the established streetscape and on neighbouring properties. Therefore, good design is essential to ensure a positive impact is achieved. Infill sites will be expected to complement the street pattern by continuity of form and design or by an appropriate contemporary contrast. They will be expected to make best use of the site while enhancing the rhythm of established street pattern. To retain the character of villages, it's appropriate to retain some vacant plots. I don't suppose that's any help whatsoever, but I did find it. Okay, uh, Councillor Williams. Uh, just on H16, um, I would cite H16B2, direct and ongoing impacts on residential amenity of neighbourhood properties. And M3. M3, yeah. Although we don't know about material construction, do we? Okay, so that's, that's policy H16 points B2 and B3. Yes, one last comment. Uh, thank you, Chair. The, the, the other um, reason that I heard was highway safety. So you would be making that um, decision contrary to the advice of the local highways authority, and there are risks involved with that. Okay. Members, was it highway safety or parking provision we had the most concern with? Was it just parking provision? I'm seeing some nods. Yeah, so I think not, not highway safety, but parking provision was a concern. Okay, members, so the updated look reasons for refusal that I've heard, parking provision, residential amenity, the principle of the development, and contravention of policy H16, points B2 and 3. Okay, I think we're finally there. Okay, members, I think to avoid any confusion, let's have an electronic vote. Um, just to avoid any confusion, uh, Aaron, could you set that up, please? So, members, the recommendation is to approve, so if you agree with that, press green for approval, press red for refusal, and yellow to abstain. Really and I think we can see the results on the on the uh, on the screen up there. So that's nine refusals, no approvals, and zero abstentions. So that is unanimously refused. Thank you very much, everyone. We I thought that would be a fairly quick one, but uh, you can live in hope, can't you? But <laughs> thanks very much. Okay, members, we have one more, and it's four thirty almost. So I'm going to move straight on to it. It's agenda item ten, page one five three of our agendas. Uh, it's an application at 19 Foxton Road, Barrington. The applicant is Mr. Daniel Ostheimer. The proposal is for a loft conversion, and the reason it's before us is because the applicant is employed my Greater Cambridge Planning Service, which I think should be by, <laughs> and the officer is Mr. Nick Yeager. Uh, Nick, if you'd like to rejoin us and present the report, please. Councillor Bradham, can switch your mic off, please? So, um, this is uh, yeah, an application for a loft conversion at 19 Foxton Road, Barrington. And this application is brought before the um, committee because the applicant wife is employed by the Greater Cambridge Planning Service. This application is recommended for approval by planning officers. So, this is the application site. This is a semi detached bungalow located here. And there's, either, um, there's a detached property located to the left and a semi, and a, um, sorry, a semi detached property located to the left attached property located to the right. Um, so this application site is located within the de development framework, um, as shown with this dash line located here. Um, it's not located within a conservation area, which is shown by this um, pink line, and there is sufficient distance from it, this building which is located all over here. So um, this is um, the proposed plans are essentially to create um, from the bungalow is to create a single, well, a front dormer facing here and two roof lights. And then there's two rear facing dormer windows here. 
Um, these are the existing floor plans. So currently it's a three bedroom bungalow, a sitting dining room area, kitchen and bathroom, a hall en suite. And these are the elevations. So the bungalow does have an extension which, which comes up here or extended area to the back. And that's its area on the front. So these are the proposed plans. Um, so the loft conversion will create another bedroom study uh, whoops, and um, a shower area here. Both elevations, so you'll have a front facing dormer here, two roof lights and two rear dormers here. This is the application site. I'm just looking here. There's going to be a front dormer window located roughly here in the two roof lights. It's a neighbouring property located there. Some more shots of some of the application site. Facing dormer here. Two roof lights. And this is looking back on on the, the access to the private driveway here. Well, the, driveway here. Um, this is the rear of the property, so where the, the dormer windows would be located. Here. Further shots of the, of the amenity space to the rear. And this is a shot looking, looking back towards the neighbouring property. A wider shot of the site. So the Barrington Parish Council would have recommended approval. Um, 49A marked house way objecting to the proposal today um, due to the grounds of privacy and overlooking of the front dormer. Um, front dormer window would be located here. Um, this is at an approximate distance of um, 15 metres from, from this boundary located here. It's also noted that this front, the front dormer window that would be behind the tree located there is also of a non-habitable room. Therefore, we um, feel that the um, impacts would not lead to significant harm to of overlooking that would warrant a refusal of the application. Located in the development framework of Barrington, the loft conversion will not lead to material harm to the over character of the area, the design and context of the host dwelling. Considered the loft conversion will not lead harm to the neighbouring amenity, um, is therefore considered compliant with S7 and HQ1 of the South Cambridgeshire Local Plan 2018. Thank you. After that, I'll go back to the chair. Thank you very much. Thank you, Nick, for that. Um, members, before we move on to anything else, I've been reminded that we've been carrying, continuing for more than four hours now, so we need to have a vote on whether to continue. Uh, as we're right at the end, I suggest we do carry on. Um, so, can everyone agree? Thank you very much. Um, members, we don't have any public speakers on this, so I'm going to launch it straight into the debate. I think Councillor Bradnam was first, then Councillor Roberts. Thank you. Um, it's one of those things that very often the applications that we receive from um, uh, employees of the Greater Cambridge Planning Service are often very well presented to us, and thank you to the officer. Um, the only potential objection I can see from the neighbour, which they've raised at 49A, is the potential for overlooking. But given that they have uh, what looks like a six or seven foot fence between their property and it looks like a ground floor window and the property anyway, and the only, um, the only thing that's between the, the front edge of their house and their fence, is a small strip of grass and a path, by the look of it, on imagery that comes from apparently 2022. I, and, and they don't have any dormer windows themselves in their um, roof. I, I think there's no problem whatsoever, and I have no objection to this application, and uh, I support the uh, officer recommendation for approval. Great. Thank you very much. Councillor Roberts. Uh, Yes, thank you, Chairman. Um, Chairman, through you, could Nick just put on the photograph that would show us the house in um, in Malthouse Way, please, in in where its location is, with regard. Yes, yes certainly. Um, so the objection comes from this this property located in front of the dwelling here. I can just 
I go and I can get this component slide, I can show you some photos should hopefully be coming slightly larger for yourself. So the objection came from that the thought that this front dormer window um, would... Nick, would Nick yeah. can I just stop a second and, and ask you, is Malt House Lane 1 the one to the far left with the, um, the uh, lights in the wind, in the, on the roof? Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, but uh, to the left, to the left of the uh, photograph, is that Malthouse Way? Is that the one that we're talking about? Yes, yeah, yes, yeah, yeah. That's the one we're talking about. Well, it is a distance, isn't it? Yeah, I don't, I, I, I'm like Councillor Bradnam. I don't have a problem with it. Superb, uh, members. Does anyone wish to raise any uh, additional concerns to this that might uh, want them to refuse the application? No, I don't see any. So, members, can I take it then that we can just move to the recommendation, which is to approve and agree that by affirmation? Agreed. 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 For clarity, anyone wish to refuse or abstain? No, so that's... Sorry. Oh. Okay, and, okay, so Councillor Heather Williams needs to be marked as an abstention if she isn't present in the room. But other than that, it's unanimous from those present. Thank you very much, Nick. So, members, we move on to now agenda item 11, which is a provisional TPO. Uh, this is on page 161 of our agendas. Uh, it's beside Bourne Brook, situated southwest of Westfield Farm, Comberton. Uh, it's, be it's before us today because it is required under the council scheme of delegation. The presenting officer is Mr. Jay Patel, who I see on the screen now. Jay, good afternoon. Good afternoon to you. Okay, uh, I'll just confirm you can see my screen. I can see you, yes. Okay. I can't see your screen, we can see you. Okay, we can see your screen now. Great, I'll make a start. I'll have to repeat some of what you already said. <laughs> okay, the proposal is to serve a TPO on a woodland in the interest of public amenity for its contribution to conservation and canopy cover. Local planning authorities can issue a tree preservation order where it appears to them expedient in the interest of amenity to make provision for the preservation of trees or woodlands in the area. TPO can be initiated either by the local authority or by request of another party. This request came from, another th from a third party. In accordance with the council's constitution, the request to serve a non-emergency provisional tree preservation order comes before the planning committee. The location concerned is within a woodland. The woodland is located on the banks of Bourne Brook, which is here. Uh, it encompasses two parish councils, Cumberton here and Little Everston there. The brook itself provides a natural boundary between the two parishes. Assessment of the TPO, the key consideration for the local authority is, is it expedient in the interest of amenity to make provision for the preservation of trees or woodland in the area? Amenity is not defined in law, and therefore it is left for local authorities to exercise their judgment. The trees must have a reasonable health, visibility, and individually or collectively have a wider impact. Other factors may be considered such as importance to nature conservation, response to climate change, but only if the trees achieve the basic qualifying factors. The basic qualifying factors in this case are met as the trees within the woodland seem to be in good health and contribute greatly to the wider landscape. They can be seen at a distance from Combaton Bridge and along the road leading to the bridge. That's the trees there. They can be seen much clearer from the public right of way nearby, which is here on pink, public right of way going all the way along here. There's also an old railway track that runs past the woodland. The track is here and is used by local people regularly. The location of the trees woodland is here and that's the Bourne Brook going along. Uh, the picture you already saw was taken from the bridge here. I've got a couple of pictures from our site visit that shows you slightly better picture of the trees. Uh, this is the railway track here uh, and uh, pictures of the trees are there, black poplars. 
Other qualifying factors in this case are the woodland consists of a variety of tree species and includes black poplar trees, which are one of Britain's rarest trees. This species is recognised in the Cambridge Biodiversity Action Plan. This is not a statutory designation, however, it must be considered within the planning system. Bornbrook is undesignated, but it is home to the abundance of waterfowl, ot and otter. These are statutory protected species. Preserving their habitat is helpful to their continued presence. The site is also within the range of Evanston and Wimpole Woods Special Area of Conservation. This is an internationally important site designated for its maternity roosts of the rare barbestal bat. Wooded river corridors are a prime hunting and community uh, hab uh, commuting habitat rather for such species, species. And therefore the protection of such habitat could contribute to the conservation of statutory protected species. So to conclude then, the proposal is to serve a provisional woodland TPO on those with an, interested, with an interest in the land and invite those parties an opportunity to submit objections, com comments or representations. The responses will be considered and add the decision to amend, confirm or not to confirm the order. The formal consultation starts when the provisional TPO is served. Should the decision be taken to confirm the order, it will return to the planning committee to request that the order be confirmed. Recommendation, the tree officer recommends that the committee approves the issuing of this non-emergency provisional woodland TPO. Jay, thank you very much for that, uh, that introduction. Um, members, do we have any questions or, or comments or need for debate on this? Councillor Roberts. Just a very quick one, uh, Joe. Um, Will it be, if we say yes now, and I think, you know, it's, it seems to me a really important site and a really important reason, and I'm concerned that we make sure that we act quickly, will it be served immediately, this uh, withholding order, please? Uh, we will try and serve it ne next week, although it wasn't my top priority, although we brought it to committee, it wasn't top priority because it's not an emergency order. I've got about three or four others to do before this one, because emergency ones, we can just go, we've got permission from the committee to go and do it, planning committee to go and do it. But as far as these ones are concerned, we normally take our time with this, because they go in priority order of, uh, behind, the non behind the emergency ones. But I will try and get it out next week sometime. Thanks, Joe, for that. Can I just ask a follow-up question, Chairman, on that? Um, given that obviously a third party has expressed concerns, is there any indication that there's activity going on that could be destructive at this moment in time? Well, this request was received uh, sometime October last year. We're just getting around to it now. Um, and um, the, when they put the request in, they didn't tell us it was, it was any, there was any threat to those trees at all. And that's why we considered it as a non-emergency order. And that's why it took so long. Thank you very much, Joe. That's very explaining. Thank you, Jay. Okay. Uh, we have two more questions for you, please. Councillor Fain first. Question, quick question for you. If we were not to um, pass this order, to what extent would these woodlands be protected by the need for a thudding licence <coughs> and indeed by the protection given by inclusion within an SAC? Okay, uh, within the SSC, I don't know, they'd have to put a planning permission that they've got to do something, uh, and that would be taken into consideration by the planning, uh, by the planners. However, woodland by, by themselves are protected. Woodlands are protected because if somebody wants to do any work on the woodlands, they should go to the Forestry Commission for permission. So this is just an extra layer uh, of protection for these trees. So just to say that Forestry Commission, if you own a woodland, you're allowed to take so much every quarter. I don't know exactly how much because I'm not the tree officer, but they're allowed to fell so many trees within a forest. Okay. Thank you, Jay, for that clarity. Councillor Bradman, please. I'm sorry, it's not a matter of clarification. I, I think this is entirely sensible. Uh, we know, don't we, that um, I have known myself, 
trees to be felled before anything's been done. So I would very much welcome this, and I, I propose uh, I, to approve it. Thank you very much. Uh, we've got one more speaker, Councillor Khan, and then I think we can go to a decision on this. Um, the, uh, uh, I think see plenty of amenity arguments in favour of this. But I just wanted to question whether you would actually check with the um, nature, uh, with the um, uh, nature of natural England whether the these black poplars are native black poplars or hybrid black poplars because native black poplars are very rare yeah but hybrid black poplars are very common uh, and uh, it's quite possible that on, on farmland you might have actually had planted native uh, hybrid black poplars which you might so I just wanted to check that because if it isn't uh, if they're not you shouldn't really be using that as a justification I think there are plenty of immediate justifications Riverside Woodland has its own natural uh, biodiversity interest but uh, I was just querying that whether you would check that well, that's a really good question because uh, I'm not the actual tree officer. This was taken up from us last year and it was left for me to do. So I haven't personally checked it. Uh, the tree officer and I did have a look at this before. And I, like I said, I, I can't tell you personally because I'm not an expert to tell you that. So I, I can't say hand on heart that they are definitely native ones. We were just, uh, I was, like I said, this, this has been on the book since October last year and I'm working through my list. To, to bring it to committee. So the answer to the question is, I don't know. All right. <laughs> I think that's clear. You can only answer what you know, so fair enough. Yeah. Yeah, indeed. Um, okay, members, I think that's probably enough debate on that. Um, we have a recommendation to approve this provisional TPO. Um, members, can I take that by information? Everyone's in agreement? Agreed. Anyone wish to refuse or abstain? Nope. So that is unanimously agreed. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. Okay, members, we are now on to agenda item 12, uh, which is the enforcement report. Um, I understand that Will Holloway, or Holloway is, is not with us, um, so I think the proposal is, if anyone has any questions or specific concerns, we can jot those down and Nigel can take them away and get responses emailed round. Um, so members, does anyone have any, um, any issues or concerns or questions they wish to raise regarding enforcement? Councillor Wilson, please. Um, I just want to make a point that I'm, I'm pleased to see that the progress is being made on the report about Smithy Fen and that it, it should be coming to us very soon. And I want to thank the officers for all the work they've been doing on that. Indeed. Um, Councillor Heather Williams, please. Uh, yeah, just on Smithy Fen, I mean, it was sort of suggested last time that we were going to have something, and obviously that's taken a bit of time, and I appreciate it's complicated, um, and i um, taken board comments from Councillor Wilson, but I really would like em to emphasise that this was on the agenda when I first became a councillor. Um, I would like, and I'm sure it was well before then as well, issues there, so... We need to be getting to some sort of conclusion, especially given the safeguarding issues that are on the site as well. Um, so I would say that. Um, and out of curiosity, I would have wondered if um, Alistair's back from his injuries um, and how we are. We're, we're up to a full, full slate of officers yet or not. If okay. not, I'm hoping for a speedy quite. recovery. <laughs> no, I've, I've been told he's not back quite yet, but Im imminently. But I'm sure the comments on Smithy Fen will be uh, passed on to the enforcement team. Councillor Bradland. Thank you, Chair. As you know, I haven't been on this planning, uh, um, you know, I've only been subbing on this committee recently, but actually way back from when I was on it uh, as a full-time member, the cottage nursery at Cardinals Green has been on the enforcement list. So I'm very glad to see an update to it. But um, I just would like to have... Uh, a clarification of what what on earth is going on there. because it, it started off as an advertisement and then it changed into a property that was being developed and now it's a house in multiple a dwelling in multiple occupation with a, an erection of a building to the rear just you know can, it just seems bizarre that um, this has gone on so long and it's gone through so many iterations yeah I mean as Local county councillor for Cardinals Green. Uh, don't ask. It's <laughs> it's been there's lots and lots of problems, um, lots of issues and contraventions. So I yeah I'll probably leave it there. But the enforcement team is at, you know is going at it from a multifaceted point of view because there are multiple breaches across many departments within 
the county uh, within the district and county council. So, yeah, <laughs> I, can, I can assure you it's not a straightforward one. Okay, um, no further questions on that one. So we'll move on to the next agenda item, which is 13, and that's appeals against planning decisions and enforcement action. Again, I think Will would usually present this, but as he isn't here today. Oh, okay, so sorry, we have Mr. Blaisby stepping into the firing line for us. So, Nigel, if you'd like to present this, please. Yes, thank you, Chair. Now, I think this item is, is, is usually presented by, by myself, although I, I do have to um, be honest and say that I haven't actually um, prepared anything for you today, so hopefully I'll be able to answer your questions. But um, what I would have uh, liked to have done is perhaps um, summarised um, some of the appeal decisions that have been received. But one thing you will note is that we have, as members requested, we have added the appeals awaiting decisions um, to the report. Um, you'll see that we've done that in two, in two sections, Appendix 4 and Appendix 5. Um, the reason for that is that we, we felt we needed to um, differentiate between appeals where a statement has been submitted and appeals that are awaiting the actual um, statement. So you've got all of that information. And of course, um, it may be out of date by the time it goes to print because, um, as, you'll, as you'll note, the over appeal decision is now out. So and it's showing here as, as a waiting decision, but obviously it was correct at the time that, that, that the agenda went to print. Mm -hmm. So, um, members, if you have any questions, I will try and answer them. Well, I believe the over one was dismissed, is that right? The appeal was dismissed? No. No? Maybe an update on the over because that's so quite important. In relation to the over appeal, the inspector has allowed. So, this is this for you, Chair. This is on Appendix 4. Page 181. Stephen? So, the inspector has allowed the appeal but ha has held that the council's five-year land supply uh, remains in place. And Chair, if I may add, um, also critically, the inspector has accepted the methodology that, um, that the council um, uses, which is also another important point. But, but this one will be reported on the next agenda, so, and I hope to give you more information at that time. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Uh, Richard Williams, please. Sweet. Thank you, Chair. Um, it, it's one not on this agenda, um, so if we can't have an update on it today, I would appreciate an update next time on the one at Stapleford, um, which, which the inspector granted for the retirement village, and what we, if anything, plan to do about the inspector's uh, decision. Okay. Councillor Heather Williams, please. Thank you. So, a couple of bits. Thank you very much for the... Um, additions that I asked for with the ones that are gone through. And I think it's helpful to have, have them as they've been displayed. Um, one of the things uh, that I wanted to ask is quite often now we've seen um, reason for appeal being non-determination. So I'm just wondering if, if there's a reason for that or it's just been a few very difficult cases um, and whether we could, you know, because that's not something, it's one thing if people are appealing for us having made a decision, but if it's on non-determination, it doesn't, um, doesn't give us an indication of whether it's something that would have been supported or wouldn't have been. So we, when it happens, we don't know if it's particularly something pro or, or negative for the district in, in that respect. Um, so that's, that's with um, that question. Um, just interesting in what um, Mr. Reed just said there, which is the five-year land supply, which um, I imagine everyone sighs a, a sigh of relief when, when that happens. Just wondering if they commented on the numbers at all or whether they just mentioned it because I know sometimes um, it you've still got it but they judge it differently so um, so yeah if I could have and then I've got one other thing chair so. we'll take those first mr. Blaisby okay thank you so in terms of the non-determination there's no there's no single reason for that um, I mean uh, it's the, the, as you know officers have got a backlogs and they have been um, struggling. We've struggled with um, resourcing the teams. So there are a number of reasons behind this. It isn't a pattern to it. But, um, but in, in, in all cases, we, I mean, if, it, if it's something that would have come to committee, we bring it to committee to get the committee's view so that the council puts forward at the appeal 
you know, kind of what, what whether it would have approved or, or refused the application and, and why. Um, and officers will will do that uh, as well in preparing a statement for the for the appeal. So the council does put forward its view, albeit it loses the power to determine the application. And on some occasions, uh, when we're asking applicants for extensions of time, and you know that we've had again some backlog issues, some backlog in the validation, meaning the applications have come through late. Sometimes when we ask an applicant for um, an extension of time, they won't grant it, and in that case, um, they had they would. would have the right of um, appeal against non-determination. So various various reasons. I hope that sort of answers the, the, the question there. Um, on the uh, over appeal five years by, um, there were a thousand units that the inspector did not agree with us that were deliverable within the period. Um, I can give you they're, they're on the major sites, but I can give you more information about that next time. But it still means I think it leaves us with. Um, a 5.6 or 5.7 year supply regardless of those thousand units that the inspector did not agree with us on. But I will give you more information on that and the Staplefoot appeal at the next committee. Thank you. Is there another question? Yeah, thank you. Just on where it says non-determination, if we could have, it's obviously useful to know if it, that's why it's going to appeal, but maybe if we could have had, have under it what the officer recommendation would have been whether it would have been, or from what viewpoint we will be defending it from an allowed or refused basis, because I think that then gives us a bit more of an idea, because if it's something we'd have allowed and it goes through anyway, you know, you're going to be less concerned if, it, or if it's something we'd want to refuse. Um, Chair, can I just say as well that I'm aware that this is, I don't know if she's still on here, but Julie Eyre's last meeting, isn't she, yeah. before she's leaving? So I just wanted to, same as we did you know, with John, this one more, I think, is she, this is her last, well, either way, I just, I thought this was her last one, so I just wanted to recognise that and say, um, when, when we, many of us first joined, it was John and Julie, and um, they were very supportive to all of us between them, and um, I don't think I've ever had a, an officer be so well regarded amongst the parishes as well, so wanted to recognise that, Chair. Thank you. Yeah, here. Yeah. I mean, unless I'm mistaken, I think Julie's leaving on the 10th or 12th of February, and I think we have one more meeting before then, at least. So, <laughs> well, anyway, yeah, the, the sentiment I'm sure is appreciated. 10th, 10th okay. Um, Councillor Roberts, please. Um, thank you, Chairman. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I'm lax here. Appendix 2, uh, page 178, if I could quickly go back. The Green Fox Farm Farm Air Road, Melbourne. Um, if I recall, my parish were. Um, invited to make comment because it's a borderline um, site. Uh, I presume then it must have been refused on delegated because it never came to the planning committee, I think. Um, and it was a very contentious one. It looked like a, it looked like a spaceship landing. One seven eight, Nigel, the Melbourne one. I believe it was delegated, but I'm not certain, so I will look that up and let you know. That would, that would be nice. Thank you yeah. very much, because another one in that same area, which was contentious, did get passed. So I think we were in fear that this was going to become a, um, a, a new way of getting round um, the rules about building in the open countryside. And just a quick one um, to um, follow up from what um, Councillor Williams has just said, which Heather has just said. Um, I, I do hope that before she goes, before the next meeting, that officers will um, say to Julie um, our great thanks for all the help that she's been given. All my four parishes are very concerned and, and sorry to hear that she's leaving uh, because without fail she has been a really wonderful officer to our parishes, to my villages. She's always been available. She's come out when they've asked her to. She never quibbles about coming out. She's coming out next week um, to Hayden. And, um, you know, she's, a real, she's been a real asset to this authority because she's very professional, but she's also got a very nice manner with her. And that I hope that, Nigel, that you will pass on to her now the fact that we will miss her greatly and that she is greatly appreciated. That's very chair. Yes, I will, certainly. And um, as officers, we, we will also miss Julie greatly. Yes, thank you. Thank you. And Councillor Bradman, please. Thank you, Chair. Um, I would just like, firstly, um, 
two things. Uh, the first is on Appendix 3 and also on Appendix 4, we have um, the item land to the north of the old coal yard, Chesterton, Fen Road, Milton. And uh, on page 182, it refers to mobile homes sited on land without planning permission. Um, I just really want to emphasize in words with great clarity that Chesterton, Fen Road, Milton might technically be the right postal address, and it does fall within the parish of Milton Detached, but um, Fen Road, Chesterton is separated completely from Fen Road in the village of Milton um, by the A14, and there is no um, direct vehicular route. You have to go right away round through the, through the city edges, over the A14, through Milton, and back down to land at Fen Road. In this particular case, it, it's not so crucial, but there are applications that come in. Um, I would draw your attention informally to others uh, offline, but where there has been an alleged connection, a connection alleged between land at Fen Road Milton and where premises are being proposed at Chesterton Fen Road, uh, when clearly there's a rather different thing going on. However, coming back to this, I'm very glad, uh, thank you very much to um, Will Holloway for picking this up and going with it. And I see it's the cause, uh, the, the, uh, cause of an appeal against us uh, on, on that. So I, I, I await um, the outcome of that with interest. Um, but secondly, I also would like to thank Julie Eyre because she was, um, you know, I haven't been involved with planning so much recently, but she has always been extremely helpful, extremely um, helpful to parishes in understanding the reasons why things sometimes can't be done. But she's always been so professional, and uh, I didn't realise until today that she was leaving. So I'd like to express my thanks as well to Julia Eyre through you, um, Nigel, if that's possible. Thank you. I'll pass that on. Thank you. Okay, thank you, members. I think we've reached the end. <laughs> so, <laughs> thank you. Uh, with one minute to spare, so thank you very much to uh, to everyone for their patience, um, members. Just to reiterate, there is a special planning committee meeting next Friday, the twenty eighth, which is just looking at a North Stow item, um, and then we return to regular meeting of the committee, which will be Wednesday, the 9th of February. So. Yes, just to remind members of that. And I thank you all for your time today and see you all at the next meeting. Good, thank you very much.